Welcome to the Calder Farmstead, your place for news, analysis, and shenanigans from the American Hockey League. Hello, hello, hello from Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. And Chicago, Illinois. <laughs> Welcome to the Calder Farmstead podcast, episode number 145 for Friday, October 20th, 2023. If you are hoping for a podcast featuring uh, tips on tractor oil changes, we are not going to be much help. This is an American Hockey League podcast. My name is Sean O'Brien from Stats Track and the AHL's only league-wide analytics guy. And I'm Sarah Avampato from Full Press Hockey and for fans, Sports Network's Jewel from the Crown. Jewel's from the Crown. I can't even say my own site name. It's all right. Anyways, we thank you for tuning in with us. So if you are new to hearing Sean and I talk about hockey, well, first thing is first, go make sure you hit that subscribe button wherever you're catching us from so that you don't have to go looking for new episodes. They just come right to you. If you like what you're seeing or you're listening to, don't forget to hit the like button on YouTube or leave a review if your podcast app like Spotify, Apple, Amazon, whatever does that thing. If you don't like what you're seeing or listening to, then eh, never mind. Just carry on with your day. It's fine. It's cool. So on this episode, we are going to give our thoughts and outlooks for all 32 AHL teams in the upcoming 23-24 season. I say upcoming is a bit of a misnomer. We're, we're, we're in the 23-24 season, but we both watch a lot of AHL games and we're talking about what we see when we watch the film, as well as use some advanced stats to help us break it down. If, that's, if you are new to our show, you might want to head over to whatever you're catching us from, whether that's YouTube or an audio form, and check out episode zero. It's a short primer on some of the stats we're going to be talking about, as well as how we view what's important on the ice. So if you're new to some of the more advanced hockey stats terms, like PDO or the point shares model, or newer hockey terms like controlled zone entries or Royal Road, go check that out so you better be able to pick up what we're putting down. I promise it's not that nerdy or technical. It's only 20 minutes. And let's be honest, you wasted 20 minutes believing that Sean Payton was going to solve the Broncos problems. Hi, Cece. You'll never get that time back. So next time, why not spend a little more time with us talking hockey? Real quick aside here before we start, you may be wondering two things if you are a returning listener to us. Number one, where have you guys been? Um, well, we did take some time off. Uh, we did try and schedule off-season content. Uh, we had some plans for that. Uh, I want to say we reached out to about six people for interview requests. Uh, I want to say five coaches and an owner. Uh, two or three got back to us, and we were not able to schedule a time that worked for all three of us, which brings me to the second question uh, that you are probably thinking about. It's kind of weird to be doing season previews after the season has started, isn't it? Well, yeah. It is. Uh, we're styling these as outlooks because, well, you can't preview a thing that's already started, so whatever. But also, uh, man, this season behind the scenes has been a lot of chaos that took both Sarah and I away from being able to complete this in a timely fashion. Uh, I actually called Sarah last Thursday night before the season started, and we decided pretty quickly that we'd both rather give you the best analysis we can, a product that we can feel good about than have finished recording at 4 a.m. on Friday morning and have it just be crap. Uh, I, I needed more time to get the preseason version of the model up and running. We both needed more time to review rosters, maybe get a pair of eyes on some more players. So we could have gotten these done on time, but they wouldn't have been good. And we'd be talking out of our asses during parts uh, of that. And we're not going to do that. In short, we'd rather be a bit late and good, uh, give you the quality analysis you expect from this show than be on time and be crappy. And as far as I'm aware, we're also the only AHL media thing that does a team-by-team -team outlook now uh, for all 32 teams in the AHL. 
And after our third, this will be our third year of doing this. I'm starting to understand why no one else does this. Um, that being said, let's get to it. Welcome to 32 Outlooks, the podcast. I'm Merrick. That's Elliot. We're brought to you by a random steakhouse named after a Midwestern U.S. state, despite being based out of Canada. Sarah, let's talk about the Providence Bruins. Uh, walk me through what happened in 2023. Tell me about their coaches. All right. So in 22-23, uh, the, the Providence Bruins were 44 and 28, which made them first uh, in the Atlantic Division. Uh, for their coaching staff, it's some familiar faces. Uh, head coach Ryan Mujanel, he's uh, 80 and 64 uh, as an AHL head coach. Two playoff appearances, uh, 0 for 2 in AHL playoff series. Series um, assistant coaches are Trent Whitfield and Matt Thomas. Let's talk um, about the additions they made here in yeah. the offseason. Uh, Trevor Kuntar, Owen Peterson, Vincent Arsenault, uh, Jason Magna, Anthony Richard, a.k.a. Tony Rick, uh, Jimmy Lambert, and John Farinacci. Sarah, tell me about the subtractions. Uh, so they have said goodbye to Shane Bowers, Yuna Kopanen, uh, Matt Felipe, Vinny Letary, Chris Wagner, Alex Olivier Voyer, J.D. Greenway, Edward Traumax, Sammy Asselin, jo jo wow, Josiah Didier, Mikey Riley, Kai Wisman, Jack Rashawn, Connor Carrick, Nick Wolf, and Anton Strawman. So let's talk about the we're, the way we're going to style kind of all of these outlooks here is we're going to talk about some of the storylines uh, about the team, uh, some thoughts about the team. We're going to talk about two prospects that are on the team. And I think for each team, we tried to choose guys that were not necessarily, were maybe a little newer to the team or had a very, or are coming into a very important season in their development. So if you don't hear about like the best prospect on your respective AHL team, don't worry. We didn't forget they exist. We just tried to pick someone that was maybe a little more unfamiliar to, to the general fan base here. But let's start with storylines. Um, for me, I liked the offseason moves. Uh, I think losing Vinny Letary obviously sucks, but the rest of the departures from the forward group aren't super big losses. And what's coming in to replace them, I think is definitely of greater value, especially when it comes to uh, Anthony Richard, AKA Tony Rick and Jason Megna. I think both of them bring big veteran presence. Um, I think they also might have to shake up some of the way that this team plays as a team uh, in order to kind of compensate for what was lost and what was gained. Uh, I think last year they were a very defensive minded team uh, that didn't really do didn't focus a whole lot on generating uh, transition the other way or necessarily off the cycle, but more were trying to kind of grind games down three, two, two, one in that style. And that worked for them. Um, but Sarah, they have a brand new blue line. Yeah, they did a lot of changes on their blue line. Um, like we said, uh, Didier, Mikey Riley, Connor Carrick, Jack Ashan, all on different teams. Enter. Riley Walsh, Mason Lowry, Parker Watherspoon, and Alec Regula. Uh, so guys like Didier, they're not the sexiest players in terms of style, but they can help lock it down in the D zone. Um, and for this team, Jacobs Borrell is that player if he actually stays in Providence. Um, he's been with Boston as a part-time seventh defenseman for the past couple of seasons now. And while it's not impossible, it certainly feels like he could just have a cup of coffee in Providence this year and just really not be available as that lockdown defender for that team. Uh, overall, there are a lot of new faces and some good puck movers, but the strength of this team last season was its defense, more specifically uh, its in-zone defense, and that is going to change this year. I think the big thing here that defines this team is the answer to this question. What are Jacob Lauko and Oscar Stian? Both have shown they can be near point per game players, the AHL pushing for time in Boston, getting on the, the big Bruins radar. That was the 21-22 season for both of them. We came into 22-23 thinking they were both ready to take that next step, be full-time graduates, be names we never had to struggle again uh, saying. But, you know, th there were injury, uh, there were injuries that happened. They both kind of got off to rocky starts. There are injury histories here, as well as a long history of Boston yo-yoing the two of them. And I think that does need to be taken into account here. But at some point, I think NHL executives are going to see you as an NHL player or as an AHL player. And that time for which that decision is going to be made uh, by Bruins Brass, uh, I think is going to be either this season or the next. So Lauko and Stian need to really kind of get it together and make the, you know, make a conscious choice of like, am I happy being a, you know, a three quarter point per game player, a guy who puts up 50 point pace in the AHL, plays maybe 10 NHL games, gets 10 minutes a night in those games? 
or are they going to plant the flag and be the the 21 22 version of themselves and not the 22 23 version i think there's a good chance they find themselves not in this team preview in 24 25 and help providence to a very successful season because if those guys do turn out to be point per game players that gives them a lot of valuable scoring depth i think no matter what the the floor from them is probably what we saw last season and that's fine those are still be useful you know kind of secondary scoring guys to go along with like tony rick and magna but them elevating their game really takes this offense to a different level if they're able to do that all right sarah let's pivot a little bit here uh i will let you go first for our prospect to watch who do you got uh, so the first guy we're going to recommend keeping an eye on is Mason Lowry. Uh, he got a small taste of the AHL at the end of last season after he finished his NCAA career at a university of little consequence that doesn't merit mentioning or even thinking about even a little bit. Uh, he is big, aggressive. He's talented. He's got a lot of potential, and he should have a solid rookie campaign in the AHL this season, but there's going to be growing pains and teachable moments for sure. Um, his nickname should be FOMO, a.k.a fear of missing out uh, because he just plays like he has a ton of FOMO. He wants to be in the play every time he's on the ice. And by and large, that is a good thing. Uh, he's activating off the blue line in the offensive zone. He's joining the rush as a fourth forward. He's hustling to pinch pucks at the blue line. Keep that play in the offensive zone alive. He also loves funneling play into the high danger areas in the offensive zone, which is generally a good thing, but he does it a lot and frequently gets tunnel vision with it and misses better plays and instead forces passes to the slot that are going to be covered already. The other area of concern with him is in the defense in the defensive zone, where again he just plays with a lot of FOMO. Uh, he's aggressive, he attacks puck carriers, but that also leads to him overcommitting and getting caught in spots that other more conservative defensemen aren't going to get caught in. So some growing pains for a guy coming out of college, uh, but an interesting player to keep an eye on. Who's your guy to watch? I'm going to go with John Farinacci. Uh, lots of other, like we said, uh, we're, we're going to try and pick guys a little bit off the beaten path here. So, uh, I mean, everyone knows Georgie Merkulov at this point. So let's go with John Farinacci. He's a power forward kind of archetype player. He loves to get to the top of the crease in the offensive zone and just make opposing goalies' lives miserable. He adds that to good forechecking and solid work ethic. Um, his skill set on offense isn't the sexiest, which is why work ethic is important for him. Being able to get to more pucks and you know, get more reps in than necessarily always having super high quality ones, I think matters. He's also been a capable defensive zone player for his entire college career where he'd drive players to the outside, lay the body on puck carriers trying to make zone entries or continue the cycle. Once again, just no quit in that dude's attitude. Uh, I don't have super high expectations for him as a scoring leader on this team, but I think once he gets settled to the speed of the AHL, he should be a middle six forward, can kill some penalties, can be relied on during late game leads. I think he can be uh, a dependable player, if not, uh, if maybe not the sexiest player in terms of on ice production. I, I, I don't know uh, what he looks like without a helmet on. So <laughs> I, I'll give you that. And last, uh, just like last year, we are playing the ever fun game sweeping the nation over under Sarah. The over-under here for the Providence Bruins. Average points is 85. Their playoff percentage, 89%. They are a 20% chance to win the Atlantic Division again. Sarah, uh, over or under 85 points for the Providence Bruins? All right. So last year, I wildly underestimated Providence, and I'm just going to not make that same mistake this time around. Uh, the subtractions don't hurt them that much. They're bringing back the same goaltending crew that found success last season. And I really like the additions of Richard and Magna. Um, as we pointed out earlier, they're going to be great fits on this team. Uh, that said, I'm just going to start things off the bat by just agreeing with the model. Um, I'm going to say they've got this one right. Ooh, interesting fun. Uh, I am going to take the under here by just a little pinch. I understand the mistakes we made last year. Providence was our mea culpa winner uh, at our award show for the team that we were the wrongest about in these pre in these preseason or uh, early season outlooks, as we will call them. And I I'm going to try and not trip myself up here, but I'm going to take the under. This new look blue line worries me. I think they'll be worse in their own end and open up Bussy to have to do a lot more to survive. I think Bussy is a good goaltender, but he is not without weakness. And I think some of that was covered up last year by a very physical and lockdown team in front of him. I don't think they have that this year. I think there's a bit more talent up front. 
and they should be able to work transition better. So I think it balances out a bit. I, I'm going to take the under by exactly one point. I'm going to say 84 points for the Providence Bruins. All right, Sarah, it is time to move on to a team that we were wrong about in the playoffs uh, a little bit. Uh, but don't worry, no one thought anything of it. It's not like we made a pregame uh, pump-up video in, or anything with our coverage. <laughs> Let's talk about the reigning, defending Calder Cup champions, the Hershey Bears. Sarah, tell me a little bit about their staff and their record from last year. Uh, so Hershey, obviously, if you are just joining us in the, in the AHL, uh, they won the whole thing last year. Uh, last year, they were 44 and 28, second in the Atlantic Division. Atlantic Division. Um, again, some familiar faces on the coaching staff. Todd Nelson is the head coach. Uh, over his AHL head coaching career, he's 353 and 280. Uh, he's got eight playoff appearances, 13 and six in AHL playoff series. Uh, assistant coaches are Patrick Weller and Nick Bootland. All right, let's talk about the things the Bears added in the offseason. Uh, Ryan Hofer. Ivan Miroshnichenko, Pierre Dubé, Alex Limoges, reigning uh, best hockey flow uh, from our award show, Jimmy Huntington, Garrett Rowe, Tyson Empey, Hardy uh, Haman Aktel, who just got called up, but I think he will still spend some more time this season in Hershey Jersey, uh, as well as Chase Prisky, Colin Sawyer, and Nick Lieberman. Sarah, who are they missing from that championship roster? Hershey has said goodbye to Shane Gersich, uh, Henrik Borgstrom, Mason Morelli, Garrett Pilon, Sam Annis, Gabriel Carlson, Bobby Nardella, and Zach Vukali. Garrett Pilon, thank you very much for collecting me a bingo square. Uh, let's talk about this team a little bit. I think a uh, big storyline picture here, what's going to happen to Hershey is going to have a lot to do with Spencer Carberry's philosophy with the Capitals. Now, Obviously, every NHL team directly impacts their AHL team uh, in some way, shape, or form, unless you're Chicago, but we'll get there. Uh, but I think Carberry brings a, a different vibe to the Capitals this year. I think, number one, it corrects mistakes of past where he should have had this job a while ago. But I think he and Mitch Love give the guys who've been marinating in the AHL and only really given kind of bottom six pair physical energy line minutes in the NHL. I think it gives a lot of those guys to have a, a legit shot to make a case as an everyday NHL player. We'll see guys like uh, Alexiev, McMichael, Snively, Protus, Matthew Phillips. I mean, Lucas Johansson is a first round pick at 25 and before, at the, before this season started, had three NHL games under his belt with a career high ice time of uh, per a game of 1332 for a defenseman that's about 10 minutes shy or about half of like top pair minutes. He made the Capitals out of camp and has stuck so far as as far as I've seen. Uh, I haven't looked at transactions for today, so I may be wrong about that. But the question becomes like, okay, if he struggles a little bit in the NHL, what is Carberry's philosophy? Does he send him back? Uh, I know that has been previous Capitals regimes kind of philosophy of like, we'll call you up. And unless you really blow our socks off in three games and eight minutes a night, we're probably just shipping you back to Hershey. But I don't think that Carberry or Mitch Love are going to be on board with that. These are guys that they know and grew for a, a small portion of it, more Carberry obviously than Love. But like, I, I think that because the Capitals also aren't going to be good this year, that with the young coaching staff that's familiar with these players, that says to me they're going to be given opportunities to play legit NHL minutes and basically just see what they have. If that's the case, I think Hershey might not be the wagon they could be, but fans will get to see their boys graduate, and I think that's not nothing. Don't get me wrong, I think Hershey, once again, is solid this year, but I think how Carberry plays it in D.C. affects the Bears more than most NHL teams with their AHL uh, roster based on what I – perceive as how Carberry is going to run the Capitals. Uh, Sarah, any th any thoughts on the Bears this year uh, for t big takeaways for this team? No, I, I think it's just, it's going to be an interesting season to, to see, I think, with the changes in coaching at the NHL level, um, there's just, just a lot going on um, that, like we said, could impact this team more than usual um, for an AHL team. So, for Hershey fans, enjoy the ride. Enjoy your uh, post-cup excitement, but it's going to be a different season this year. Yeah. All right, let's talk prospects to watch. Again, uh, we are trying to take guys who are a little bit off the beaten path, so maybe not the best prospect uh, in the world, but someone who's maybe a little newer or has a key season. Sarah, who do you have? 
Uh, so we're going to take a look first at um, Ivan Moroshnichenko. Uh, he has a lot of the raw tools that you're going to want to see uh, in a young prospect. He's a good skater. He's got good puck skills. Uh, absolute cannon for a shot. So that's going to be exciting. Uh, he's physical. He's going to throw his body around a lot. But like many young players with those raw tools, uh, he often lacks the ability to put them all together in an effective way. Um, he's still a young guy. He has also missed a lot of developmental time due to COVID. And oh, yeah, also he beat cancer last season, too. Uh, so A plus. But in terms of hockey, he's missed some time. Uh, so he's a player who has a lot of potential, but a lot of work is going to need to get done uh, to get him to be an NHLer. Uh, so have patience, but also enjoy enjoy the ride. And I think there are a lot of other interesting Capitals prospects that have uh, so, some key years. I think uh, Hendricks Lapierre is one. I want to talk about Vinny Iorio. I liked the season Iorio had last year and thought he played mostly well. He's physical. He attaches his, to his mark in the defensive zone well. I thought he showed a lot of good playmaking ability too, especially in transition where he would be patient and wait for options to open up for controlled zone exits versus just kind of punting the puck off glass and out, which is... I mean, sometimes you got to do what needs to be done, but like that's not a thing you want to make a habit of. And I liked that Iorio didn't. He had patience. He had poise there. I thought his offensive tools were coming along, but I don't think that's ever going to be the hallmark of his game. Kind of like Martin Farivari. I think he has a little more upside than Farivari does on the offensive side. But if he goes to the NHL, he's going to be paired with uh, an offensive guy. He's going to be asked to play penalty kill, but not power play. I would like to see Iorio focus a little bit more on his skating as well. He makes a good play, make good plays in his own end with the puck when he has time and space. I think he also was prone to turnovers from forechecking pressure and improving kind of a little short burst, maybe working on some punch stops and some agility would help him solve forechecking problems easier. I like the patience he displayed, but I think that burst would give him uh, another threat to uh, engage transition better. All right. That being said, it is time to play the game Sweeping the Nation over under with the machine. <laughs> Sarah Hershey, 86 points is what the model has them on average. They are going to make the playoffs 92% of the time. I don't know if we did Hershey's roster enough justice here in the run-up. This team is still very, very good. Uh, They're going to win the Atlantic Division 27% of the time. This distribution over here of how the model sees their seasons playing out uh, in kind of the multiverse way of looking at it, uh, it's good. It's real good. Uh, Sarah, what do you think about the Hershey Bears? Are you taking the over or the under? So in the AHL, the idea of cup hangover uh, basically doesn't exist, right? Given that the teams rarely get the opportunity to run it back with more than just a handful of players who lifted the cup the year before. Uh, the Bears are getting the chance to bring back a lot of familiar faces. But as we've talked about, who sticks around in the NHL and who or in, in the AHL and who has to go get called up to be a warm body for the Washington Capitals is going to be a really big question mark for this team. Um, and the worse the Capitals are and the more pieces that they have to start like just jettisoning uh, at the end of the season, the more guys are going to get yanked from Hershey. Um, I'm going to go slightly under just because I think that the impact that, that Washington is going to have on this team could be bigger than anticipated. Um, I have the suspicion the Caps are going to take some very good players away to the NHL uh, more than maybe they have had to do in the past. So we're going to go a little bit under with 85. I'm going to take the over here for three reasons. Number one, I feel like after the Calder Cup finals here, I probably owe Hershey one. <laughs> so that there's that. I also think no matter what Hershey, no matter what, Hershey is going to be very good this season. But there are a lot of questions to be answered here. And Hershey doesn't control a lot of them, which mm -hmm. scares me. I'm going 88 points here because I believe in Todd Nelson. I believe in the talent that is here that I think stays here. I am nervous about saying 88 points, but I'm standing by it. 88 points, Hershey, <laughs> bank it. All right. Let's move on to the third place team in the Atlantic, the Charlotte Checkers. Sarah, what uh, did they do last year? Who is taking over or who is behind the bench? So last season, the Checkers were 39 and 33 for third in the Atlantic Division. Uh, they're headed up by Jordy Kinnear uh, as the head coach. Uh, he's 209 and 224 in his AHL head coaching career with two playoff appearances. He's two for two, two and two, not two for two, two 
and two um, in AHL playoff series, uh, assisted by Bobby Sanguinetti and Jared Stahl on the bench. There's that other Stahl. <laughs> it, it feels like if one of these teams in the state of, of North Carolina does not have a stall as a part of it somehow, somewhere, it will all cease to exist. It is the one of the like four horsemen of the apocalypse is missing <laughs> a stall. <laughs> All right, let's talk about the additions this team made. Uh, let's start with Wilmer Skoog, Skylar Brendamore, Will Lockwood, Alexander True returns, Jonah Gadjevich, Patrick Kotarenko, Jake Wise, Evan Noss, Michael Benning, Uvis Bos, Bos, Balinskis, Uwe Balinskis, there we go, Casey Fitzgerald, Will Riley, and Evan Cormier. Sarah, who did they lose? Uh, they have lost Logan Hutsko, Corey Conacher, um, Anton Levchi. Riley Nash, Dominic Franco, Alexi Heponiemi, Hepo uh, Connor Bunneman, Henry Bowlby, Ethan Keppen, Evan Fitzpatrick, Alex Lyon, and J.F. Berube. So uh, if you are not listening to this entire thing front to back, we're going to talk about some big picture storylines. Then we're going to look at two kind of off the beaten path prospects, and then we will play over under with the machine. So to start us off here, there is a lot of turnover here. Two thirds of the top nine scoring forwards from last season checkers team are gone. Riley Nash for Hartford. Alexi Heponiemi went to the Swiss League. Grigori Denisenko is in Henderson after a waiver claim. <laughs> Henry Bowlby left for Colorado. Hotsko went to the SHL in Sweden. Connor Bonneman went to Liga in Finland. I'm okay with what's on the roster, but that's a lot of turnover uh, at the top of your forward depth chart. Especially with Justin Sort, while well, Justin Sort of, I believe, just made his debut, but he started the season on IR uh, in Florida. Possible that that's still lingering. Jonah Gadjevich is still on IR, and while the top six in Charlotte is still strong with guys like Aspen, Dalpy, Mayhew, etc., the bottom six here is a little thin. Especially when you look at what teams like Providence and Hershey have there. Like this forward group should still be competitive. But man, one or two ouchies in Florida, and this could be suddenly a very defensive-minded team. Sarah, uh, what, what's on your mind when it comes to Charlotte? So goaltending is going to be interesting to watch for this team. Um, right now they have Spencer Knight. If Spencer Knight plays 15 games for Charlotte this season, I think that we're both going to be shocked. Um, I think Knight is a talented goaltender. Um, I also wouldn't be surprised if he didn't look like the NHL caliber goalie that he is in those games. Uh, in a similar spot last season, Knight led in four goals on 26 shots. He granted he posted a shutout the night before and was playing both of a back to back. So take it all with a grain of salt. But other goalies who have done that two to three game conditioning stint um, in the AHL have shown some mixed results. Uh, we had Matt Murray in Belleville in 21 22, Peter Mrazek in Toronto in the same season, Jack Campbell in Ontario in 2018 19. Uh, and just. And, it happens. Uh, so if he stays long-term in Charlotte, I expect him to look like an NHL goalie, but I think that this is still Matt Guzda's net. Um, he struggled with consistency last season as a rookie goalie in the AHL. It definitely felt like he'd look like a future NHL goaltender one game and then a future ECHL goaltender the next. You never really knew what you were going to get from him. He has the tools, though. He's big. He moves well. His technical foundation is very solid, but he seems to have trouble trouble tracking pucks from high to low, um, as well as through traffic. Uh, and there's a fair number of soft goals last season that went in because of it. So if he can clean some of that up, he should be able to progress and look like an NHL goalie to be more often. However, it's more likely that he's going to split time with Anthony Stolarz as Spencer Knight moves back up to the NHL. That seems like the most likely thing in my mind. It also creates that classic veteran prospect goalie tandem that teams generally seem to gravitate towards um, in this league. Stolarz is a big goalie. He's got the puck tracking. He's got technical skills to be an NHL backup if needed. So if he does take over as the 1B in Charlotte, that is a good thing for the Checkers, as he should be a pretty steady netminder for them in a league that he's shown that he can rise above. So goaltending is your buzzword for, uh, for Charlotte. All right. And let's talk about two prospects to watch here. Uh, we're we're going to we both took defensemen. I will kick us off here with Mike Benning. He's another part of this blue line that uh, profiles well. He should be able to move the puck well in transition, but his big standout ability is his shooting. He's an offensive threat from the blue line and doesn't just wind up big slap shots and beat goalies with velocity. He loves him the fake shot that will send defenders to the ice for a block, and then he'll just kind of walk right past them right into the high danger area. 
dish a pass across Royal Road or shoot from his newfound uh, improved real estate rather than the shadow of the blue line. That is a huge thing for a defender to not just throw pucks away from distance. Benning is also a quality defender, especially against the rush as he closes on puck carriers and defends his blue line with poise. I remember last year thinking that uh, Charlotte did not have a lot of defenders who defended transition well, especially when it came terms to defending one-on-one -on -one with their at their blue line. They let a lot of zone entries kind of just, a lot of guys just kind of walk into the zone and set the play up a little bit, and I didn't like that. I'm excited to see if Mike Benning can be someone who attacks at his own blue line a little bit more. Sarah, who is your defender? Uh, we're going to look at Evan Naus. Uh, he is another part of this blue line that looks to be able to be a factor in transition. Uh, he is a good skater. He's got straight line speed that helps him um, also escape forechecking pressure. Uh, he's also known for his reliability in making a good first pass and creating defensive zone exits with possession. Uh, he's capable in, in his own zone. He's also physical on puck carriers. Uh, the offensive side, still a bit of a work in progress, uh, but he's making more noticeable attempts to join the rush or activate from the blue line during the cycle. Uh, it's just not quite dialed in yet, and he sometimes see, still seems hesitant to do so. So we're uh, still working on that with him. But let's see what the machine says. All right. Just like last year, we are going to play host versus the machine. The machine says for Charlotte, 83 uh, points on average. They finish the season with, they make the playoffs 82% of the time. They win the division 13%. Looking at the uh, the distribution there, I'm, I'm fairly satisfied with that. I think that's, I mean, it's wide for sure, uh, a little pretty balanced, but I'd be okay with that. Sarah, what say you though? Over under 83 points. So this is a team that like, I just don't know that I love what's happening here. Like even taking goaltending out of the picture, just looking at everything else. Um, I just, I don't love it. I, this, this is a gut feeling uh, for me. Um, but this is a team where, you know, at the end of the season, you could tell me literally anything about where they wind up in the standings. And I'd be like, oh, that tracks. So this, this 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 team feels like a wild card for me. I'm going to go with under um, at 80, 80 points. I do tend to agree with that. This is a team that has good stuff at the top, but the depth concerns me. And I think, you know, a couple of ouchies in Florida and mm -hmm. this outlook looks much worse. I mean, as we can see from the distribution, they're pretty much equally likely to have a 105-point season or a 65-point season. <laughs> that is a wide, wide range. I also say I, I don't think Spencer Knight is going to be in Charlotte forever, and I doubt he's there very long at all. If that means Anthony Stellars comes down, then Charlotte mm -hmm. will be okay. Like, that's not a one-for-one -one trade, but you're getting a, a capable starter in his stead. Um, I think Guzda is capable. I think we're going to see a step forward from him. If the Panthers try and do some three-goalie tandem thing because we're all still scared Tampa's going to claim a guy, uh, Charlotte is in trouble. The guys behind Mac Guzda who will have to start games are... Not AHL <laughs> goaltenders. We'll just leave it at that. I'm pretty happy with 83 points given the the very large variable nature of this team, but I'm a little bit more dour on it. I will take a slight under at 82. Uh, so we will do the $1 thing here to, to the model. I'm going to say 82. So still a good team, still a playoff team, but not less likely to be a great team, I think is is, is the opinion here. All right, Sarah, it is time, as we must do again, to move on. Let us talk about the Springfield Thunderbirds. Tell me about their season last year and what's behind the bench. So last season, the Springfield Thunderbirds were 38 and 34, good for fourth in the Atlantic Division. Uh, they're led on the bench by Drew Bannister. Uh, he has a 136 and 149 record as an AHL head coach. He's made two playoff appearances, and he's three and two in AHL playoff series joined on the bench by Daniel Kachuk and Jordan Smith. A lot of ads in the offseason for the Springfield Thunderbirds. Let's get right into it with Zach Bolduke. Zach Dean, who, as far as I know, is not uh, related to the breakfast kingpin, Jimmy Dean, uh, Tanner <laughs> Dickinson, Andrew Hayam, Sam Bitten, Double Mac, Mackenzie McEachern, Leo Loof, Josh Jacobs, Wyatt Kalniuk, Joseph Duzak, Jeremy Bayabatuka, and Malcolm Subban. Sarah, who do they lose? 
They said goodbye to Martin Furk, Matthew Highmore, Nathan Todd, Dylan McLaughlin, uh, Greg Prince, Jacob Hayhurst, Andre Bakanov, Steve Santini, Brady Lyle, Griffin Luce, uh, Dmitry Samukarov, Tommy Cross, and Luke Witkowski. So uh, if you have not been listening the entire time, what we're going to do here is cover some storylines we think are going on with the team. We're going to talk about two prospects that are maybe a little newer to the team, and then we're going to play us versus the model. So uh, I will kick us off here. This fear, this forward group feels like the first time in a few seasons that Springfield lacks like a top AHL threat. Last season, it was Firk and Highmore. Before that, Annis. And then later in the season, uh, Elbows, James Neal. Now, Matthew Pekka? Like, don't get me wrong. I like Matthew Pekka, but I don't think of him as being in the Martin Firk, Sam Annis, James Neal tier. He was 46th in the AHL in primary points per game last year. And while he wasn't in Springfield as long, the question of whether or not he can carry an offense to greatness uh, is, I think, a legitimate one. Sarah, what say you? Yeah, so this is a very different uh, blue line from the past two seasons uh, for the Thunderbirds. Uh, Matt Kessel really looks to be the only holdover um, as Lyle, Samokarov, and Santini have all gone to investigate if the grass is, in fact, greener elsewhere. Uh, Tommy Cross retired, Tyler Tucky, Tyler Tucker, uh, and the Scott Frunovich pain tour all appear to have graduated to the Blues full-time. Uh, Kessel was the leading scorer last season for this team, but only because he played in 71 games. Uh, so there's a lot of change on this blue line that I think could be uh, a pain point for this team. I agree. I do like Joseph Duzak, though. If I memory serves me correctly, he was a finalist for our Best Defenseman Award two seasons ago. He did not win. I would remember if he won. Um, <laughs> I've never been a huge fan of Josh Jacobs, but I think Leo Luf and Wyatt Kalnyak uh, can be serviceable. Kalnyak, I feel like I've soured on a bunch. Luf is obviously new. But speaking of new guys, let's talk about prospects. Both of us picked a Zach. Uh, Sarah, would you like to go first or second? Um, I can go first. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, Zachary Bolduc first. Uh, his standout ability, it's his shot. Uh, this kid can rip one-timers with the best of them, and he knows how to find passing lanes to be open to take those shots. But the surrounding parts of his game have actually developed a lot over this past year. Um, he's become a lot more well-rounded and thorough in his defensive details, forechecking assignments, playmaking on the rush. But we say this all the time, the transition from college and juniors to the AHL is the hardest one that players face. Uh, he looked well-rounded in the queue last year, but the AHL, it is not the queue. Uh, I expect him to be a little bit like Hendricks Lapierre and Hershey last season, where you can see why he was a first round draft pick and he has an NHL future, but he's going to struggle at times with the speed and the physicality of professional hockey. And he's going to go on some frustrating cold streaks. Uh, so again, another player to be patient with because the reward is going to be pretty great. Uh, which Zach did you pick? I took the other first round draft pick named Zach, Zach Dean. Zach Dean is a little bit like Bob the Builder in a sense. Uh, it's late February. You're looking down the bench as a coach, needing an energy shift, someone who can go out there, give a physical forecheck, make something happen, get your team some motivation in the game. Zach Dean can do it. It's a defensive zone face-off in the waning minutes of the third. You need a defensive-minded center out there. Zach Dean can do it. You're up a goal. You want your guys to turn the game into a sludge fest. Every puck is a physical battle, a knife fight in a phone booth, if you will. Zach Dean can do it. You're on a power play. You need someone to make a zone entry with speed, but be willing to pull up and keep possession in the O-zone if there's nothing there for a rush chance. Zach Dean can do it. Zach Dean may not have a single elite skill, but what he has is a metric ton of damn good ones and a hockey IQ that wields them very well. As with any rookie in the AHL, I worry about how much they can handle with the AHL transition, just like we talked about with other Zach. Uh, but Dean plays such a transferable game that I worry less with him. I don't think he's a point-per-game player out of the gate, but I think a 40-point pace is not out of the bounds of possibility. I'm not saying he's going to do it. I'm saying I think he could do it. You'll take that for a rookie any day, especially one that gives you so much versatility on defense, on power play. Like he can do it all. So uh, I am I am excited for Zach Dean in that sense. All right, Sarah, last but not least, we are going to play the game Sweeping the Nation over or under versus the machine. And 
the machine says the average points for the Springfield Thunderbirds this season is 81. They make the playoffs 76% of the time and win the division 10%. Uh, a little bit skewed of a distribution, so higher but still wide. Uh, I will go first here. I am torn. I like this team, but I think in general it's a little worse than last season. I think some of the Utes like the Zacks, Bull Duke, and Dean could surprise people. On the other hand, Joel Hofer is gone. He's graduated. He is. There is very little chance, I think, that Joel Hofer comes back. I will take the over and say 82, but I think Springfield has one of the lower floors in terms of range of outcomes uh, of this division. Like, I, I think that there is that kind of skewed wideness to them because if these Utes don't work out, there could be big mm -hmm. problems because they don't have that like Sam Annis, James Neal, Martin Furk, uh, Matthew Highmore kind of player that it's like, yeah, but no matter what, he's going to go out there and score just about every game. So you're okay. I don't think they have that this year and that concerns me a little bit. So I, I'm going to take the over, but still like this is a playoff team or at least very likely should be, but I'm not jumping up and down about them uh, overall. Sarah, what say you? So in addition to what we've already talked about with this team, Springfield is also one of the handful of AHL teams that has adopted some uh, Carolina Hurricanes AHL refugees. Uh, since I don't know if you heard the news at any point over the past few months, but Carolina doesn't have an AHL team anymore. Um, but so Springfield has a couple of interesting pieces currently on loan from Carolina. They've got Jamison Reese, who is a fun, like bottom six, middle six -y energy guy. Um, they have de uh, defenseman Dylan Coughlin, who hasn't been able to stick at the NHL level, but I've watched him for years in the AHL and he's fine there. Um, but even that, you know, I, I don't think either of these guys move that needle very much either. Um, and like you were saying, if the youth don't quite get with it as quickly as they should, uh, there could be some problems for this team. Um, I just don't like a lot of what I've seen uh, from this team in terms of what they've got to work with. So uh, we're going to go with the under, just under at 80 points. Okay, I think that's fair. I also think too, like Malcolm Subban was good last year in Rochester. He maybe stole a game or two for mm -hmm. the Amherst in the playoffs. But he also wasn't great at times. And mm -hmm. I think that people will just see games he stole and then forget yeah, games he kind of blew. So, <laughs> and that's been Malcolm Subban his entire career. He's been a serviceable yeah. AHL goalie, but he hasn't been like a jump up and down and thank God we right. have Malcolm like the entire season. Handful of games, sure. But yeah. like, he's not Joel Hofer. Yeah. All right. It is packing up and moving on time. Let's talk about Hartford. Uh, Sarah, what did they do in 22-23? Who was behind the bench? Uh, so in 22-23, they were 35-37 and 37 for fifth in the Atlantic Division. Uh, they are led by Chris Knobloch, uh, who has been AHL head coach for a period of time. Uh, he's had one period, uh, one playoff appearance. Uh, he's 2-1 and one in AHL playoff series. Uh, Steve Smith and Jamie Tardiff are the assistant coaches on this team. Their additions uh, to the Hartford Wolfpack, new pack members, if you will, uh, Brennan Othman, Riley Nash, Alec Belzeal, Drew Warad, Tristan, Tristan Mullen, Nick Briard, Connor Mackey, Mac Hollowell, and Zach Berzola. Who did they lose, Sarah? First off, it took me a second to get new pack. <laughs> uh, they have lost Laurie Pajaniemi, Sammy Blaise, uh, Ben Tardif, uh, Ryan Carpenter, Tim Gettinger, Will Lockwood, Patrick Kodorenko, Easton Brodzinski, Tanner, uh, Tanner Fritz, Wyatt Kalanuk, Lee Warhajek, uh, Ty Emerson, Adam Clendenning, Zach Kitari, and Adam, Andy Walensky. All right. So if you are uh, just tuning into these uh, at the Hartford moment of them, welcome. Uh, we're going to touch on some like kind of vibes and storylines going into the or you know for the season the season's already started we acknowledge that uh we're going to talk about two prospects that we think are a little bit off the beaten path and then we are going to play us versus the machine uh for me I i'm very curious to see about whether this team can build off of the playoff run from last year that run mattered a lot to the fan base to the players to the staff the rangers brass clearly thought that sending that team into uh as good a position as possible for the playoffs was important for the first time in, oh, I don't know, forever. Um, 
I don't have to remind listeners that Hartford hadn't been to the playoffs since 2015 prior to last season. That playoff run also probably saved Chris Knobloch's job, or at the very least kept him from starting the season uh, with his seat feeling very warm. Uh, but a lot of guys stepped up and played bigger minutes uh, than we were kind of used to seeing. Guys stepping up and making a difference, making a bigger impact than what we thought uh, of them as a player. Uh, guys like Tanner Fritz, Tim Gettinger, Zach Jones, Dylan Garand, even Brian Carpenter. All of them are gone except Dylan Gar- uh, Garand. Can this team still harness that momentum, though, and be a clear-cut playoff team in this division and not one that's kind of scrapping and fighting and clinching a playoff spot with like a game or two left in the season? I think that's an interesting kind of thought. Like a lot of the important pieces from that run that stepped up and, you know, made a name for themselves uh, aren't there anymore. And can the new ones kind of come in and harness that energy? Uh, I think it's going to be something we talk about throughout the season or at least see the effects of. Sarah, what say you? So unlike some other teams that we're going to talk about today, uh, for, for this team, the Rangers shouldn't be able to meddle too much. Uh, they are very tight to the cap in the NHL. Only Will Cooley is waiver exempt. So it seems that for once, unless the Rangers have just a lot of like LTIR, LTIR injuries or Roby Island candidates, um, Hartford should be able to keep the band together this year reasonably well. Now, I, I get it. That's inviting just like a ton of jinxing. But, but, A, I neither believe in that nor care. Don't care. Um, But one thing I think is important to this team, um, and I love this uh, as a, as a, a a truther (laughs) of this player. um, I'm sure he prefers being in New York to Hartford, but I don't think there's a captain in the AHL whose presence means more to this team uh, than Johnny B. Good, Johnny Brzezinski. Um, Hartford is flat out not the same team with him out of the lineup. Um, And yeah, that's true for every team when you take an important player out of the lineup, but he is the heart and soul of that locker room. And it very much shows when he isn't there more so than I think it does with other teams. Um, Do I think he's the most talented player to wear the C in this league? No, but he might be the most consequential. Um, He's a player who I watched a lot of when he was part of the King system. Um, You know, he wasn't a captain on that team, but, you know, I think was very well respected in that room. You could tell that he is a player that the guys loved to play with. Um, and e- even then the rain were different with him, uh, without him than they were with him. And that has certainly carried over as his career has continued. So um, I think that he is a crucial piece uh, for this team um, and is making the best of it. Um, like we said, I'm sure he would much rather be a New York Ranger, but uh, he's uh, he- he's making it work in Hartford. And I think that's really great. I mean, yeah, he'd, the only reason I'm saying that, that we're saying he'd prefer to be a, a New York Ranger is I mean, um, he gets paid like yeah. triple. What, <laughs> what, and no offense to any AHL city, people dream of being NHLers. Like, th- that, that is not a, a knock on Hartford, which no. I actually think is a pretty decent place. Like, I, I, have, I have family that live in the area. Uh, people, people like to crap on Hartford. I, like... It's not New York City, but that, <laughs> n- nothing is. That's the whole point of it being New York City. <laughs> anyway, uh, I, I definitely agree. I wa- I wish I had the number off the top of my head, but I remember when we talked about Hartford last year, we said what their record was with mm-hmm. Brunson getting out of the lineup, and it was something absurd. Like, without yeah. them, they were something like 15 and 35 or something like that. Yeah. I don't remember what it is exactly off the top of my head, but it was, like, really shocking. Like, he's a yeah. good player, don't get me wrong, but it was it was insane yeah. what their record was without him. All right, let's talk two prospects here. Sarah, would you like to go first or second? I'll go first uh, because we're going to talk about some wheels. Uh, one prospect with plenty of wheels that is new to the Wolf Pack is Adam Sakura. Uh, his skating has really powered his game um, as a physical in your face for checker uh, because he has never really accepted the fact that he is 5'10 and 175 pounds. Uh, this guy throws his body around like a much bigger guy, uh, just incredibly fun to watch. And he's added playmaking vision and puck skills around that heavy game to become a lot more well-rounded as a player. But we'll see how well that sticks in the AHL um, in his rookie year. For me, uh, let's talk about newcomer Ryder Korzak. He did manage to sneak into five games at the beginning of last season before being sent to the WHL. I do think Korzak shows flashes this season, but ultimately struggles to be a consistent impact player. He has a lot of NHL looking tools, which is why I think you see the flashes of them inside his rookie year. But more than anything else, he seems destined to struggle because he is a classic case of all tools and no toolbox. 
get ready to see him walk a defender in the neutral zone, create a two-on-one, and then miss the obvious pass across to his teammate so he can shoot on a goalie who is ready and square to his face. <laughs> that is Ryder Korzak. He's like if Ryan Gosling was socially awkward. He goes out to the bar and girls just come over to him because he looks like Ryan Gosling. But he asks them about anime or Macron's pension problems and ends up, you know, going home at the end of the night. Like, there's a lot of good things about him, but he doesn't seem to have kind of the whole way of putting all of those good things together in a, a, a way that wields it effectively. So that is Ryder Korzak. Uh, I think he will be f a player that makes highlight reels, but then also kind of ghosts you for like three weeks. So... Get ready, Hartford. It will be frustrating with Ryder Korzak, but it could also be fun. Yeah. All right, it's time to play the game Sweeping the Nation. That is us versus the machine. The machine says for Hartford, 77 points on average, 58% of the time making the playoffs. They win the division at 3%. A decidedly uh, lower skewed distribution for their points percentage or for their uh, standings points. Sarah, what say you about this? So I like that this team has a mix of young players, more experienced veterans. I don't know how good they're going to be, but I think they should be fun, which I think should mean something to fans at least. You know, I, I feel like the like five to six overtime game is a lot more fun than like the two to one defensive grind. Um, I'd much rather see people just doing cool stuff <laughs> on, on the ice. Um, so I, I think that that, you know, should mean, mean something. I don't know that I love all the individual pieces of this team, but I feel like they could be a team who's better than the sum of their parts. So we're going to go with a little bit over at 79 points. For me, a lot has changed here. This team, I think, goes as far as the Utes can take it. Guys like Garan, Othman, Sakura, Berard, Enstrom, Kor uh, Korzak, etc. Those are the guys that are going to determine this team's fate. Like, I like Riley Nash. I like Jake Lecision for veteran additions. I think they're solid top six AHLers for sure. But this team is so young and so variable. And my God, do I not trust Chris Knobloch. Like, <laughs> I don't think he's a bad coach, but I'm definitely not convinced he's a good one. I want to believe they get the kids sorted. And above all, I think the biggest thing that influ influences me here is Louis Deming is dependable. He may not be great every night, but he's very rarely going to cost you a game. I'm not convinced that necessarily that Grand keeps the, the progress he made in the playoffs last season, but I believe in Louis Deming. I'm going to take the over here. I want to believe 80 points. That is where I'm putting the line. I'm taking three over, which is not a normal thing for me. Although we'll get to a wild one much later in the show. But I, I think Hartford is a <laughs> firm playoff team and not a, oh my God, there's one game left. They need like this team to lose in overtime, that team to lose in regulation, and then at least get to overtime themselves to make the playoffs. Like I do not want to be doing cross-eyed math at the end of the season, trying to figure out if Hartford makes it or not. Uh, so I, I think uh, for my own sake and their fan base's sake, uh, they're going to firmly make the playoffs in 80 points. All right, let's move on to the Lehigh Valley Phantoms. Sarah, tell me about them. So last season, the Lehigh Valley Phantoms were 37 and 35. They were sixth in the Atlantic Division. Uh, they are headed up by Ian LaPierre as the head coach. Uh, he's got a 66 and 82 AHL head coaching record. Uh, he's got one playoff appearance, uh, and he's 0 for 1 in uh, AHL playoff series. Uh, assistant coaches are John Snowden and Jason Smith. Do you think by being John Snowden, he does know stuff? Ooh, anyway, I'm going to leave. <laughs> there are <laughs> their additions are John Randall Avon, Rhett Gardner, Evan Poli, Ryan Shizlowski, Ethan Sampson, Helge Granz, and Cal Peterson. Who said goodbye to the Phantoms, Sarah? Uh, they have lost Charlie Charlie Gerard, Hayden Hodgson, Cal O'Reilly, brother of Ryan O'Reilly, Ryan Fitzgerald, Jackson Cates, Artem Anisimov, Max Willman, Kevin Connaughton, Wyatt Wiley, Troy Ghost, Grosnick, and Pat Nagel. All right. So uh, we are going to talk about some kind of storylines and rumblings and vibes we have about the team. We're going to talk about two prospects to watch that are a little off the beaten path. Then we're going to play Us versus the Machine. For those of you who are listening to this beginning to end and have heard that five times already... <laughs> Sorry. Um, so uh, for me, I think goaltending and how the Flyers handle kids in the NHL are the biggest storylines for the Phantoms this season. 
does Tyson Forrester and Bobby Brink make appearances in Lehigh Valley if they struggle in the NHL? Torts is, you know, well known for handling uh, rookies with uh, calm poise. Uh, yeah. But like the same could be said for Emil Andre or Cam York. Will Ronnie Attard get extended looks as a flyer? How do Cal Peterson and Sam Ershon perform? Like Cal Peterson can't actually be that bad. I know we talked about him in depth last season in Ontario, but like when I went back and looked, he played a lot more games last season than I thought. And yeah. I don't know that they got better. <laughs> um, like he can comfortably be called up in waves because no one is taking that salary. Yeah. But at the same point, the flyer are the flyers still currently carrying three goaltenders. Like that's like, they're, they're just waiting for Tampa to scoop up somebody else so they can send somebody down. But like Sam Ershon is waiver proof. So <laughs> what are we doing? Like I expect Ershon to play for the Phantoms this year, but I, I don't know why we're doing three goalies when you can send I, whatever. It, it doesn't work guys. Sorry. Sarah, what say you? Um, first off, thank you for reminding me that uh, Tortorella is still in Philadelphia. I forgot that. And now I'm just, um, that's hilarious. Um, <laughs> speaking of coaches, is Ian Lapierre on the hot seat? I feel like we could probably be saying this every season uh, that, that he's been hanging around. He hasn't had the best results. And yeah, he sent guys to the NHL, but the Flyers are rebuilding. Um, does Tyson Forster or Cam York make a Flyers team that is supposed to be a playoff contender? Um, does Wade Allison spend all of last season in Philly if the Flyers are contending? If no, then are we still crediting LaPierre for that development? Um, or are the Flyers just a team that needed bodies who could play and therefore they graduated guys out of the AHL? Yeah, I think that's a really fair question. And one like we kind of don't talk about, uh, not just us, but like anyone really. Like, mm -hmm. it, are the guys that played for the Yotes last year at the end of the mm -hmm. season, like, does that count as development? Like, yeah, they made the NHL roster. They played a bunch of NHL games. But would they if Arizona were in Tampa's shoes? Mm -hmm. Like, that's where I think it's unfair to judge like a player like Alex Barry Boulay, who would make Arizona's top six. Right. You know, well, last year's Arizona's top <laughs> six in a heartbeat. Uh, like he would probably make the Flyers pretty easily out of camp. Yeah. But like, should that count? W what mm -hmm. is what is the line for what we are counting as development of? Well, we have 18, 19, 22, whatever roster spots. Mm -hmm. Guys have to fill them. Right. Even if we take the best 18, like if we're a team that's rebuilding, like, Chicago, Philly, Anaheim, San Jose. Like, do we count that as development internally when we talk to our AHL coach because we straight up needed 18 bodies? Mm -hmm. That, like, I don't think that's unfair. So, and that matters too for the Phantoms, especially for how the, the Flyers feel about Lapierre. Like, is yeah. he, he is not made necessarily the most, uh, successful choices. Uh, I definitely think <laughs> he committed coaching malpractice last year with Samuel Ayrshon in that game five, oh, playing yeah. back to back after, what was it? A four overtime game, five mm -hmm. overtime. Yeah. Let's just put the goalie who just played five overtimes uh, yeah. this morning back, <laughs> back bad. Anyway, uh, let's talk about prospects to watch. I will go first with a familiar face uh, in Elliot De Desnoyers. I really liked what I saw from him last season. He found an effective game to play despite not having the sexiest skill set. But a lot of that is hockey IQ and work ethic to follow through on it. He was in, always involved in the pl in playmaking, making short passes, uh, continuing possession before driving to the net. If he can gain some explosiveness in his skating, I think he could really take the next step. But I do like what I saw him as kind of being the connective tissue of that team in the offensive zone, where he wasn't necessarily shooting pucks across Royal Road, but he understood how to turn a or how to keep possession on pucks and then when to attack when they had good spots. And I think that's important as a player to know. Sarah, who is your guy? Uh, so I'm going to look at a new face to the Phantoms this the Phantoms this year, Alexis Gendron. Um, like Denoye, um, I think his work ethic really helps power his game. He's not that fast on his skates, but he does anticipate well. And because of that, he gets to play fast. And that's what he likes to do is play fast. He's a very north-south kind of player. Uh, he's also a good shooter, but not because he can rocket pucks at like Autobahn speeds, but more because of his ability to find soft ice to shoot from, as well as his release uh, being very quick and dynamic. 
Uh, he is more of a project of a player than Denoye, but both guys are still going to need time to develop uh, as players. All right. On to the game sweeping the nation. Us versus the machine. The machine says for Lehigh Valley, 79 points on average. They make the playoffs 70% of the time. They win the division 8% of the time. Sarah, what say you? So similar to how the Hershey Bears are going to be impacted a lot by what happens in Washington, the same thing is going to happen with the Flyers-Phantoms relationship too. Um, the Flyers are not going to be contenders. I don't care what anyone <laughs> tries to sell you. Um, they're not. Um, I feel like they're going to be in the position to do what we were just talking about, having to put guys up in that roster in the NHL who would be better su served in the AHL. So, you know, great experience for those guys to get to go play in the NHL, but should they be there? Maybe not. Yeah. If, if this was the Tampa Bay Lightning, no, they would not be there. Um, so I like a lot of the pieces here. Um, as someone who has seen Cal Peterson at both his best and his worst, um, I think he can help lift this team up if he is committed to really returning to form, cleaning up his game, figuring out what has gone wrong in his mechanics, and, and addressing that. That is a really big if though. Um, and I even if that does happen, I don't know if it's gonna be enough. And so I think it's gonna be another rough year for the Phantoms. Um, I'm just gonna go ahead and side with the model here and say that our computer overlord is correct. I have so many questions here that matter. Um, <laughs> can Helge Granz and Victor Mete get it together and perform after some down years? Is Cal Peterson really that bad? Like we did a deep dive on this in the last season when he was in Ontario. And mm -hmm. the answer was mostly no, but still, mm -hmm. when does Samuel Ayrshon come back? Is Ali Lixell as good as he was last year without that massive amount of chemistry from Forrester and Anisimov? To answer some of those, I think Grands does. I don't think Mete does. I think he is broken. Um, I cannot believe that Cal Peterson is that <laughs> bad, that bad. Like he's, he's got to be better than that. I don't. I think Ayrshon comes back before too long because I don't think Philly tries to do the, two, the three goalies thing for more than playing t chicken with Tampa. I do think that chemistry really boosted Lixell, and those guys are not coming back and unlikely to return, uh, respectively. Um, that all being said, the Flyers are rebuilding, and that's usually a bad sign for the AHL team because it means extended looks for impact AHLers to see if they have anything. I'm taking a slight under here at 78 points. I think they are a team that sneaks into the playoffs in like that scenario we talked about with Hartford at the end where it's like they need to win in regulation they need Bridgeport to lose in overtime and they need Hartford to uh, take one point from pro like some goofy mm -hmm. you know uh, uh, you need a PhD in mathematics to <laughs> understand how like this works out so I, I think it's going to be one of those seasons when they get to the playoffs who knows um, but like I, I think they sneak in all right, let's move on and talk about the team we refer to as the Bridgeport Sound Tigers. Sarah, what did they do last year? What does their staff look like? Well, they certainly did not earn the right to be called anything other than the Bridgeport Sound Tigers. Uh, they were 34 and 38, seventh in the Atlantic Division. Uh, they're headed up by Rick Kowalski as their head coach. Uh, he has a career 281 and 333 record as a head coach. Uh, three playoff appearances. He's one and three in AHL playoff series, joined on the bench by Matt McDonald and Pascal Rayom. In the additions column to the roster, Riley Piercy, Dalen Kufler, Carson Kuhlman, Brian Pino, who is now free, Ashton Calder, Ituliokas, and Dimitro Timoshev. They lost some things, though. Sarah, who is no longer on the sound of Bridgeport? <laughs> <laughs> they lost Andy Andrioff, Chris Terry, Colin Adams, Blade Jenkins. By the way, that's a sick name. Blade Jenkins, uh, Jimmy Lambert, Eric Brown, Paul Thompson, Parker Watherspoon, Ryan McKinnon, and Corey Schneider. So we're going to talk about some uh, kind of big picture questions and vibes from the team. We're going to look at two prospects and then we're going to play Sean and Sarah versus The Machine. Uh, so I will start here first. The big question here is, what does the Rick Kowalski era look like? Um, I talked about this with friend of the show, uh, Mitch Anderson, on 
Oh, it's not Eyes on Isles anymore. I'm so sorry, Mitch, that I do not remember the name of your podcast. Up the Turnpike? That sounds correct. Uh, they do really good work over there. He had me to talk about Rick Kowalski a little bit. And I, I'm going to give Rick Kowalski a fair shake. I do not want to come in with preconceived notions about what he might be as a head coach now compared to what he was many years ago in Albany. But I don't think it looks different if I had to you know, uh, make a stand here. But the problem, I think, no matter what he is as a coach, is the roster he has been handed to him is not good. <laughs> Terry and Andreoff are gone, and while I'm the president and treasurer of the Brian Penhill <laughs> fan club, him and Carson Kuhlman are not enough to bridge that gap. Never mind that Corey Schneider retired, and Jakob Skarek has 103 AHL games under his belt and has never finished a season with a save percentage north of 900, let alone league average. Skarek has NHL tools, but he makes mental mistakes that keep him from wielding those tools effectively. I am like, I, I try not to put failures on coaches when it's like, well, you didn't get saves. You can't just go out there as a coach and be like, well, save more pucks goalie. Like that's not how it works. Like you can structure a defense to the goaltender strengths and weaknesses, but you still need someone to put pucks in the net to, you know, get pucks in transition. And Man, this roster it does not leave a lot to the imagination here. Sarah, what are your thoughts on this team? So for me, one of the biggest things is going to be watching to see what development the youths make on this on this team. Um, those young guys are going to be driving the bus this season in terms of where this team goes. Um, Robin Salo in particular needs to take a leap this year. Um, ignore the fact that he's 25. He's already aged out of where we think of most prospects. And his performance in both the AHL and NHL has underwhelmed so far. Forget all that. The Sound Tigers need him to make a leap because without him, only Dennis, Dennis Chalowski is really capable of moving pucks on defense, and that is just not going to be enough to be successful. Also curious to see if William Dufour can take a leap forward, help fill the gap left by Terry and Andrioff. Um, this is a guy who has shot his high end. Uh, he was overpowering AHL goalies from the mid-range last year. His skating took a step in the right direction as well. Um, and is he going to be able to continue on that trend where the skating takes another step forward? And can Ruslan Ishikov find the drive to just care more? in the defensive zone. Um, he is still one of the best puck handlers in the Atlantic division. He's very dangerous one-on-one, -on -one, but if he wants to crack an NHL roster, he is going to, need, going to either need to take a leap in his offensive skill set or decide that he wants to play defense more vigorously. You can't, you, you have to pick, pick a lane. Um, the Sound Tigers, they will take either one. Uh, they need more scoring, but they also likely need a more devoted group in their own end as well. Um, I think everyone, everything could break right for this team this season and they could be competitive, but it's more likely than not that this is going to be a team that misses the playoff by five points. Um, they've lost big scoring teams and they just didn't really replace it. Um, it's more likely they're going to come up short here. All right. Let's talk about two prospects to watch. Sarah, I will let you go first. So we've got uh, Matthew Maggio. Uh, he is a bit of a one-trick pony. Uh, he's got an excellent shot. It's got velocity, accuracy, uh, a quick release. And he's a guy, he's not a guy who just hurls the puck on net from the shadow of the blue line. Um, he finds the soft space inside to shoot from um, when he's off puck and will drive inside with the puck to shoot from places that make him a scoring threat. And that's it, pretty much. For the good parts. Um, his skating isn't mechanically sound. Uh, he can make plays but lacks kind of that fine touch consistently. His puck handling, his IQ in, in terms of hockey are both around AHL average. So there is a lot to build on here, but AHL impact forwards have certainly made a career from one outstanding skill that their game is built around. Um, Martin Furk, um, Charles Houdon, uh, Michael Carcone, just to name a few. Um, but is, is that going to be enough for him? Uh, we'll see. Ooh, uh, Anthony Greco. Mm. Uh, sorry, that's not the prospect I'm going to talk about, but another, no. like, I have one skill, uh -huh. which was, like, skating, but not much going with it. Uh, yeah. My prospect I want to talk about is A2 Leokas. Leokas is, plays a pretty well-rounded game. Uh, unlike Matthew, Matthew Maggio, he has a solid shot, but he also has puck skills that flash. He forechecks well and battles for pucks. He's not afraid to throw his body around and be physical. He can kill penalties, but he lacks the pace and foot speed to be more effective 
forward. He has the will to, you know, forecheck and to get to places. He has some anticipation that can help him play fast, but he is not fast. Um, if he can make developmental steps there, we can start to see him be on the Islanders' radar for call-ups. But until then, he's going to likely spend his time developing in Bridgeport for the majority of the season. All right, Sarah, are you ready to play host versus the machine? Let's bring on the computer. All right. The machine for the Bridgeport Sound Tigers says 75 points on average. They are a coin flip to make the playoffs. <laughs> they do win the division a 3% of the time. Uh, Sarah, what say you? Man, <laughs> I'm worried that we're going to go into another year of just not having to respect the Bridgeport Sound Tigers when everything is all said and done. Um, I don't see a lot of new names on here that move the needle for me. And if I'm also an Islanders fan, I am deeply concerned about the future state of my NHL team based on what's been going on um, in the AHL. There is just not a lot here. I would love it if they proved me wrong, if they finally earned their uh, stripes. Ha <laughs> ha. Tigers. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha. Um, <laughs> but I, I don't think that things are going to go well. I think we're going to go into another season of still calling them the Bridgeport Sound Tigers. I'm taking the under um, at 72 points. <sighs> I don't like doing this. I don't. Like... This does not bring me joy, uh, but right out of the gate, under, very under. This team lost two of its best forwards, one of its best defensemen, and its best goaltender, and didn't do much to replace that or even give me the idea that that was replaced by guys already on the roster. Like, I think guys like Dufour make steps forward, Robin Salo, maybe, maybe not, but that ain't enough. They made 72 points last season, and you're saying they're going to be better, Machine? No, <laughs> new way, no, 68 points. And if, I'll say this, because we made a deal last year. I will make a different deal this year. If we end up awarding them the Mia Culpa Award, I will personally drive that to the Bridgeport office, present it to them. I will buy stuff at the uh, the office on the way back or the, the store on the way back. They will earn the name that they've changed to that no one likes. That is the If they win the Mia Culpa, that is the deal. Uh, I am saying 68 points. They missed the playoffs very comfortably. I just... I don't know how you look at this roster like, <laughs> yep, bring on it. Like we're, we're already placing where we're hanging the Atlantic division banner. Like, no, no. All right. I don't enjoy doing that. Like, no, it's I, not fun. but like, I feel like now I've made so much of like crapping on Bridgeport, but it's like, make me look bad. Please, right. please earn that <laughs> spot in making me look bad. Anyway. Let's move on. Let's talk about the Wilkes-Barre Scranton Penguins. Sarah, tell me about their bench and what they did last year. So last season, uh, the Wilkes-Barre Scranton Penguins were 26 and 46. That was eighth in the Atlantic Division. Uh, their head coach is J.D. Forrest, who has a 74 and 106 record as an AHL head coach. He's made one playoff appearance where he's one and one. Uh, in AHL playoff series. Joined on the bench by Sheldon Brookbank, who I forgot that's where he was, um, and Kevin Porter uh, as his assistants. To be fair, I believe Sheldon Brookbank is new. I believe this is the first season that they have a full complement of coaching staff and are no longer a poverty franchise hey. for the first time in several years. Like, I think uh, when Mike Sullivan was hired from there, that was the last time they had a full coaching staff. I would have to look that up, but it's been a long time. Anyway, additions. Uh, Evan Veerling, Austin Ruschoff, Rem Picklick, Yonick Kupanen, Mark Johnstone, Redeem Zahorna again, <laughs> <laughs> Vinny Hinnestroza, Andreas Johansson, because Kyle Dubas cannot quit Andreas Johansson, <laughs> Colin White, Isaac Bellevue, Dmitry Samarukov, Magnus Helberg, Garrett Sparks, and now Jack Rathbone. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> All right. Who said goodbye to Wilkes-Barre? Sarah. Uh, they've said goodbye to Philip Hollander, Drake Kajula, uh, Nathan, Nathan Ligari, uh, Cal Olson, Josh Meniscalso, Meniscalso uh, Christ Christopher Marizier Ortiz, Colin Sawyer, Mitch Ranke, Philip Lindbergh, Dustin Tokarski, Mark Friedman, and Ty Glover. Lots of moving parts on this team, which, I mean, they were bad last year, so that's good. Mm -hmm. um, so 
uh, if you are just tuning in now, we're going to cover some kind of uh, big questions and vibes that we have for this team for the season. We're going to talk about two prospects that are a little off the beaten path that may be new to the team or new to fans. And then we're going to play Sean and Sarah versus the machine. Let's, I will start here on storylines. Uh, let's, let's talk about what this roster has done. Uh, this is a team that has a lot of top end talent for the AHL. And while I expect guys like Zahorna and Nylander and Hinestroza and Colin White to get looks in the NHL, I also expect Andreas Johansson at some point, because again, uh, he is the cowboy that Kyle Dubas cannot quit. Um, <laughs> I, I think one or more of them could be picked off waivers, but as it stands, this is a good forward group. And it certainly backs the idea that Pittsburgh wants to make sure wilkes barre Scranton is competitive. Uh, every AHL team talks about, we want our, our kids, our youths, our prospects to be raised in a winning environment. And coaches have lost their jobs because of that. Uh, I look at Roy Sommer, Tim Army, uh, Ben Simon last year maybe a little Manny Viveros, um, but not yet J.D. Forrest. Um, it's been a few years since the baby fans felt like they were contenders, and this forward group certainly looks like they could return to that. The defense gives similar vibes, too. Uh, they just acquired Jack Rathbone, who's an excellent offensive defenseman at the AHL level. Not a lot of defense going on there, but he does move the puck at a, a high level at this level. Uh, Xavier Ouellette, Dmitry Samarukov, Ty Smith, they can all move the puck. This is an aspect that the team struggled with last year, moving the puck in transition, uh, getting from your defensive zone through the neutral zone into the offensive zone in one controlled fashion. Uh, that's really important for, you know, generating scoring chances and keeping, you know, scoring chances from happening. The team struggled with that a lot last season, especially down the stretch. And we talk about it all the time on the show, how important transition is. Um, Cause if you can't get the puck out of your own zone with possession, uh, you're not going to create, creating goals is going to be very, very hard. Um, I, I think that that improves dramatically Wilkes-Barre Scranton's ability and transition this season, given the level of talent they have on this team. And more importantly, where that, that talent is distributed. They have a lot of good puck movers on the blue line. They have guys that maybe aren't the fastest up front, but know what to do on breakouts. They aren't uh, a bunch of, uh, you know, guys straight out of junior, straight out of college who aren't ready for the speed or the breakouts uh, of a professional hockey team. Sarah, what, what say you here? So we've talked about the like nightmare situation of an NHL team trying to do a three goalie rotation and how it never works. Um, Wilkes-Barre Scranton has like, they have seen that and they have accepted the challenge of doing something worse <laughs> um, because they have four potential goalies right now um, in their, their orbit. Uh, they have Joel Blom Blomquist, Taylor Gauthier, Magnus Helberg, and Garrett Sparks. Like as a coach, how do you manage that? Especially with having two of those guys, Blomquist and Gauthier, who are both actual prospects. You have four goalies. Like, there's not enough, like, three and threes in the world to, to, <laughs> to justify this. Um, this is going to be fascinating to see how it works, who gets, like, shipped to the EACHL just to, like, have something to do, like, what what even is Garrett Sparks doing there? Like, I have no idea what they're trying to accomplish with this, but it's going to be messy. I'm at this point convinced that Garrett Sparks is just scared of retirement. Like, yeah, he's getting older. He's not played that much because he's been hurt a ton. Mm -hmm. um, and he just do like doesn't know what to do with himself. And yeah. like, if that's the case, that is also true of throw a dart at any player that's mm -hmm. kind of in his uh, career range that's in their like mid to late thirties. Like a lot of guys, it seems like they just play because they're like, I don't know what to do with myself. Right. I'm not a hockey player. And I think that very much could be Garrett Sparks, but yeah. Um, I was always warned that two wrongs don't make a right. I was never war uh, warned about four. Um, <laughs> like that's, I, I, I <laughs> why? I wonder if you're going to see Wilkes-Barre like experiment where they play like three forwards, defensemen and two goalies in yeah. the same time. Like, why not? I, I just, uh, th this is, <laughs> this is a little bit of madness. And like, yeah. I mean, Gauthier, I, I don't really believe in, but like Helberg at least has shown to be competent at times. Mm -hmm. like Joel Blomquist, who we're going to talk about here shortly. Uh, Sparks, I would like to believe there is something left. There but yeah, I, I, 
I, I don't know how much I believe in that belief. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get to prospects. I will start, and I will talk about Joel Blomquist, who I do believe in. He's a goalie I've been waiting to see in Wilkes-Barre Scranton for a while, but they keep sending him back to, back to Europe, and I never liked that. He's a flashy goaltender, has great athleticism. He can really just explode post to post. He is still a work in progress, though, as he's kind of struggled to track the puck and hasn't done as well with plays going from low to high. He still has some sloppiness in his movement to work out. I do think, and I said this last season too, when it looked like he might stick in Wilkes-Barre Scranton, but he has the potential to be an NHL goalie in some capacity. I don't know if that's a starter or a backup or kind of like a, a between goalie, but with the crowded crease in Wilkes-Barre, I think there's a chance he might not get those opportunities to play that would allow him to grow, which makes me sad. Like, he is an exciting goalie to watch and a frustrating goalie to watch because he will make that like big two on one cross crease save that makes Sports Center, but then let in like some squeaker from the blue line where it just like kind of goes between his arm and you're like, but but you made you made that save. Why you no make this save? <laughs> this save easy. Like <sighs> he he will be that goalie a couple of times, and I think that also does not endear him to a four uh, a four person rotation. However, that's supposed to work. Um, but I, I do like what Joel Blomquist can do, and I'm hoping he gets the chance to cook a little bit. Sarah, who you got? So I've got my eye on Samuel Poulin. Um, he last season took four months off from hockey to focus on his mental health, and that is great. Like I wish that more players were able to recognize that, were able to feel empowered and the freedom to actually do that, that they had a team that supported them when they made that decision. Um, so I think that is great. I hope that his return to the ice means that he can rediscover his game a little bit. Um, he does have NHL caliber, caliber tools as a shooter, um, as a playmaker. He's also got a fair amount of sandpaper in his game. He can play through contact, um, and you need players like that, especially come playoff time when the physicality gets dialed up. Every puck is a contested one. However, he still does have heavy feet. He struggles to play with pace, even at the AHL level. If he can make a leap in his skating stride, then we could see him unlock a lot more offense this season. Um, but like Blomquist, uh, I do worry about him getting buried on the depth chart a bit here. Um, there's just so much veteran talent that has NHL experience in Wilkes-Barre Scranton this season. Um, he's going to need minutes on the ice to be able to make progress, even if he occasionally struggles in those minutes. Um, it's just not certain how much of an opportunity he's going to get. Or how long that leash is going to be. Like, yeah. it's got to be hard to put, you know, uh, Colin White, I'll say, on mm -hmm. the third line, or Redeem Zahorna on the third line, or mm -hmm. Vinny Hinnestros on the third line, and maybe bump them off the power play for Sam Poulain when he's struggling. Right. But, like, the AHL is a developmental league, and that is kind of the nature of the beast mm -hmm. that 31 of 32 AHL teams are going to have to deal with this. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's play Host versus the Machine. Sarah. The machine says, Wilkes-Barre Scranton, 83 points on average. They make the playoffs 84% of the time. They win the division 15%. That is the like most favorable distribution for standing points for Wilkes-Barre Scranton that they've seen in probably five, six, seven years. Like It has been dark days in coal country, mm -hmm. Pennsylvania uh, for <laughs> hockey. So uh, I think if nothing else, the idea that they could hit 105 points, even if it's a tiny chance, mm -hmm. is exciting. Uh, what say you? Over, under? Uh, so I really like what Pittsburgh uh, has done here um, in terms of who the NHL level has brought in uh, to play for Wilkes-Barre. Um, they brought in a lot of tweener guys who are almost certainly going to wind up with spot duty in the NHL. Like it, it, it Pittsburgh's a, a, a Twitter joke for a reason because it, it's like the stereotype, but it's true of every season. Like eight guys get hurt at the same time. Like, Vinny Hinestros is probably going to score like 10 goals next to Sidney Crosby in three games or something just because like that's just that's just how it happens. But when that chaos isn't happening, when Pittsburgh isn't like having like the Mark Donkening, um, <laughs> like, these guys are going to be impact players when they're in the AHL. Um, this should be a much better team than last year. Um, I think that's going to make life a lot more interesting in this division. Um, and I think that it's finally going to give um, Baby Pens fans a little something more to look forward to than they have recently. So I'm going to take the over. I'm going with 87 points. I'm going to go with they're having fun this year. <laughs> that's a big over too, Sarah. 
Um, they won 26 games out of 72 last year. So it absolutely bad. cannot be worse. Than that. <laughs> um, but I, I, I think the model is really discounting some players here in that that its assessment. It has Colin White as a second line player in the AHL right now, and I do not think that is correct. I think the goaltending is the chance to be the best in the division, if nothing else, because it's the deepest. Not just because they have four guys, but like. <laughs> All four of them, you could at least squint at and be like, that's a starting AHL goaltender at the very worst. You have to squint a little more with Garrett Sparks, but it's still there. Yeah, uh, he was. I am, taking the, I am taking the over here because when I look at their roster next to most of the rest of the division, I like Wilkes-Barre Scranton a fair amount more. I'm saying 86 points. I'm not apparently as high as Sarah is on this team. One like, point. <laughs> this, this team, it's hard to see like, Oh, Pittsburgh calls up one guy, two guys. Somebody gets mm -hmm. like they should be like insulated from having yeah. to play, you know, wheeling nailers in the top six yeah. by a very fair amount. Like it is going to take a, you know, a, an ER full of injuries and call ups <laughs> to make this team be like, man, we could use some depth guys here. Like yeah. I think that counts a lot. That's a lesson Hershey learned last year, mm -hmm. and it paid off pretty well for them, I'd say. Now, I'm not making equivocations <laughs> about what works very scranton can do. 86 points though, over. All right. We are going to head to break here. After the break, we will get to the North Division. This is going to be the longest episode I think we ever record. Um, but if you're just here for the Atlantic Division and this is your jumping off point, thank you for stopping by. Don't forget to subscribe wherever you're listening to us from so you get episodes in a timely fashion. Also, check us out on social media. We have fun there. We're on all of the platforms except for TikTok because... I do not need the Chinese government tracking me. Links to all of our social media and more can be found at our Linktree page at linktr.ee slash the Calder Farmstead. We're going to run some ads, pay some bills. We will be right back. Stay tuned. And we are back from break. Uh, we are going to dive right back in because this is already going to be a marathon of an episode. Uh, <laughs> Let's go right to the North Division. We're going to go in the order that they finished last season. That means we are starting with the Toronto Marlies. Sarah, tell me what they did last year and who is behind the bench. So last season, the Toronto Marlies uh, were 42 and 30. Uh, that was good for first in the North Division. Uh, they are headed up by John Gruden as their brand new head coach. He's got a clean slate in terms of his AHL head coaching record. Uh, they've got Eric Wellwood and Mike Mike Dyke on the uh, assistant coaches for Toronto. All right. Toronto made a lot of additions in the offseason uh, because Toronto loves to do the roster via clown car. Mm -hmm. They're like, oh, there's no roster limits in the AHL? Let's go. 38 <laughs> guys on this team. Uh, Ron uh, their additions are Roni Hervanen, uh, Dylan Gambrell, Ty Vots. Ty Voigt, sorry, Josiah Slavin, Jackson Berezowski, Brock Caulfield, Neil Shea, Tate Singleton, Tyler Weiss, Robert Mastermone, Jay O'Brien, Cousin Jay, good to see you, William Lagerson, Max Lajoie, Nolan Dillingham, David Ferentz, Johnny, Johnny Tuchonik, Simon Benoit, Vacheslav Peska, and Martin Jones. <laughs> so, Sarah, that's, who like a whole, that's like a whole hockey team just of additions. It is. It's literally an entire <laughs> hockey team. Oh, Toronto makes me so tired. Um, they have said goodbye to Semyon Dar Dar Argachintsev. Uh, I finally learned to pronounce his name, and now he's not there anymore. Um, Radim Zahorna, Mark Johnstone, Graham Slaggart, Ryan Chisowski, Jack Bedini, Carl, da Carl Dahlstrom, Noel Hofenmeyer, Mac Hollowell, Philip Kral, Jordy Ben, and Eric Schalgren. All right, so we are going to talk about some questions, vibes, storylines for the team. We're going to talk about two prospects that are maybe a little off the beaten path in more depth. And then Sarah and I are going to go head to head with the machine. So uh, for storylines here, I think the biggest one is obviously a new head coach in John Gruden, who I just assume doesn't dress up as Chucky every Halloween. Props to all three of you who got that reference. I do have a lot of respect for Gruden out of the gate, though, for one reason. He had a playing career that included NHL and AHL games. And when it came to start coaching, he started as a high school coach. Like nowadays, if you played in the NHL and AHL, they're just like, oh, here's an assistant coaching job in the second best league in the world, even though your resume is empty. Uh, but he started in high school, worked the US ND 
NTDP, the National Team Development Program, as an assistant, then went to the OHL, then was an assistant on the Barry Trotz Islanders team before being an assistant coach in Boston last season. John Gruden grinded his way to this spot despite having a legit playing career. And most of the time, those guys are just handed coaching gigs in good places. And he was, he, I don't know if he said no to them or he maybe wasn't offered them or didn't think about them, but that man started from high school and is here. I have a lot of respect for that. That being said, he knows this job isn't just about winning. If it was, Greg Moore would still have a job. His task is to make Maple Leafs while doing some winning along the way. And task number one for him has to be getting Nick Robertson back on back into the place he was when he got hurt last year. Like I vividly remember the night that uh, Nick Robertson scored the OT winner against Dallas. October 21st, I want to say. It was like before our Halloween episode. And there was just this influx of Nick Robertson is done with the AHL tweets, posts, stories, think pieces, podcast episodes from everyone in the hockey media sphere. And I remember thinking at the time, like, man, people are just out here asking for old takes exposed to come from them. <laughs> like, not to like, not to say that I disagreed with the time that Robertson played really well and showed something was probably going to stick on the Leafs for a while, but like, nothing is ever guaranteed, even when you're as good as Nick Robertson is. He's looked excellent, and I still think he has an NHL future if his health will cooperate. Staying healthy is not really a skill it's just a thing that happens to you but one stellar game it, it, in a maple leaf journey is not a permanent roster spot make uh this is not like garth snow as the gm of the islanders where you know someone else has to buy the team to fire you uh, <laughs> but like he does have to get back on track after an early season ending injury last year he has to outmaneuver younger and shinier toys on the depth chart ahead of him guys like fraser minton matthew nyes like those are dudes that may or may not be more talented than him in terms of prospect glow, but like they're ahead of him on the depth chart and he's going to have to catch up to them. And I think that is job number one for John Gruden. Sarah, what say you? So, I mean, we joked about it in the intro, but the biggest task he's going to have is balancing ice time. There are like 7,000 people on this roster. Um, the Marley's clown car of a roster has a lot of projects that are going to need ice time beside Robertson uh, to get into a groove and to prove what they've got. They've got Abrazesi, Hirvonen, Ovechkinov, uh, Steves, Tverberg, Voigt, Niemela, Villanueve. Like, that's a lot of guys. And the veterans on the roster are not just there to play 12 minutes a night and hang out either. Uh, they are who they are at this point. That's fine. But playing them helps the team win. Guys like Landizi, Shaw, McMahon, Gambrell, Lagesson, Lajoie, even Cal Clifford still comes down and chips in every once in a while. And it's the same thing in net. Sure, Martin Jones is probably the best goalie on the roster, but Dennis Hildeby, he's a fourth round pick from 2022. Keith Petrozelli, he's a third rounder from 2017. And while he's gotten playing time so far in his career, like he hasn't exactly been a workhorse. That is a lot to be asked to balance, um, especially in a market like Toronto, where even though it's not the NHL, people are still real weird about hockey. Uh, so I don't envy the task ahead of John Gruden in figuring all of this out. At least he has the problem of having a bunch of talent on his roster as opposed to just trying to plug holes in the depth chart with scrubs. But still, like that is a lot to manage and good luck, my man. <laughs> Yeah, he basically has to do like a reverse Kowalski here is, is you know, the, the task at hand. Uh, I, I will say too, like, Martin Jones is probably the best goalie on the roster, but like, that's a very capital P probably. Like, <laughs> I remember when I saw that the Leafs signed Martin Jones and it's like, oh, but he's going to be a third goaltender. And I'm like, but do you want to play him? He's been mm -hmm. like bottom 10 in goal save above expected in like the last four NHL seasons consecutively. Like, yeah, if you play him, he technically speaking is an NHL goaltender, <laughs> but he's like goalie number 64 in terms mm -hmm. of there are 64 NHL yeah. goaltenders. He is the 64th. <laughs> is that really what you like? Is that what you want to invest your dollars in as a third goaltender? Sure. Yeah. Like for the Marlies, I think you'll probably be okay, but yeah. like maybe, maybe, 
All right, let's talk prospects to watch. Uh, Sarah, I will let you go first because I have tripped over this name too many times. <laughs> okay. uh, so we're going to start out by looking at Topi Niemela. Uh, he didn't play much for the Marlies last season, but any worry that his transition wouldn't go well, I think is going to be able to be put to bed. Um, Niemela has a lot of offensive tools to like. He's got an NHL shot paired with good playmaking vision. Uh, he can definitely see where the play is going. He can get a jump on it to create offense. Uh, he's also solid in transition and he adds layers of deception uh, to his game. Defensively, I also like what he has to, go to offer a lot as well. I do think he might have some trouble defending speed. Uh, his rush defense has been kind of sketchy at times, especially against faster forwards. But in the zone, he can lock it down, which is something that the Marlies are really desperately going to need. For my prospect, I would like to talk about Ty Voigt. Uh, Ty Voigt is not short on NHL caliber skills. He's fast. He has high-end puck skills and playmaking vision. He's an underrated shooter and has put it all together well with a so with solid hockey IQ. However, when you're 5'10 and 160 pounds, 161 pounds, sorry, don't want to cheat you, the question will always be how you handle contact. And that's where the questions here feel legitimate. In the OHL, uh, Voigt improved his ability to play through contact as time went on, but the AHL ain't the OHL. And those... Uh, Th those players at the OHL level, they will not be the grown-ass men laying the body on Ty Voigt, uh in this season. And how he handles that and problem-solves it is going to tell the story about how he does with the Marlies this year. I think he struggles with it, not just because he's 5'10 and 161 pounds, but the OHL is not the AHL in terms of speed, physicality, talent, etc. Like, that's a very different beast. And I think that's one that trips up pretty much everyone. Like there aren't a lot of guys that you can point to that came straight from juniors or the NCAA as, mm -hmm. you know, 20, 19, 20 or less guys who aren't drinking age in the U S more mm -hmm. or less um, and walk right in and succeed. Like th those guys, you can count on one shop teacher's hand uh, throughout the last five years, I think. But I think he's going to be okay. Like long-term, this season maybe not, but I think long-term he's going to be a good player. Maybe not for the Maple Leafs because development is never guaranteed or a straight line. But I think in future seasons he will show out to be a much better – he will have a much better outcome than this one. All right, Sarah, it's machine time. Are you ready? Let's do it. The machine says – 87 points on average for the Toronto Marlies. They make the playoffs 94% of the time and win the division 34% of the time. That distribution is heavily skewed up north, which makes sense. They're Canadian. Uh, Sarah, what say you? So is preparing for this show how I learned that former Los Angeles King Martin Jones is now a Toronto Marley? Um I will neither confirm nor deny that, um, but let's just say maybe I learned some new information here. Um, I do overall like what the Marlies have done here. Um, it's hard not to when you have signed literally like 25 new guys to go in addition with the 25 guys you had already. Um, I do think that the Leafs are largely going to leave them alone. Uh, and they've got a good vet mix of, you know, veteran and young guy as well. Um, I have watched a lot of Max Lajoie over the past few years uh, when he's been in Chicago. Um, I think that he's a very underrated player. The Wolves were a different team when he was out with injury or called up to the Hurricanes than they were with, you know, with him in the roster. Um, and I also think he's a great presence for any of those younger defensemen uh, on the roster as well. So I, I think that they've made some, some solid additions for this team. I'm going to take the under, but not by much. We're going to go with 85 points. For me, I think the forwards and defense look deep here. And I think that's what the model sees as well, in theory, with its pretend eyes. But I think Lajoie is really underrated around the league. Um, and I think I, I I want to believe that Nick Robertson is once again ready to show that he does not belong here. The goaltending, though, yeesh, uh, what does Martin Jones have left? <laughs> he hasn't been in the AHL in a decade and hasn't been a good NHL goalie in like five seasons. He's 33 and pretty clearly on the decline, but is that good enough for like league average goaltending? If the Leafs can get, or sorry, if the Marlies can get like league average, like nine, 906, 904 uh, over the course of the season for Martin Jones in like 35 starts, I think that would be a huge dub for them. 
and propel them to exactly what the model thinks. But like, man, I don't know. I don't think that's guaranteed in goaltending is voodoo. <laughs> I think the Mar Marlies are solid around him, but as a wise person once said, you can have all of the talent in the world skating around out there, but if you have, don't have a goaltender, it doesn't matter. <laughs> I'm going to take that to heart and I'm going to take the under here. I'm saying 84 points, still a good team, still a fun team, mm -hmm. but not quite the, you know, stand up uh, division winning by, you know, d division locked up by January kind of team. Mm -hmm. All right, let us move on. Let us talk about, the Syracuse Crunch. Sarah, what do they do? Who is their coach? So last season, the Syracuse Crunch were 35 and 37. That placed them second in the North Division. Uh, they are led by Joel Bouchard, uh, who has a 111 and 131 record as a head coach in the AHL. He's made one playoff appearance where he is 0 for 1 in AHL playoff series. Assistant coaches are Daniel Jacob and AJ McLean. For the additions that they added... Maxim Groshev, Walteri Morella, that, that cannot be a real person, Logan <laughs> Brown, Mitchell Chafee, Roman Schmitz, Emil Martinson, Lilberg. What are they, just making up names here? <laughs> Devontae Stevens, Matt Tompkins, Evan Fitzpatrick, and one, Pyotr Kochekov. <laughs> Sarah, who'd they lose? So they've said goodbye to Simon Ryforce, Rudolph Balsers, uh, Grant Mishmash, Gamal Smith, Trevor Carrick, Tyson Feist, Ryan Jones, Max Lagasse, and Jack LaFontaine. So if you haven't been listening to this entire show in its entirety, um, th that's fair. I don't know why you would. This is going to be like three and a half hours. I think, at the end. <laughs> um, so we're going to cover some kind of vibes, storylines, big picture topics for the team. We're going to focus on two prospects and dive a little deeper into them. Ones that are a little bit off the beaten path, perhaps, and new to the team. And then we're going to play host versus the machine. I will start us off here. So the big storyline is um, Ben Grew is out. <laughs> Joel, Bo Joel Bouchard is in. One of the more bizarre offseason moves in Syracuse that I think everyone was just like, wait, I'm sorry, what happened? <laughs> uh, Syracuse is a new head coach. And like, I don't think anyone saw this coming. Like Iowa parting with ways with Tim Army. Sure. We, I think, called that directly. Grand Rapids letting Ben Simon go. We definitely called that one. Henderson dumping Manny Viveros. We had an idea, but we're a little surprised here. Just what? Why, why do you do that? And that's not to say Joel Bouchard is a bad coach. He won our 2021 Best Coach Award. He was the inaugural winner of that award on our uh, completely screwy and for fun uh, award show. And Bouchard, though, has had a very combative relationship with his players in the past, and he wasn't afraid of sharing it. Uh, you can Google Joel Bouchard and Phil Veroni or Riley Barber or Dale Weiss or Daniel Ardette or Keith Kincaid. And you will find stories of Joel Bouchard just finding the bus and then just tossing them <laughs> under. Uh, like, And those were all veteran players who Bouchard was convinced that they convinced Bouchard they hadn't bought into the team, team dynamic, the team philosophy and what he was preaching on the ice. And those teams suffered for it. Those like first two seasons in the ball were not great. But when Bouchard got the team that it seemed like he wanted in 2021, and yes, COVID year, watered down rosters, empty buildings, only, Can only Canadian teams, but that Rocket team was damn good. And they were amazing to watch play. Uh, I, I very much enjoyed the just fast, tenacious forecheck of that team and then just lamping teams night in, night out. But is that team this team? Is this a Joel, a Joel Bouchard roster? I'm not so sure. And as we've seen in the past, that mattered. It, maybe he's grown as a coach and he's not going to be that combative. But I kind of doubt it. He's French-Canadian AHL John Tortorella in my <laughs> mind. And I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. But it may not be the thing that Syracuse needs this year. Sarah, what say you? So one of the biggest things for Syracuse is who they're missing and probably won't get back. Um, Alex Barry Boulay, Trevor Carrick, Darren Radish are all gone. Um, Barry Boulay might get sent back. Um, I believe that he was just waived but not assigned yet. So TBD on that. Uh, fingers crossed that he doesn't 
come back for his own sake. Um, he does not need to be here. But that is last season's best forward award winner, finalist for best hockey flow, which is clearly very important to the team, um, and our best defenseman award winner for last year. Um, in addition to the flow, Carrick is also very steady as a veteran defensive defenseman. Like he's the guy like that in terms of the AHL and they get replaced with Mitchell Chafee. Hmm? We'll get to him in a minute, but that leaves a lot of production to be filled, uh, to be filled by guys like uh, Gage Goncalves, Gabe Fortier, Cole Capecki. Cole uh, it, I, it's not looking great. Um, Goncalves had a good season. He took a big leap forward. Uh, the other two had bad years and they took steps back. Uh, this season, all of those guys are going to need to step up and drive offense in a big way um, without Barry Boulay in the lineup. And that is going to be challenging, but it's going to likely be the story of the season this year for the crunch. All right, Sarah, uh, you teed it up. Talk about Mitchell Chafee. So he is outside the age bounds for what we'd really consider a prospect, but he's a guy who's new to the team, um, and he's someone who can generate some offense. He also missed a lot of last season with a knee injury, so he's rebounding from that. Uh, he is a pretty solid puck hound. He's an underrated forechecker. He's got a nose for the net, um, and all that is possible because of his strong skating. Uh, he is also a heavy player in his play style, so if Syracuse makes the playoffs, that physicality is going to be a big asset for them. Uh, that also extends to the defensive zone as well, where even as a winger, he's been an asset. Um, he doesn't hesitate to apply pressure, force puck carriers into making bad choices. Um, without Alex Barry Boulay in the lineup, guys like Chafee are going to be asked to play a bigger role in the offense on this team. Um, and he does seem like a Bouchard kind of guy, given his intensity, his useful forechecking ability. So it wouldn't be shocking to see him thrive this season, assuming the knee is recovered and at 100%. All right. For my side of this, I want to talk about Pyotr Kachekov here a bit. <laughs> I've seen the reactions of him being assigned to Syracuse that I don't really think are warranted here. Like, don't get me wrong. Kochekov is a very fun goaltender, a very fun goaltender, a lot of personality, and that bleeds through on the ice. I think he's good for locker room vibes alone. He's definitely going to be good for the crunch social team, <laughs> but people acting like he's the Eastern Conference's Dustin Wolf, I think need to slow their roll a little bit. Like, don't get me wrong, Kochekov has all the raw tools you want in a goaltender. He's 6'2", which isn't super tall for a modern goaltender, but it checks the box of, like, meet, uh, meets, the bo meets the bar of goaltender height that people won't question. But he also has the athleticism of a much smaller goaltender. He tracks the puck at a high level, he has good save selection, and he can make desperation saves that make sports center. But Kochekov is wildly inconsistent, mostly because he plays a style that is the opposite of conservative. He gets out past the top of his crease and challenges shooters. He's aggressive at playing the puck. He won't shy away from traffic in front, but he will also give up goals that a more conservative approach would stop. He's not the Dustin Wolf of the Eastern Conference. He's the Yaroslav Askarov of the Eastern Conference. <laughs> the highs are insane and they will be a lot of fun. But man, are there going to be some goals that go in where you just shake your head. <laughs> like, I think he has an NHL future as a starter and maybe even like a capital S starter in the NHL. But right now is not that future. Like maybe he makes that leap this year and we can look back on this and say, what an idiot I am. But his resume to date is not one of Eastern Conference Dustin Wolf. It is Eastern Conference Yaroslav Askarov. And yeah, big paws and a puppy, but has he grown into them? I don't think so yet. We're going to see some of that growth but he ain't there. All right, Sarah, are you ready to do battle with the machine? I'm going to fight it. Let's do it. All right. The machine says the Syracuse Crunch are a 75 points on average team. They're a, a weighted coin flip 54%. They win the division 3% of the time. A dramatic shift downward. Uh, in that distribution from where we're used to seeing these crunch teams compete. I will go first here. Um, this is real simple for me. The offense should be okay, but if Barry Boulay sticks with Tampa, this could be problematic. Like, don't get me wrong. We said it to him when he accepted the award for best forward. 
we do not want to see you again because that means you made it in the show, which he should. I think if he was in just about any other pipeline, like you put him in Arizona, he's their like third yeah. line center. Uh, you you put him in San Jose, he's probably a first liner. But like <laughs> in Tampa, it's a little harder than that. Um, I the defense is not great, and while I think Kachekov takes a step forward in his development, he's not shown that he can consistently be a stud even at the AHL level over time. That plus, who knows how these guys respond to Joel Bouchard's style of coaching i'm taking the under here i think this is a season for syracuse uh fans that they're going to try and drink away in the future i'm going to say 73 points sarah so if there was some kind of guarantee that kochetkov was going to end up staying in syracuse all year i would be higher on this team um, he very nearly pulled an incredibly bad Wolves team last year into the playoffs just in the handful of games that he played in the back half of the season. They missed it by like a point. Um, but eventually, Andre Vasilevsky comes back to Tampa. Matt Tompkins or whoever decide, you know, they, they decide to send down comes back to Syracuse. And the Hurricanes are going to have to find somewhere else to put their guy probably. Um, that's not even taking into account the fact that it's a given that the Hurricanes are going to deal with goalie injuries. That's just how it works. Uh, just the other night, Freddie Anderson got pulled from a game after taking a puck to the head, and now Kochetkov has already been called up to the NHL to sit on a bench while they wait to see what's going on with Freddie Anderson. So, like, you have this guy who isn't even part of your franchise, who is a great goalie, but you can't count on him because he belongs to someone else. <laughs> And they're going to steal him away, whether you like it or not. Hugo Allenfeld is fine. Obviously, he was fine for this team last year. But those big names from the roster who were missing, Barry Boulay, Darren Radish, uh, who are up with Tampa, their absence is going to hurt this team big time. Um, I'm also going with under, and I'm I'm with you on this one, 73 points. I also don't understand how Matt Tompkins got that job over. Yeah, yeah, that I was I had to read that like three times. <laughs> Like, I, I remember when I saw that, and I just looked this up now, like, that's the same Matt Tompkins that was in Rockford a couple years mm -hmm. ago that was very not good. Yep. Yep. And he got that job over Hugo Olnefeld. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's a choice. <laughs> and Breeze Ball, we trust, I guess. But, I guess. yeah, Matt Tompkins should not be taking starts over Hugo Olnefeld or Peter Kachekov. Also, I like Hugo Olnefeld a lot. If he were to take a leap yeah. this year, put me down now as called it. Um, but I, you need two good goalies in this league. Um, yeah, I, I think this is going to be a struggle season for them. It's hard yeah. to look at that roster and be like, definitely a playoff team. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's move on to the arch nemesis that bounced them from the playoffs in surprising fashion last year, the Rochester Americans. Sarah, tell me about them. Last year, Rochester was a very tidy 36 and 36. Uh, they were third in the North Division. Uh, head coach is Seth Appert. Uh, he's got an 84 and 93 record as an AHL head coach. Two playoff appearances. He's three and two in AHL playoff series. Joined on the bench by Nathan Pitch and v uh, Vaclav Prospal. <laughs> All right. The additions are Oliver Nadeau, Victor Nyochev, uh, Riley Fitz. Fiddler Schultz, Justin Richards, Graham Slaggart, Damian Giroux, Anton Walberts, Brandon Fortunato, Christopher Brown, Nikita Novikov, Ryan Johnson, Nicola, Nicholas Savoy, Devin Lee. Well, not Devin Levi yet, but Dustin <laughs> Cooley and Dustin Tokarski. Sarah, who did they lose? Uh, so they said goodbye to Carson Gusevich, Sean Malone, uh, Lawrence Pilot, Mitch Elliott, Zach Berzola, Peter Tischke, Austin Strand, Malcolm Subban, Beck Morm, and Matt Bartkowski. So we are going to kind of talk about some overview, storylines, vibes, questions we have for the team. We're going to talk about two prospects in depth, and then we're going to play us versus the machine. I will start us off um, with what is the organizational plan for goalies? A topic that has come up quite a few times because it seems like everyone is playing chicken with Tampa. Buffalo currently uh, has three goalies on the roster, Eric Comrie, Rifle, a.k.a. Ukapeka Lukanen, and one obscure prospect, no one's really heard of him. His name's Devon Le Devin, Devin Levi. Ne uh, practically a nobody. Uh, but the Amherst also probably have the best tandem of goalies they've had since well before COVID in Devin Cooley and Dustin Tokarski. I can't imagine a world where Buffalo rosters three goalies for an entire season. So when one inevitably comes to Rochester, 
I'm assuming it's Devin Levi, but that's not guaranteed. Um, what's the plan? Which worthwhile goalies playing time are you shafting here? I mean, I guess Seth Appert can try calling JD Forrest, who has four goalies to manage, <laughs> be like, so what do you do? But I, I, I like I have to imagine that it's going to be Devin Cooley who goes to the ECHL. I think their affiliate is Cincinnati. Not that that matters because ECHL affiliates are made up. But like you laugh, and everyone's always thinks that I'm. Oh, no, they fake. really are. They don't yeah. matter. Everyone like it always makes me laugh every year where they're like, "Our affiliates Jacksonville," and it's like nobody cares. It's you're gonna get like five to you know you're gonna get at least thirty percent of your call ups from other teams. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Um, but I, like I imagine it's Devin Cooley, but like. Devin Cooley's a capable goaltender. He almost helped carried Milwaukee uh, over mm-hmm. Coachella Valley. Like that's not nothing. Yeah. Um, I I just this is going to be a struggle for what they do in net. It is right now for Buffalo, and then it's going to eventually trickle mm-hmm. down to Rochester. And then what do they do? Like mm-hmm. they have talent there, but somebody's got to get the axe, and that's a problem. Sarah, what say you? So I still don't see a solution on the roster to the to the problem that has plagued this team for the entire Seth Appert area uh, era. Um, his teams, by and large, have been able to move the puck and score and all that stuff, but they've struggled with goaltending, which our previous point makes that kind of moot because they have like six of them now. Um, secondly, they've struggled with uh, playing good in zone defense. Uh, does that mean that they need three to four? 6'5", 231 pound Dylan McElrath on the roster. No, um, I would argue that he's quite bad at in zone defense, despite his uh, over cross checky feisty nature. Uh, but because the Amherst have struggled with physical teams who score off the cycle and are heavier at the net front, um, which last season were teams like Hershey, Hartford, Lehigh Valley, Belleville, sounds familiar. Um, the Amherst were five and nine against those teams in the regular season last year. They lost to Hershey in the con- conference finals, but they once again last, lack that presence in a serious way. I mean, maybe like Joseph, uh, Joseph, Chichone, wow, Joseph Chichone, um, maybe. Maybe. Um, but a veteran signing like Alex Petrovic in Texas, Steve Santini in Ontario, Kevin Gravel in Milwaukee would have really boosted the confidence in this team's ability to defend in its own zone at a high level. And maybe someone on the roster emerges as that player. Uh, defense in general is something that's more about diligence and mindset than it is whether or not you can bench press a car, usually. Um, physical strength helps, but only if you wield it well. Um, the AHL is littered with big physical defensemen who actually aren't very good at defending the net front or against the cycle. Um, Dylan McElrath from Hershey, um, Nick Chichek in San Jose, who's another one. Um, Seth Helgeson in Bridgeport, another one. Uh, so it doesn't doesn't matter. Um, but that does concern me going into this season for uh, for Rochester. I still think this team is going to be good. They're going to play an entertaining brand of hockey, but that lack of lockdown guys on the back end just really concerns me. So let's talk about prospects here. And yes, we could easily talk about Isaac Rosen or Yuri Coolidge or Philip Cedarquist, but the Amherst fans have by and large gotten to see them play. They have some notions of what their game looks like. So a lot of us breaking down their game is just confirming what they know. So instead, let's venture off the beaten path as we've been doing here uh, some to some newer prospects in the Sabres pipeline that fans in Rochester probably aren't that familiar with. Uh, I will start us off with Victor Neochev. Neochev has an, has an NHL level skill uh, skill set for the most parts. He has uh, excellent puck skills. He can dangle opponents. If they try to attack him from bad angles, he's going to walk right around them. He has an NHL caliber shot and did a good job with the KHL of finding space uh, off the puck to be a shooting threat. All of that is powered by a motor that does not run out of gas. He's a relentless forechecker and plays hard in his own zone with constant pressure. As with every player in the AHL, it isn't all roses though. His skating needs some work and he also has some consistency issues. Not consistency in effort, mind you, but consistency in making smart decisions with the puck. He'll occasionally try to make solo plays with his hands in moments that are much much better off utilizing teammates or regrouping uh, instead of just viewing the ice as a series of like uh, triangles that you have to dangle through. Uh, and that is something you see a lot of young players kind of get stuck in that mindset because it's what worked for them in juniors and the, the lower ranks. It's like they were able to just walk through guys and it's kind of hard to be like, 
no, no, I can definitely deke this professional defenseman with eight years of experience in the league. And actually, you can't. Sarah, what say you? Who is your guy? Uh, so I'm taking a look at Oliver Nadeau. Uh, he pro profiles simili similarly uh, to, to Neoshov in that they both have a lot of NHL skills. Uh, Nadeau's game is a bit more power forward prototype. However, uh, he is someone who's going to put his shoulder down. He's going to drive to the net, uh, just basically wearing a defender like a backpack. Uh, he likes to make plays in close. Uh, he's primarily a playmaker rather than a sniper. Uh, defensively, he's less inclined to do that, uh, but he's not a, a liability in that area. Uh, like Nyachov, though, uh, his skating speed keeps him from boasting a more complete profile as a prospect. Uh, his stride is just not as mechanically sound, and that's going to keep him from really being able to threaten defenders with any sort of speed or power. All right. That's enough about kids. Let's take on the machine. All right. The machine says for Rochester, 78 points on average. They make the playoffs 73% of the time. They are 8% to win the North Division. A pretty, like a fairly wide distribution, but still pretty central in like playoff E teams. Again, win five of seven, make the playoffs. 73% is basically saying, yeah, you're above 81 points. Um, but the average is 78. Sarah, what say you? So outside of their moves in goaltending, which we still don't entirely know what that's going to shape up to look like, uh, I just don't see a whole ton here uh, that changes the picture for me in terms of what this team was previously. But that goaltending just might be enough to make some magic happen, despite what the rest of the roster looks like. I am taking a slight over here at 80 points. I will say I think this organization has goaltending problems, but good ones. Problems you want to have as an organization with too many guys that can stop pucks. Even if Devin Levi never shows up, and that would make me so sad, please, gods of hockey, send me Devin Levi to the AHL. We will have so much fun. Um, but this is, again, this is one of the best goalie tandems that Rochester's had since before COVID in terms of talent level. If Isaac Rosen and Philip Cedarquist can take a leap forward in production... Rochester could be a dark horse team here. I believe in Seth Appert. I have the whole time, and I'm going to continue to do so. He mm -hmm. seems to get the most out of these kids, and there's still a solid complement of veterans there. Like, not the same ones, but I like the leadership from guys like Michael Marish. Uh, I think that's important. Mm -hmm. I'm taking the over here. I'm a little more optimistic. Uh, I'm saying 82 points. I think this is a team that probably doesn't win the division, but at least gives a team like Toronto a run for its money at the division crown. Like this is not a, a, this is a team that's still at least theoretically in that race in February. And I think that's, that matters. All right. That is enough from the machine for us. We are going to move to Utica. Sarah, tell me about the Utica comments. So last season, Utica was 35 and 37 for fourth in the North Division. Their head coach is Kevin Deneen. He's got a 400 and 325 record as an AHL head coach. He's made nine playoff appearances. He is six and seven in AHL playoff series. Assistant coaches are Ryan Parent and David Cuniff. The additions for the Utica Comets are Chase Stillman, Shane Bowers, Kyle Chris Cuolo, Justin Dowling, Ryan Fitzgerald, Max Willman, Santeri Hataka, Cal Foote, Tyler Brennan, and Eric Shalgren, who left Utica, Sarah. So they have said goodbye to Arne Talvite, uh, Nick Hutchison, Mason Geertsen, Nolan Stevens, Brian Pino, Nick Rivera, Jace Haraluk, Riley Walsh, Jared Gorley, J Zach Hayes, and Zachary Amond. All right. So uh, we're going to talk about some like kind of big overarching topics, some questions, some vibes. We're going to dive into two prospects, a little bit off the beaten path, perhaps. And then we're going to play us versus the machine. So to kick started, um, as Sarah said, a lot of roster turnover here that is impactful. Um, it's a common part. Every, every AHL team, we're going to talk about additions and subtractions. But really, Utica has gone through it. Like that 13-0 and team to start the season that had the North Division won by like New Year's Day. Um, 39 players suited up from that Utica for Utica that season. Eight of them are still in Utica. Graham Clark, Ryan Schmelzer, Joe Gambardella, Robbie Russo, Michael Bukovic, 
Samuel LeBear's Tyce Thompson, Tyler Watherspoon. And yes, Nico Dawes eventually, but still, as of right now, this moment, eight dudes. That's a lot. That Comets team had dynamic offense powered by Chase DeLeo, Fabian Zettel, and A.J. Greer, Alexander Holtz. Up front, this Comets team has Graham Clark, Justin Dowling, and a lot of depth scoring guys. And that was part of the problem last season is that Utica wasn't able to replace the level of offense that left. They tried with Brian Pino and Andreas Johansson and Zach Seneshin and Jack Dugan, but it didn't work out, which happens, but at least they took some shots at it. This season, it's Clark and Dowling and like hope that guys like Tice Thompson or Brian Hallinan or Shane Bowers can become offensive threats. Kyle Chris Quolo can chip in, but he plays more of a sturdy two-way game than a flashy offensive one. Nolan Foote starts the season on IR with an undisclosed injury, as does the aforementioned Hallinan, all while at some point you imagine they get healthy, but is that enough? Like, is, is that enough? Sarah, take me on the defensive side of things here. So defensively, I think that they'll be okay. Uh, they've got Shimon Nemec, uh, Foot, Hataka, Watherspoon, and Vukovic. All of those guys ought to be enough to be steady. They should be able to move some pucks in transition. But overall, there's just a big lack of dynamic, reliable, offense-producing players up and down the roster here that is just kind of like big, flashing concern <laughs> concern sign here as to what they're working with. I will say, once Nolan Foote gets he he uh, healthy and sent to Utica, they also have Cal Foot. Oh. They have a power play unit that has a foot fetish. Oh, my God. <laughs> I'm could definitely not, leaving. <laughs> could not help myself. It's not um, even that late, man. <laughs> uh, all right, let's talk about prospects here. Uh, I will start because Sarah is still laughing. Uh, oh this is a fairly old team, even by AHL standards. Per elite prospects, average age of 24.81, the eighth oldest team. More than half of their players are 23 year olds. So there's not much to look at in terms of like true prospects. Um, the Devils have already taken most of anyone of note, except for Shimon Nemec, who, of course, already established himself as a top defenseman in the league and still doesn't even turn 20 until next year. Like, that poor man can't even buy a drink in a bar in Utica. Um, Nemec is probably not long for the AHL, and fans of this team should enjoy him while they can. Last season showed tangible growth over the course of the year, even as he was already coming in as a very highly touted prospect. But potential doesn't matter when you get on the ice. Uh, you have to put up results. Logistically, there's no room for him on an NHL roster, and the devil's approach seems to be they'd rather take him, uh, give him big minutes in the AHL than find himself kind of meandering around a press box, which I think is a smart approach, one the Rangers have never done. Uh, but in like prospect rookie games, he was by far one of the best players in the ice all throughout last season. He very much was an, one of the few true impact players on the blue line for Utica from start to finish. Like, yeah, Riley Walsh, some uh, cameo appearances by others that went to the Devils, but like it was a lot of Simone Nemec. Um, it's only a matter of time before the New Jersey Devils organization has to start making hard decisions. I like if they found room for Luke Hughes, which I'm sure there was a little bit of uh, familial bias there. <laughs> I, I have to figure at some point, Simone Nemec, uh, Shimon Nemec is going to be, uh, you know, stand up and be counted kind of performance of you're either going to boost me to the NHL so I can collect those dollar bills <laughs> or you're, you know, he's going to be uh, calling up the Devil's Brass, doing his best, you know, uh, trade me right now and slamming the phone down. Like, <laughs> maybe that's being dramatic, but, like, it's crowded, but he's so good. Like, he skates well. He has such good vision. Like, you can't, you can't keep that kind of guy in the AHL forever. So, anyway, uh, another defenseman who's definitely a lot newer to the comments. Tell me about Sateri Hataka. So Hataka is a more defensive-minded defenseman. Um, he is one of the better defenders against the rush. He can cut plays off in the neutral zone before they even develop into serious chances against. Uh, this is really more based on his skating and his agility, but he also has a very active uh, stick, and he's gotten attention to detail of what lane he's even supposed to have his stick in, which, like, 
when you watch as much hockey as I think either of us does, that's not always a given <laughs> from some of these players. Um, you know, highlighting his his rush defense doesn't mean that he slacks off during defending the cycle, uh, though that that is not the case for him. He is a guy he's a guy who closes in on puck carriers. He uses both his stick and his body to strip pucks from opposing players. Offense still a work in progress, but he does have good habits already. Uh, he's a player who activates off the blue line during offensive zone possessions, uh, can cut through defensive structures, but he lacks some more refined playmaking skills and vision that you'd want to see. Uh, he is still a valuable asset in transition. He can help breakouts leave the defensive zone with possession. So like, no, he's not like the sexiest prospect in terms of skill set, but he is still a very valuable member of this blue line. All right, us versus the machine here. Very quickly is wow, we have bloated the runtime of this podcast already. How did we do this last I, year in like I a little know. over 90 minutes? I have no idea. Okay, so uh, the machine says Utica Comets averaged 72 points, a 37% playoff chance, 2% to win the division. I will go first. Goalies cannot get healthy fast enough for the Comets because that's what's dragging this number down um, because Eric Schalgren and Isaac Poulter are not a tandem you want to be running out there in the AHL every night. Maybe in the coast, but not here. Uh, Nico Daw is coming back and that number jumps probably five or six points. I'm taking the over. Uh, I'm going to say 75, but I will be clear here. I don't think this is more than a bubble playoff team. I think maybe they sneak in as the fifth seed but maybe not. I, there's there's so much missing from that team two years ago, or even the team last year that was competitive. And while I have a lot of faith in Kevin Deneen, there's only so much shining up you can do and coaching up you can do. Like a lot of the guys on this roster are who they are. And you can maybe move them at the, the margins, but like you're not going to turn some of these guys who are career middle six AHL players into top six AHL players overnight. As much faith in Kevin Zanin as I have. Sarah? So this is a rough roster. Like, I'm sorry, Utica, but this is rough. Um, I like Lem I like Nemich a lot. Um, I think they've added some interesting depth, but I just don't think there's enough at the top of this roster to really make a difference. And as we've noted, goaltending is just going to be a challenge for this team. So over by a little bit, 74 points, but it's not going to be uh, a fun season. No, no, it's not. All right. <laughs> I will not let us drag anymore because we, we need to keep moving here. We're not even through the North division. <laughs> All right. Let's move on to the Laval rocket. Uh, Sarah in your best French accents. Oh gosh. Here Don't we go. Know. Just, just, just talk. It's fine. I took French uh, so long ago. <laughs> I remember like three French phrases. All right. Tell me about this team from last year. Who is their coaching staff? Uh, Laval was 33 and 39 last season for fifth in the North division. Uh, their head, head coach is Jean-Francois Houle, uh, 72 and 72 as his AHL head coaching record. Two playoff appearances. He is two and two in AHL playoff series. Kelly Buchberger and Martin Lapierre are the assistant coaches. Lots of additions here. Uh, Let's start with Sean, Fer uh, Sean Farrell, Riley Kidney, Joshua Waugh, Philip Maillet, Elias Anderson, Jared Davidson, Alex Olivier Voyer, Nathan Legare, uh, Jakob Novak, Logan Mayu, uh, Miguel Torrey, Brady Keeper, Toby Paquette Bisson, uh, Nolan Lowen, Christopher Meritz Ortiz, Jakob Dobish, Strauss Mann, and Zachary Amond. Sarah, who do they lose? They said goodbye to Alex Belzile, Anthony Richard, Pierre Dubé, uh, Peter Abandonado, Danik Martel, Joel Teasdale, Frederick Allard, uh, Otto Leskinen, Gianni Fairbrother, Corey Schoenerman, Tori Dello, Santino Cent Cento Centorame, uh, Mason Bowie, and Kevin Poulan. All right. We're going to cover some storylines, some vibes. Then we're going to dive into two prospects a little more in depth. And then we're going to play host versus the machine. Let's get it started. Sarah, uh, I will go first, even though I just teed you up. Uh, another <laughs> team full of turnover here. A lot of useful players leaving in Bowie, Martel, Dubé, Tony Rick. A lot of useful players coming in, though. Phil Maillet, Elias Anderson, Nathan Lagare, Joel Armia. Um, this roster is also the seventh youngest in the AHL. 
And they're going to have a lot of growing pains that comes with putting young guys in spots that maybe they're not ready for. Sean Farrell played on the second line the other night. He's a rookie uh, f- this season, fresh out of Harvard. And that's not usually a goal or a role that guys are ready for their first week of pro hockey. Josh Waugh played on the first uh, line the other night. He's a 20 year old straight out of the queue. And like, don't get me wrong. I think playing players in bottom six minutes breeds bottom six players, but you also have to balance earning that ice time and making sure they're ready for that spotlight in some sense. So you don't basically just throw them out there to get murdered and then come back and be like, what do I do? Like, you, you need some base level of competence before you throw those guys in. But I think that ultimately it will be okay. There is a lot of talent on this roster, but I do have some questions. But Sarah, what say you? What is going to be a big thing for this team? The big thing for this team is the PK has got to be better. Like, on the one hand, it can't get much worse <laughs> than it was last year. Um, we broke down last season why Laval's penalty kill was so bad. In part, it was structural. Uh, friends don't let friends play the diamond PK. Like someone needs to very gently sit their Laval coaches down and be like, hi, this is an intervention. Uh, that was episode 127. If you do want to go back and check it out from last season, um, Sean in particular did a great job at breaking down exactly why this is so bad. Um, but it can't continue to stand this season if Laval has dreams of competing in the playoffs. And the other point, we've talked about this with several other teams as well. How long do the Canadians play chicken with Tampa Bay? and the waivers for goaltenders is going to impact Laval's season drastically. We are seeing a ton of goalie shenanigans, and it is almost entirely because of Tampa being without the services of Andre Vasilevsky and, like, literally having to play Matt Tompkins in an NHL game the other day. Like, it's bad. And so teams are doing ridiculous things with their their goalies. If you didn't hear the part where we talked about the the, the baby penguins, they have four (laughs) They have four goalies right now. But, you know, this is obviously impacting Laval as well. Uh, Dobish and Strassman are not going to be a recipe for success as a goalie tandem in the, in the AHL. Now, I don't think that Sam Montembeau is that big of an improvement, but Laval Rocket lifetime goaltender Caden Primo certainly is. So that situation has to get resolved to really have any idea what's going to happen with this team. All right. We have two prospects to talk about here. Uh, Sarah, would you like to go first or second? I can take the first one. Um, We're going to look at Sean Farrell first. Uh, He is a player who has NHL tools at his disposal. Uh, He is an underrated shooter. He's a high-level playmaker. Uh, He is a player who knows how to draw defenders to him to open up shooting lanes, but also can get lost behind them and then be in a position to shoot. Um, While we do say all the time that size isn't a disqualifier to NHL success anymore, you do have to have the tools to work around it if you're undersized. And that is where the questions on Farrell begin. Uh, He is currently listed at 5'9 and 175 pounds. That is undersized at the pro hockey level. Like there is no way around that. Um, He also lacks the skating speed or the build to shield defenders from the puck. Uh, The skills are there to be an NHL player, but his ability to keep possession of the puck and not get eliminated to the perimeter by defensemen is going to be what defines his his future as a pro hockey player. For me, I want to talk about Joshua Waugh. There are times when Waugh, and before I start, I did check, he is not Patrick Waugh's kin at all. (laughs) I was... Like, I'm sure Wa is a common name in French Canada, but I was at least mildly disappointed. Oh. Like, uh, anyway, there are times when Wa looks like the complete package. A dangerous shooter with high-end puck skills that can also be a facilitator on offense and distribute the puck. He's also grown a lot in his defensive game to the point where he played shutdown roles in the World Juniors. However, the piece that's missing, it seems like, every time is skating. His, it's, his skating is not great. And it's the piece that would help complete that picture and make take his profile to the next level. Like s- skating is also one of the hardest things to work on and build because it's something you kind of struggle to find time to do in season. It's an off season kind of thing. Um, and a lot of guys don't like once their skating is bad, they, they kind of can make incremental improvements. Some guys can make massive improvements like Braden Point, but that's not guaranteed. If Joshua walk and make those leaps, uh, we can see a complete package player as a prospect who probably may not, who probably won't stay in uh, Laval too long if he can make those those steps 
forward in the skating with the steps. He made a pun, but uh, like. Uh, I do like him, but uh, I, I'm curious as to whether or not he can he can make those leaps. All right, let's tackle the machine. I don't know what that is in French. I wish I did. I remember like three phrases in French. <laughs> All right, the machine says the machine is really high on the ball. Uh, 88 points, 95 percent playoff chance, 38 to win the division. Sarah, I don't. I don't like. I. I. Je ne sais pas, machine. Like <laughs> <laughs> this feels just really high. Like if we're wrong at the end of the season, we're wrong. Fine, but this feels overly optimistic. Like some of the other teams with a good amount of youth on the roster, I think that Laval is going to be a fun team to watch. I don't know how many games fun is going to win them. Um, I'm going with the under on them. Glad to be wrong if and when the goalie situation actually makes sense. Uh, but for right now, I'm saying 85 points. Yeah. So to give you some behind the scenes here, the model is really high on the rocket. And I think it'll be a playoff team. But I think they're overrating a lot of the Utes. The way that which that I have kind of made it to transfer players who've never played in the AHL and project them to this level, it's not great. But I'm open to other ideas of how to project junior production to the AHL. Um, the way I do it is a, a little bit too in depth for this, you know, conversation right now. But it has Joshua Waugh, Riley Kidney, and Sean Farrell projecting as second line forwards in the AHL, and that feels very aggressive to me. Like they may get there, but saying it right off the bat is like that's asking a lot of their offense from juniors and college and elsewhere to transfer, and that's again aggressive. I also think the Habs eventually stop playing, you know, waivers chicken with Tampa and send a goalie down to help, which will help things because I don't know how long I trust the tandem that they have currently down there. Uh, if they can hold down the forts for that long, if at all, I like this team a lot, um, but 88 is a lot. Like, I think this is a playoff team. There's a lot of NHL talent. There's a lot of good guys in film. My age, uh, those kind of guys that I think, you know, raise the floor here, but like, I'm saying 82 points for the under. Like, that's a big, that's a three win under, but like 88, <laughs> so young. All right. That is enough machine for one. Uh, for, sorry. That is enough machine for one uh, bit of pretend French. Let's move on and talk about the Cleveland Monsters. Sarah, what did they do last year? Who mans the bench? Cleveland was 33 and 39 last season for sixth in the North Division. Head coach is Trent Vogelhuber, who has a 33 39 head record as a head coach in the AHL with no playoff appearances yet. Mike Haviland and Mark Letestu are the assistant coaches. The monsters added to the mash are James Malatesta, Hunter McCown, Dmitry. Vo Jeez, they gave me all the fun names. Dmitry Voron Voronikov? Voronikov. Voronikov, Eric Robinson, Nick Blankenberg, Luca Del, Del Bel Belus, and Stefan Matteau. They have said goodbye to Justin Richards, Cole Fonstad, Alex Whelan, Juna Lu Luoto, Eric Bradford, Brand Brendan Miller, Dylan Simpson, Brett Gallant, and Robbie Payne. All right, so if you're just joining us, we're going to talk about some storylines, questions, vibes from the team, and then we're going to talk about two prospects a little more in depth, and then we're going to play Us versus the Machine. So, Sarah, I will go first. Um, this is the second youngest team in the AHL this season. Yet another year of the youth movement in Cleveland. Only seven players on the roster are over 25. No one is currently over 30. Like, that's wild to me for an AHL roster. That concerns me also a fair bit as who your veteran core of leadership is here is Billy Sweezy, Brennan Gauntz, and Stefan Mateau, Carson Meyer. Even so, this is a team that missed the playoffs by three points last season, and they didn't add much in terms of big impact players you can rely on. We're going to talk about two prospects in a minute here. It can be useful, but counting on rookies to step into the second best league in the world be day one impact players almost always goes poorly. Like Eric Robinson and Nick Blankenberg should help, but they also feel like first call-ups for Columbus and given the pervasive injury history last year and the questionable depth behind them, I am concerned. Sarah, what say you? 
So this is also another team that was powered by the power play last season. Uh, they were 28th last season in five on five goal differential. Uh, I don't care how good your power play is. You are never going to be a competitive team when you're getting caved in five on five. So is this something they can change? Um, great power play. Awesome. Yay. Fun. Cool. Congratulations. But like they have to figure out, you know, whether it was personnel, whether it was coaching systems, whatever it was, they have to figure out why they can't score at, at five on five. And then whatever they did last year, do the opposite of that. I, I will say too, we also have seen teams that were, that struggled five on five last year when they did make the playoffs, like there is a cap on how far you can go because at some point, uh, getting relying on power plays in the playoffs is not going to happen. Sarah and I talked about this and we also predicted Rochester falling to Hershey for this exact reason. And Oh my God, look what happened. Um, so yeah, the Cleveland needed power plays to even draw close to even last year. It, I don't know if that's going to be the same story this year, but like looking at last year's roster versus this one, be like, they're definitely going to be better five on five. It's like, are is is that are we sure that's a thing that's going to happen all right um i'm going to go first on our two prospects to watch here just because i see the names that are on the list and i'm going to take the easy way out i'm going to talk about uh stanislav zvozil i think zvozil is someone who may be an exception to the rookies trans transition to pro hockey will struggle rule because he plays a very projectable and complete game that lacks weaknesses granted i think his skill set tops his skills that tops at it, maybe NHL caliber, but this is an AHL podcast, the AHL level. So I think he's someone who can push for big minutes and produce. He makes smart plays. He's useful in transition, which the monsters desperately need as they want to play more of a North South kind of attacking game in transition. He'll also activate off the blue line, jump in the cycle, which can help break down defenses in the offensive zone. We talk about that a lot. It's an important habit for modern defensemen making offense. He's also solid in his own end and brings a level of dedication and awareness to the entire defensive zone that the Monsters sorely lacked in their decor last year. He may need some time to get up to speed, but I think Zvozo will be someone who can be a guy that by like December, January, you're looking at him in top four minutes, killing penalties, playing big, uh, high-pressure defensive situations, as well as contributing in the offensive zone, helping this team go north-south. And I think that's important. I don't think he gets there right away. I think October, November could be rough. But I think by December, by Christmas time, by New Year's, you should see him start to blossom the player he could be. All right. So we also want to take a look at Luca Del Bel Beluz. Joke's on you. I actually practiced saying his name earlier. Um, the biggest challenge for him is going to be getting to the inside of the offensive zone. Uh, his skating isn't great. He's not undersized, but he does have the tendency to get pushed to the perimeter a lot. Um, if he can work around that, there is a lot to like here in terms of his skill set. I think he has an NHL caliber shot. He's got good puck skills and playmaking vision, and he's not a workhorse, but he does have a compete level that has an amount of, of, of intensity to it. Uh, he also has the surrounding skills to compensate for his lack of foot speed, but it does limit him in offensive production. All right, it is us versus the machine time, Sarah. Are you ready? Let's do it. All right. The average points for the Cleveland Monsters are 78. They make the playoffs 73% of the time. They win the division 7%. A fairly surprising distribution. Uh, I am a little uh, surprised the model is this high on the Monsters. What say you? Do you go over or under? So I was okay with this team until I you know, scrolled down on the roster and then I got to their goaltending. Um, they are running with a Jet Greaves, uh, Pavel K uh, Kajan tandem. Um, in addition to that, that means that they're only one Columbus Blue Jackets injury away from their goaltending situation being even more dire. Um, I don't care what the rest of the roster looks like. That goaltending is enough to make me go very under on this team. 75 points is where I'm going. Yeah. Um, I am in the same boat here. The problem last season was the defense wasn't very good. And to snowball that problem, Jet Greaves and Pavel Cajun were flat out, not good AHL goaltenders. Well, I think the defense should be better this season. Um, that's still a guard starting goalie tandem. That's, 
And as one wise person once said, you can have all the talent in the world skating around out there, but if you don't have a goaltender, it does not matter. Under 72 points. I am significantly under the model here just because, yeah, I think the the defense and offense should be more balanced this year. They should be able to do a little bit better 5-1-5, but that, those goalies aren't going to make saves. We know Ooh. who they are. Yes. It ain't great. No. Yeah. All right. Let us go back across the border to Canada for our last team in the North Division so we can finally move on to the West after two and a half hours. God, there's so many Sarah, of them. tell me about Belleville. So the Belleville Senators were 31 and 41 last season. That made them seventh in the North Division. Coaching staff is led by David Bell, who is 15 and 15 as an AHL head coach uh, with no playoff appearances under his belt. Chris Dennis and Nathan McIver are his assistants. The additions are to this roster, Tyler Boucher, Zach Ostapchuk, Yuri Smechkal, Josh Curry, Matthew Highmore, Boko Amama, Garrett Pilon, Taryn Pfizer, uh, Tyler Cleveland, Nicholas Mantapalo, Ryan McKinnon, and Donovan Sobrango. Sarah, who do they lose? They have said goodbye to Victor Loden, Jake Lucchini, Scott Sabarin, Matthew Boucher, Matthew Wedman, Cole Castles, Jonathan Asperot, Antoine Bibo, Dylan Ferguson, John Quenville, and Dylan Blugis. All right. So we're going to talk storylines, vibes, uh, questions that will haunt the team for the season. And then we will get into two prospects who are maybe a little bit off the beaten path. And then we will play us versus the machine. I'm sorry if you've been listening to this beginning to end for A, this is really long, and B, we've said that like 30 times. Well, sorry, we've said that exactly 16 times. <laughs> uh, so let's start off here. David Get Bell came into an ugly situation last year in Belleville and managed to get a not very good team to play 500 hockey down the stretch while simultaneously not sharing any state secrets with other <laughs> NHL teams. Um, that was enough to get him as the full-time gig as a head coach, but that's a different animal when you get to kind of the new voice in a locker room as the head coach and if nothing else are just something different than the guy who steered them to loss after loss. Now David Bell comes in as someone with rapport with a fair amount of the guys in the group and has taken the reins, not just as the different refreshing voice in charge, but as the established one. And that does change the dynamic. I, I feel like when you get that new coach boost, you get guys to kind of come on board and play with you like, that's a short-term ball of magic that you get. And David Bell has spent that ball of magic now. Um, Belleville did a good job not just replacing the losses in the offseason like Jake Buccini, but adding more scoring punch with Garrett Pilon, Josh Curry, Yuri, Sm Yuri Smelge, uh, Matthew Highmore. Um, this team now looks to have an above-average scoring, uh, scoring team up front, and, and especially up and down the lineup, especially if the Utes like Roby Yarventi uh, sorry, Roby Yarventier, Angus Cruikshank. Those guys can take leaps forward. Or if incoming prospects like Tyler Boucher, Donovan Sobrango, Tyler Cleveland, or Zach, uh, Zach Ostapchuk can make immediate impacts, that all just boosts what Belleville is capable of this year. There seems to be a solid floor in Belleville this season based on the roster and talent level, but there's room to believe and hope that they could be more than just a like qualify for the playoff team. Sarah, what say you? So similar to another team that we've talked about already, uh, the biggest area of need that Bell and the staff are going to need to address here is the penalty kill. This team was abysmal on the penalty kill last season, and with a slew of old faces leaving and new faces coming in, that's going to give me some hope that the badness of the PK was a Jake Lachini and Cole Castles problem and not a systematic one. But that is something that we're going to see very quickly, I think, uh, just what went on with that PK and if they've managed to fix it. Also, um, we have fun shirts in our uh, new and improved uh, merch store that have David Bell's face on it that says, Believe in Belleville. Um, highly recommend you check those out. Uh, <laughs> we'll talk about the links to that in a minute, but just wanted to plug those because they were the first one I designed for uh, our, our new store, and I really like them. <laughs> uh, they come in red, whack, red, red, black, and white, but let's talk about prospects to watch here. I will go first with Zach Ostapchuk. I think he can be maybe a low-key impact player right away. He plays a very translatable, straightforward game. He drives to the net. He looks to make passes to high danger areas. He skates well for his size. He forechecks well, and he's a big physical winger that can battle along the boards. He's also a quality penalty killer, something Belleville needed from last season, and he's a defensive asset. He's not as flashy in his shooting and puck skills check-in around average, 
but he's a solid complementary player that can add a skill set to a line up that to a line that perhaps others can't. Like he has skills that maybe Gary Pilon doesn't have and could be a good uh, you know, sidecar rider on that line. I don't know, I don't think he's gonna be ready to drive his own line this year, or maybe he never gets there, and that's okay. But like I think he's someone who once the speed of the game kind of slows down for him a little bit could be someone in Belleville that we're talking about at the end of the season is like, he's a sneaky, you know, Ottawa call-up candidate. Uh, so we're also going to take a look at Tyler Clevin. Uh, his progress in the NHL last season was interesting. Uh, initially, he looked to be just kind of a stay-at-home defenseman that could lock down his own zone, maybe move some pucks in transition. Uh, but offense was never really a calling card of his play. Uh, last season, though, we saw some more dynamic offense from him. His shot found home more often, thanks to adding some more layers to it, like deception, more passing threats. His skating also took a step forward, and with it, the ability to jump into the rush improved for him. Now, is all of that going to transfer to the AHL? Well, that's going to be the big question that determines the level of his impact for the Senators this season. But his ability as a shutdown defender gives him a pretty solid floor in terms of his impact on this team. All right, Sarah, it is time to do battle once again, one last time in the North Division against the machine. Are you ready? Ready. All right. So the machine says for Belleville, 79 points on average. They make the playoffs three quarters of the time. They have a 10% chance to win the division. I feel like a lot of the teams in the North kind of profile in this ballpark. Uh, a lot of very good but not great flawed kind of teams in the middle of this division. So it's going to be a battle for which one of them kind of stands uh, stands tall here. What do you think, Sarah? Over under 79 points. So the entire Ottawa organization is actually really interesting to me, and Belleville's no exception. Like, the Senators, the NHL Senators are actually bringing in, like, NHL guys in free agency and in trades. Like, they have a team that can do things. Um, that lets some of these youths marinate a little bit longer in the AHL, which is going to be better for them. It's better for Belleville and better for Ottawa in the long run. Uh, there are some interesting pieces here. I like the offseason moves that they made. Um, we're going to go with a slight over at 80 points and just like sneaking on into the playoffs. I'm going to agree with you, actually, and take the over. I think the roster here is in a better place than it was last season in terms of talent level. The guys seem to like David Belleville, which is how I'm going to address him. Uh, and they play hard for him. I think those things, plus like a couple of steps forward for some guys in the right spots, plus the kind of like wishy-washy nature. Like I think a, a team that has some sandpaper and a coach that they play hard for is going to be a little bit of an edge for Belleville here. And I think that that's why they maybe sneak up on some teams. I'm going to say 80 points in the over as well. All right. We're going to take a break here. And after the break, we will get to the central division. We have an entire conference left to go, Sarah. Jesus Christ. If you're just here for the North Division, this is your jumping off point. Thank you for stopping by. Don't forget to subscribe wherever you're listening to us from so you get episodes in a timely fashion. Also, check us out on social media. Links to our social media and more can be found at our Linktree page at L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash The Calder Farmstead. We're going to run some ads, pace and bills. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. And we are back. We have an entire Western Conference to go. We are going to power through it. Sarah, let's start in the Central. We are going to go in the order of teams that they finished in the regular season last year. So let us start with the Texas Stars. Tell me what they did last season and who mans the bench. So last season, the Texas Stars were 40 and 32, all the way up to first in the Central Division. Their head coach is Neil Graham, who has an 89 and 93 record as an AHL head coach. He's got two playoff appearances under his belt, and he is one and two in AHL playoff series wins. Assistant coaches are Travis Morin and Max Fortunis. Additions this season include, well, did include Gavin Bayreuther, uh, just injured, probably out for a very long time. Hopefully he gets back to them, though. Christian Cairo, Liam Bichel, uh, Gavin White, Francesco R. Curry, Kyle McDonald, Derek Pouliot, Logan Stankoven, Matthew Seminoff, Chase Wheatcroft, Ben Zlotti, and Brian Thompson. A lot of guys left, Sarah. Tell me who they were. 
Uh, so they have lost Frederick Olofsson, Rhett Gardner, Marion Studenich, Riley Tufty, Tanner Caro, Ryler, Riley Barber, Oscari Lass, Laxanen, Ryan Shee, Ben Gleason, Will Butcher, Dawson Barto, Adam Scheel, and Dylan Wells. So we're going to start talking about some storylines, some news, some questions we have about this team going into the season. We're going to dive deep on two prospects who are maybe a little newer to the team, and then we're going to play host versus the machine. Buckle up, let's go. We said at the last, the end of last season when we wrapped up the Stars uh, that the 23-24 Texas Stars were very likely to look very different compared to the 22-23 version of the team. And I think that came true. Those subtractions we just listed were a lot of impact players that sent Texas to a division title uh, in the regular season and, you know, uh, to the division finals in the playoffs. Um, And yet Dallas has managed to stock the pipeline with an impressive number of players that look and feel NHL ready. Some of who we'll talk about here in a minute, but this roster feel features a lot of new faces. And typically when that's a team that was a contender last season and make no mistake, Texas was a Calder Cup contender last year. That's usually a sign the team is going to regress, but I don't think that's true this year. I think this roster may be better. Sarah, what are you thinking about? So I'm thinking about what is happening to Riley Damiani. Uh, This is a guy who went from being a point-per-game player in the COVID bubble to still a useful player in 21-22 to getting healthy scratched last season. Uh, He is a player whose game is driven more by his hockey IQ and awareness than it is raw tools like shooting or puck skills. He's a great skater, but the lack of finishing tools has really kept him from being on the score sheet more often. And when Texas's roster is loaded with talent and the guys around him are finishing and they are getting on the score sheet, it really becomes hard to justify his place in the lineup. Um, I like him a lot. I always root for like the smaller guys that use their brains instead of just sort of resting on the laurels of physical tools. Like, sure, you're six five, great, cool, um, whatever. Um, but if he wants to get back on track as a, a top player in the AHL, let alone become an NHL guy, uh, he is going to need to work on finishing his chances, forcing the coaching staff to keep him in the lineup that way. Um, work ethic, two-way proficiency just doesn't seem to be enough. And maybe this is a player who it's time for a change of scenery for him. Uh, he's an RFA next season, but if he doesn't get qualified and he might not, uh, I could absolutely see him checking out the grass on the other side and seeing uh, what he can do elsewhere. I really am excited to talk about these prospects. I'm going to go first because I want to talk about the stanky leg, Logan Stankoven. <laughs> Texas fans, you need to enjoy Stan Coven while he's here because I'm telling you, he is not here for a long time, but it's going to be a good time while he is. Stan Coven's skill set is one that just bursts off the page. He's someone where if you took all the numbers off the jerseys and sat high up, you would still know which one was him. Uh, his He's probably the best sniper in the AHL with his shot mechanics. He's also a high-end playmaker. Oh, and he has wheels that are NHL caliber. Now, normally this is the place where I'd say, yeah, he's all tools and no toolbox, but nope, that ain't true. On offense, Logan Stankoven is as complete a player as you will find under the age of 23 in the AHL. He is the exception to the rule about rookies being impact players in the AHL right away. I don't understand why Dallas kept him off the roster, but it doesn't matter. When it comes to offense in the AHL, the answer with Logan Stankoven is (laughs) yes. Yes, he can. On defense... He's not a Patrick Kane style liability in his own zone. And that's more than enough. If you can score like he can, and he will, it is not going to matter if he basically coasts through the neutral zone, you know, controller unplugged, the man can put the puck in the net. End of story. So we're also going to take a look at Liam Bissell. Uh, When he steps on the ice, people know, uh, and it's not just because he's gigantic. He is six, six, two twenty five. Uh, but also because he throws that big body around a lot. But it's not just throwing hits to throw the hit or chasing hits or getting penalties. He is smart with the violence he inflicts, which is great. Uh, Separating the man from the puck and occasionally his opponent skates from the ice. Like, all right, good job. That level of physical defense is a huge part of his game, but so is the intelligence behind it. He has a craftiness uh, behind what he does, like a killer that brings his own cleanup kit. So basically what we're saying is, he's Dexter on skates. So like, 
<laughs> keep that in mind. Um, he forces plays to the boards with good stick work, skating, uh, and then closes out just like all hope with his body. There are offensive tools here too. He's not just a big guy who hits stuff. Um, he is crafty in transition. He can beat four checking pressure pretty impressively. Um, he activates on off the blue line, jumps up into play. Not a bad shooter. And he has NHL playmaking vision. So he's kind of like a unicorn, I think. Um, maybe he's not as high profile as a guy like Stankoven, uh, but he's yet another player who somehow didn't make Dallas, but also has NHL written all over him. So enjoy him while you can. All right. It is time for chapter 17 in Us Versus the Machine. Yeah, that's right. Wow. I can keep count after all this. Here we go. <laughs> Machine says, Texas. 83 points, 85% playoffs, 14% to win the division. Sarah, what say you? So last season, the Texas Stars were the highest scoring team in the league. They had 265 goals. Uh, two of their top five scorers, Riley Barber, Marion Studenich, are gone. Two more are most likely going to be spending some time in the NHL um, with Bork and Blumel. Um, I worry about Texas's offense, given all of the goals that they are losing or potentially will lose a chunk of service uh, during the year. But I do think ultimately they're going to be okay. The additions they've made, um, I, I think, are very promising. But that's a lot of goals that are missing from some of those guys. So I'm going slightly over at 84 points. A lot of turnover here, and this team is a lot younger. They're tied for the youngest team in the AHL, in fact. And usually those are bad signs, but man, you can't watch Logan Stankoven or Liam Bischel play and think, ah, he's just a rookie. He'll take a season in the A before he makes an impact. Yeah, that's that's a no for me. Uh, add that to steps forward that I think are likely from Maverick Bork, Matt Murray, Matei Blumel. I, I think there's another solid, solid team here. I mean, the book is titled We Win Here for a Reason. Uh, I'm going to take the over and say 86. I want to say they win this division again. But man, do other teams in this division have something to say about that, and we will get to them. But like last year, I did call it at this point. I said, Texas is going to win this division. I am at least optimistic that Texas is very likely going to be in the fight for this division at the end. But I think we're back to where the Central is the death division again. All right, let's move on. Let us talk about the Milwaukee Admirals. Sarah, what did they do last year? Who mans the bench? Milwaukee was 41 and 31 last year, second in the Central Division. Their head coach is Carl Taylor. He has a 157 and 130 record as an AHL head coach. He's made three playoff appearances and he is three and three in AHL playoff series. Joining him on the bench are Scott Ford and Greg Rollo. All right. The additions here are Nolan Burke, Zachary Lowe. Fedor Svechkov, uh, brother of Ryan O'Reilly, Cal O'Reilly, Jasper Weatherby, Callan Lind, Kevin Wall, Reed Schaefer, Jake Livingstone, Griffin Luce, and Troy Grosnick coming back. Sarah, who is gone? They have said goodbye to John Leonard, Cole Schneider, Austin Ruschoff, Zach Sanford, Jimmy Huntington, Isaac Radcliffe, Tommy Apap, Marcus Nurmi, Devin Cooley, Tim Schaller, and Xavier Bouchard. All right, uh, so we are going to talk storylines, news items, questions we have for this team, vibes, if you will. Uh, then we're going to talk about two prospects, a little bit off the beaten path, perhaps, a little more in depth. And then we're going to play us versus the machine. So for me, the storyline here for this team is what do the old guys have left? Specific, Specifically, we're talking about Cal O'Reilly, brother of Ryan O'Reilly, who you may not have known. That is, in fact, his brother. Uh, and Troy Grosnick. Both of them uh, are coming off seasons in Lehigh Valley that I think can be categorized as disappointing. Troy Grosnick barely played and was injured most of the season, but the body of work at the AHL level, I think, speaks for itself. However, he's 34, coming off an injury-plagued season. I think it's clear he's expected to split starts with Iskarov here. And this team should be good in front of him, but Father Time is always undefeated. Is this the season that Father Time starts snipping at his heels in the race against time? Cal O'Reilly is now 37 years old. He is one of the only AHL players that is older than I am. Uh, he put up his lowest points per game mark in the AHL of his career last season and looked, time, looked at times like he was ready for retirement. He's also one season removed from a 20-goal, 50-point campaign in 21-22 and is back in the organization that drafted him, an organization that also employs his brother, Ryan O'Reilly. Is that enough to open the fountain of youth and find another 50-point campaign? 
I don't know. Age is a tricky thing to project. I think no on O'Reilly. I think yes on Grossnick. But those are thoughts. They're vibes. Sarah, what say you? Uh, so my vibes are all about Yaroslav Askarov and how do you manage a problem like Yaroslav, Yaroslav Askarov and his mustache. Um, he is a challenging prospect to evaluate, and it's not, not just because of his bad facial hair choices. Um, on the one hand, he is incredibly talented and athletic. Uh, his explosiveness is just insane. He can recover, get post to post like few other goaltenders in the world can. He has the athleticism of a 5'10 goalie, but he's 6'4". Um, because of that, he is incredibly aggressive, and that allows him to make saves that other goalies just can't. But aggressiveness and attacking shooters is a mindset, and because of it, he gives up goals that other goalies just don't, unless your name is Pyotr Kochekov, and then you do the exact same crazy stuff. Um, like It makes him hard to trust as a goaltender, and at times, that's a delicate balance to strike. You want him to be aggressive. It allows him to maximize that athletic advantage that he has, but you also need him to just dial it way back in moments so that he doesn't make blunders that are completely avoidable for other goalies. Um, he also has some technical issues, again, not related to the mustache, um, and has some tracking issues that I think do resolve themselves over time. But the biggest question is, how do you keep him from dialing it all the way up to 11 while still maintaining the edge that his athleticism gives him? So crazy Tell times. Me. Delicate balance, uh, yeah. especially too, because like I agree with you. It, it, it's he what he can do athletically is very impressive, and he makes incredible saves. But then I also think to like that that's a mindset of I'm going to go out and attack, 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 and then like I just think of that goal in game. I think it was game two or game no game two in the uh, Western Conference Finals against Coachella, and like the opening minute where it's just like yeah. <sighs> how do you get him to not do that, but continue right. to do the rest of those things? Like that's a very, very narrow thing in yeah. my mind, but like that is what's going to define, I think him as a prospect, but that's not the prospect that we're going to talk about. Uh, let's go a little more off the beaten path. I will go first here and talk about Joachim Kemmel. I think the best, biggest question for me is what he does five on five. The staple in the AHL looks so different than what I saw overseas in Liga. And that's not just because it's in high def, but like in Liga, he would look lost away from the puck a lot. He comes to Milwaukee and is making plays. He's looking dynamic. He's looking like uh, someone who is connecting the dots from play to play. And while I give Carl Taylor a ton of cre credit for being able to develop guys, even I find that level of change unbelievable for that short period of time. Like I genuinely don't believe that that is the real Joachim Kemmel that we saw that is going to be the one we see over the entire stretch of the season. On the power play, different story. Kemmel's going to do what he does, which is rip pucks with the 50 cal of a shot that he has. But he also knows how to add layers to that, to set up teammates when a shooting lane isn't open. That's a lot easier on the power play where he can operate under less defensive pressure and transition isn't as well forechecked. As I said, five on five where open space is limited and a neutral zone isn't just kind of a gimme like it is on the power play. That's where I have questions about his ability away from the puck to solve defenses. The rest of his game is just stupid with talent. And I want to believe he comes up with solutions, but that's never guaranteed in pro hockey. We've seen, you know, a lot of guys get stuck in the AHL because they have one or two really great weapons, but they can't find a way to be to put it together, to have a good off-puck game, to play sensibly, as it were. And I don't think he could be there, but I'm not saying that's not in the realm of possibility. Sarah, who do you want to talk about? So I'm looking at Fedor Svechkov. Uh, he's a bit of a jack-of-all-trades, master of none. Uh, he's a player who has a high motor, but everything else just checks in as average. His shot, puck skills, playmaking vision, they're all good for the AHL, but nothing really stands out and commands attention. Uh, his high motor should endear him as a four checker and a penalty killer. He's also solid in the defensive zone where he back checks ferociously. He's got an active stick, but my concern for him is that he's not going to get the minutes necessary to develop any of the offensive parts of his game. And instead he's just going to get pigeonholed as that bottom six player penalty killer. And he has value there. Sure. But looking at this Admiral's roster, it's hard to see how he takes a job from someone higher up in the depth chart without first really earning that role. And while he can make offense, I don't really think he's going to produce enough to force Carl Taylor and company to move him up in minutes. All right. It is machine fight time. It's like the Matrix, except much more cold. Uh, <laughs> all right. So the machine says for the Milwaukee Admirals, 
82 points, 83% playoff percentage. They win the division 14% of the time. A surprisingly widespread here. Sarah, what say you? So the Admirals have consistently evolved over the years. And the past few seasons have been great steps forward for this team in terms of not just being based around physical play, but also being about skill and being better than the sum of their parts. Um, I like the offseason moves that they made. I don't know that Nashville is going to interfere too much with them without reason. Uh, and I think they're going to be another fun team to watch. Uh, so I'm going to take the over with 85 points. So many questions here. What does Dennis Garyanov want to do? Does he want to play his way back to the NHL or be grumpy and go through the motions? What does Cal O'Reilly, brother of Ryan O'Reilly, have in the tank still? Same question, Troy Grosnick. I want to believe in our reigning best coaching staff here and say Carl Taylor and company is going to figure this out, right or wrong, good or bad. He's one of the few coaches I believe in the AHL can drag a mid-roster to a better-than-mid-result. I think this roster is better than that. I'm taking the over by a good margin, too. I'm going to say 86 points. This is a team that, once again, I think nips at Texas's heels all year. I do have some concerns about Nashville just because I don't think I know what Nashville is. <laughs> like, are they definitely rebuilding? I don't think so. Like, I think they're kind of in the, like, maybe we find out what happens. Like, they're not sending UC Saros off unless it's a literal, I can't say no to, you know, five first-round draft picks, uh, two boxes of pizza, and Connor McDavid's autographed rookie. But, like, could Nashville be, like, a bubble playoff team that leaves Milwaukee mostly alone? I think so. Could they be, you know, in February and half of Milwaukee is there? Also, yes. That's why I think this spread is so wide. But I, I think Milwaukee gets it done. Let's move on. Enough of me pontificating. We have to talk about the Manitoba Moose. Sarah, tell me about me tonight. <laughs> the Moose were 37 and 35 last season, third in the Central Division. Their head coach is Mark Morrison. He's got a 78 and 66 record as an AHL head coach, two playoff appearances, and he is 0 and 2 in AHL playoff series. Um, Eric Dubois and Nolan Baumgartner are his assistants. The additions the Moose made are Daniil Zhukin, Nikita Shabrikov, Fabian Wagner, Jeffrey Veal, CJ Cease, Mark Lewiski, Dmitry Kuzmin. Artem Nyazhev, Dawson Barteau, Colin Delia, Dominic Devincitis, and Thomas Millick. Sarah, who did they lose? Uh, they lost Tyler Boland, Cole Mayer, Alex Limoges, goodbye to his hair, uh, Greg Morellis, Evan Pole, uh, Jansen Harkins, Leon Givanke, Arvid Holm, and Evan Cormier. I will say I'm really happy that we have a good relationship with some people because I did not want to mail Alex Limoges uh, award to Canada strictly <laughs> because it costs so much more. So thankfully we didn't have to do that. Um, anyway, storylines here. Uh, so the way we're going to do this is uh, we're going to talk about some overarching stories uh, on the team, ask some questions that are going to define their season. We're going to break down two prospects a little more in depth who are maybe a little off the beaten path. And then we're going to play us versus the machine. I want to know what the identity of this team is. In the past, the Moose have been powered by kind of an offense by committee approach backed by a high-end blue line of Chisholm, Kovacevic, Kovanka, and Hanola. Kovacevic got claimed off waivers by Montreal last season. Chisholm has made the Jets out of camp the last I saw. Kovanka was traded to the Sharks organization. And God, can Vili Hanola never catch a break? Broke his ankle out two to three months. Poor kid. Like, <laughs> so bad. <laughs> The Moose's two leading scorers from last season, Jansen Harkins and Alex Limoges, are gone to other organizations in Pittsburgh and Washington, respectively. Of the top six scorers for the Moose last season, only one, walk-off Jeff Malott, is on the current roster. I think it's clear this team is still going to play offense by committee as they lack the veterans who are clear kind of point-per-game guys at the AHL level. I mean, Axel, Axel Janssen Fialbi is probably the closest they have. I think after his time in the NHL, he's probably going to pan out to be that guy at the AHL level. Um, but this blue line is thin significantly as Kyle Kapia, Capo Bianco comes in, but behind him is Artemi Nazhev. And while Nazhev is fast and aggressive at times, he lacks the puck skills and vision to be a difference maker at the AHL level and can be a liability in his own end because of how aggressively he likes to jump into the play. If you've seen any of his tape from the Barracuda, Yep, that's what he did. Um, I think they're going to be a competitive team this season, but I think that's going to depend. Sarah, what do you think that depends on? 
You know, I think that's really going to depend on a lot of development from the youth. Um, what kind of progress are guys like Chaz Lucius, Dimitri Kuzman, Daniel Torgerson, Danny Shilklin, uh, all those guys, like what progress are they going to make on this team? Maybe they can impress Defy Logic by being impact players as rookies. And if so, then the Moose do have a shot to be somebody this year. And if not, well, it's going to be a long season. Yeah. Uh, especially because like the Jets don't also seem to know what they want to be. Mm -hmm. Kind of like what we just talked about with Nashville. Like, are the Jets definitely competing? Are they trying to win cups right now? Are they kind of rebuilding? Are they trying to see if maybe that's what they're going to, they're, they're mm -hmm. going to figure it out based on what happens this season? None of those really spell definitive answers for the Moose and what trickles down to mm -hmm. them or how that affects them. But like, man, Throster, <laughs> I'm not jumping up and down. No. But they have fun prospects. Yeah. Sarah, uh, I will go first. I will talk about Brad Lambert because I don't want to say that name. <laughs> uh, last season, Brad Lambert uh, did what most teenagers do in the AHL. He struggled. Uh, we say that all the time about how hard the hardest transition players make isn't going to the NHL from the AHL, but it's juniors or college to the AHL, and Lambert was an exception. But I think the time in the AHL did him good. Uh, uh, as he comes back this time around with a skill set that's more well-rounded, does he make that progress without those AHL games? Maybe. But that struggle can be a wake-up call that you still have work to do and where that work is, especially transitioning to a, a faster, harder game in the AHL. Lambert comes back with his high-end skating intact, but adds more diverse offensive skill set that has more playmaking vision, does a better job finding teammates in space instead of trying to basically view the ice as a series of objects to deke through. He showed that he can be an asset in transition as well. He still has exceptional puck handling. He has an NHL caliber shot. Now, all of that development is great, but skills are only as useful as what they allow you to do to produce results. 19 years old is still crazy young for an AHL impact player, but perhaps Lambert can be that player and give the Moose's offense a shot in the arm this year. Sarah? We've got uh, Nikita Shibrikov as well, uh, and his game is one that is full, filled with raw tools. Uh, he has excellent puck skills. He's got playmaking vision. He's an NHL caliber, caliber skater. He's a decent shooter, but Shibrikov is undersized, and while he possesses an enviable skill set, he doesn't always wield it the best, and he's been prone to try and just deke through players, turns the puck over rather than utilizing his teammates, as well as just sort of drifting while off puck. That has limited how well his game projects to the AHL and makes it seem likely that he's going to struggle at this level. The tools are all there, but adapting them to wield them a little bit better is what separates him from really making his mark this season. All right. All right. It is us versus the machine time. Let's go. The machine says for the moose, an average of 74 points. They make the playoffs uh, a little under a coin flip 47% of the time. They win the division just 3% of the time. I will go first. Uh, right now, Axel Janssen Fallaby is the front runner for best hockey flow award in 23-24. Otherwise, this team looks rough, both in terms of our award show and uh, quality hair. Gone is that dependable blue line. And while I like Capo Bianco, the rest are a bunch of guys I'm not that high on. Colin Delia may be the best goalie here, and that's not great. Uh, while Manitoba has a history of grinding out wins without top talent, they had a much deeper roster in the past. I'm taking the over here and saying 75 by a hair, but I don't think the Moose are very competitive overall in the landscape of this division. Sarah? So I'm not saying this just as a person who has to watch the, mo the Moose like 17 times a year, but like I'm not excited about this roster. Um, I'm excited about individual pieces. Um, Brad Lambert's a prospect who I've kind of had an eye on for a while. I've been interested in seeing how he develops, and this year should be a big challenge for him to step up, but there is just not enough here. I am going with the under at 72 points. I think that seems fair. Let us move on to the Iowa Wild. Sarah, tell me what happened last year. They have a new bench boss. Tell me about him. They do. Iowa went 34 and 38 in the regular season. They were fourth in the Central Division. Uh, they did relieve uh, longtime coach Tim Army of the burden of employment uh, and have replaced him with Brett McLean, who is brand new to this level of coaching. He's got a clean slate as a record. Patrick Dwyer and Ben Simon are his assistants. 
They added some big pieces too in Vinny Letary, Jake Lucchini, Greg Morales, Yujar Kahara, Kale Kessie, Joel Teasdale, Carson Lambos, David Spachek, and Kyle Masters. But they lost some guys too along the way. Sarah, who left the wild? They have said goodbye to Mitchell Chafee, Joe Cramarosa, Ty Ronning, Damian Giroux, Brandon Baddock, Tanner Kaspik, Mitchell Balmas, Joe Hicketts, Turner Ottenbright, and Andre Suster. So what we're going to do here is a little bit of story time. We're going to talk about some big questions that ha uh, we have about this team, talk about a couple of big picture things. Then we're going to dive deep into two prospects uh, that are maybe newer to the team and a little off the beaten path. And then we are going to play us versus the machine. All right, I will start. The big story for me here is this incredibly young blue line. Only Brennan Miller is over 25, and he's not really someone you're counting on for big minutes or in pressure situations. To me, that says they're going to be given a lot of leash when they make mistakes. And if there's one thing you can bank on, it's a player under 22 years of age in the AHL making some screw-ups, doing the oopsie. But that's part of the development process. Professional hockey is ruthless and cutthroat. You're going to make mistakes because everyone is out there paying for their play playing for their paychecks. But learning from those mistakes is the name of the game. And while I think the defense will take some time to get into shape because of the those Utes, they have a deep offensive pool to draw from. Fogarty and Letary reunite from their days in the Hartford Wolfpack. Jake Lucchini comes over as a do-it-all man from Belleville. Mason Shaw and Nick Patan are familiar faces that can score. Yujar Kahar, I'm assuming I am saying that wrong. I should have looked that up before we started, but I didn't. Yujar Kahar is an everyday NHLer for the past six seasons who comes to Iowa. Adam Beckman scored 24 in Iowa last season. Nick Sweeney and Sammy Walker are still in town. Caden Bank here has a prospect uh, at, with middle six upside. Greg Morales uh, was a nice depth playmaker for the Moose in the last two seasons. That's nine guys before I even mentioned a depth scoring role. That is a deep, dangerous pool of offense. And you, like that's the best you can have. And they're going to run wild on the Central Division this year. Sarah, what say you? So the other big story out of Iowa is their new head coach, Brett McLean. Uh, he has been behind the Iowa bench before. He was an assistant in Minnesota the past few years, and now he is back as the bench boss. Um, as a side note, uh, and we're going to talk about this later with another team as well, uh, we're really starting to see that NHL assistant to AHL head coach path find some more travelers, uh, which I think is an interesting approach. Uh, McLean is also fairly young. He's 45 with Ben Simon and Patrick Dwyer, who are also 45 and 40, respectively. This is a young coaching staff, but one that I think has a lot of pedigree to it. Um, they're not going to get stars in their eyes or anything stupid like that about the guys that they're working with, the jobs that they have. Um, I think that this has a chance to be a very good team this season, as I'm more inclined to trust younger coaches like this to connect with players and to have innovative ideas that their more eh, white-haired counterparts uh, just don't have. Don't tell anyone at work that I said that. I'm going to be a terrible example for like my entire real job. Um, <laughs> maybe that is projecting some values onto McLean and his staff. Um, but I think that there is a lot of reason to be excited as an Iowa Wild fan. This team has talent and they can score. So if you're an Iowa sports fan, I have seen the Hawkeyes play this season. You want to be watching the Wild on Saturdays. Trust me, just the, the, the hand egg sport, it's dead. You're watching knife shoes now. <laughs> Oh, I want to talk about Iowa Haw the Iowa Hawkeyes for a second, but we're not going to. Uh, let's dive into prospects to watch here. I will start us off with Carson Lambos. Lambos projects as a lockdown defenseman with snarl to him. He's capable of shutting down plays early with good defensive skating and a physical edge. In the offensive end, he has an impressive shot, but his playmaking vision and puck skills, they lag behind a little bit. Those are still a work in progress, and we'll start to see that blossom a little bit for him. Uh, as we did last season in the CHL, but I don't know how well that's going to translate to pro hockey. Regardless, he's shown an, uh, he's shown to emphasize the defensive part of being a defenseman, and while the offense may be a work in progress, he'll keep putting opposing forwards on their ass in the meantime, and that has value. Sarah, you have another blue liner you'd like to talk about. I do. We're going to look at Damon Hunt, who was one of the few impact rookie players that you saw last season in the AHL. Uh, it is not often you see a 20-year-old step in and become a top pair defenseman, but he earned that role. Uh, he can do a little bit of everything, and he can do it all well, which is actually 
pretty rare. Um, he is active in transition. He can beat four checking pressure with his feet and with his playmaking vision. He has an absolute missile for a shot that he likes to let fly as much as he can. He is physical in his own end. He defends his blue line with intensity. Like that's a whole package. Um, I would like to see him add a little bit more layer to his offensive side though, mixing in the threat of his shot to open passing lanes, attacking from better real estate in the offensive zone. But still, uh, particularly at his young age, he is a defenseman that should lead the way for the Iowa Wild this season. All right. It is us versus the machine time. Let's do it. The machine says for Iowa, hello, 89 points average, 96% playoff. They win the division 42% of the time, according to the machine. That isn't even the highest win division percentage that we have, which is even more crazy. Um, it is for this division, I believe, but not total. Um, we'll get there. <laughs> Sarah, uh, dive in. What do you say? So I'm really curious to see what this team is, what their identity is. Um like having to watch the Moose 800 times a year, I also have to watch the Iowa Wild 800 times a year. I know what the Tim Army Iowa Wild were, and they were basically the same team every year. It didn't matter the skill or the lack thereof on the roster. Physical, gritty, we're just going to hit things and see what happens. I don't know what their new philosophy is going to be, but I'm really excited to see this team evolve, um, particularly with the talent that they have on their roster. There are enough holes here that do have me a little bit concerned, um, particularly given what the Minnesota Wild are going to have to yank from them. They've already taken Sammy Walker. Uh, and so, you know, there could be some holes on this roster given some of the players they could lose. So I'm taking the under at 86, but I am excited to see the new evolution of the Iowa Wild. It's hard to have this much enthusiasm for a team like this early in the season. Like 89 is a lot of points. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to take a, a slight under here. The youth movement on the blue line, I think eventually figures it out, but I'd be lying if it said it didn't make me nervous that Iowa didn't manage to land any of the veteran talent for their defensive core. Mm -hmm. Like you give me one Brogan Rafferty or Trevor Carrick or Connor Carrick mm -hmm. on the roster. I smash this over. The lack of that makes me nervous. Like, if you gave me one veteran blue liner that could move the puck, I'd be like, okay, I'm on board. We're doing this. We are we are an Iowa Wild podcast now. <laughs> uh, but th that isn't there, and I think they get there, but I can't call it out of the gate. I just – I do not have the gumption for that. I'm going to say under an 87. <laughs> like, I know. I'm such a huge downer. They're only 87. Yeah, I know. But, like, <laughs> this team, I think, could be one of those where it's like, they're in the running at the end for the Mia Culpa mm -hmm. because they hit 107 points. Mm -hmm. And I was 20 points off from that projection. Yeah. And it's like, Fine. we said you were like, <laughs> what do you want from me? <laughs> I said you're going to be good. <laughs> yeah. So let's move on here. Let's go to Illinois and talk about the Rockford Ice Hogs. Sarah, tell me about last year. Who's on the bench? Rockford, Rockford was 35 and 37 last year. They were fifth in the Central Division. Uh, Anders Sorensen is the head coach. He is a, has a 70 and 68 record, two playoff appearances. He is two and two in AHL playoff series uh, wins and losses. Jared Nightingale and Rob Klinkhammer are the assistants. Rob Klinkhammer, I just learned that literally right now. Amazing. <laughs> All right. For additions, they uh, took Brandon Baddock right from Iowa, Anders Bjork, Zach Jordan, Logan Nyoff, uh, Jalen Lupin, Bryce Kindop, Ryder Ralston, Drew Camiso, Nolan Allen, Ethan Del Mastro, Josh Healy, and Marcel Marcel. Real person. Yes. Not a mime. No. All right. Sarah, who did they lose? Uh, they have said goodbye to Rocco Grimaldi, Dylan Sakura, Cole Gutman, uh, Jacob Galvis, Alec Regula, Buddy Robinson, who I don't think is a real person, Andy Walensky, Hunter Drew, DJ Buzdecker, Ian Mitchell, Nicholas Bodan, uh, Bobby Lynch, Garrett Mitchell, and Ryan Gagne. I feel like they've lost. Like I remember a couple years ago, we said that Rockford had the most made up name, most made up player, <laughs> uh, names of players on the roster. Like guys where it's like, DJ Buzdecker, uh, Andre <laughs> Alta Barmakian. Those are not real people. Uh, but, like, it just seems like it keeps yeah. going. Yes. Um, Marcel, like, 
I really want them to play. Oh my god, I can't think of the team. But there's it's a prospect. With, here. Ivan, Ivan. Yes, Colorado, yes. right? Yes. I very much want Marcel Marcel to check Ivan Ivan. <laughs> like, anyway. <sighs> On to seriousness here. So we're going to cover some big, like some big headlines kind of pieces, what questions we have for this team for the season, kind of a general overview. We're going to dive into two prospects, maybe one's a little more off the beaten path that are newer to fans. And then we're going to play us versus the machine. Sarah, this is a youth movement in a rebuild here for the Blackhawks organization. For Rockford, a lot of familiar faces are gone. And while impact ice hogs like Arvid Soderblom and Lucas Reichel have graduated and are very unlikely to return in my mind, there's a lot of prospects on this roster. They have the third youngest roster in the AHL. The good news is this is going to help accelerate the Blackhawks rebuild with youths getting quality AHL minutes and veterans like Joey Anderson, David Gust, and Brent Senior are still in town to keep things somewhat on the rails. But the bad news is kids make mistakes and this ice hogs team is loaded with kids. Not mistakes, hopefully, just loaded with kids. And they're going to be, you know, making mistakes as when half your roster is playing pro hockey for the first time. Those kind of things tend to happen. So we're going to see how that tests the coaching staff, the fan base, uh, scouts and evaluators above them. Like, screw-ups are going to happen, and there are going to be a lot of oopsies with a team this young. But are they able to weather that and turn that into development, or is it just going to be a comedy of errors here for Rockford this season? Sarah, what say you? So another big issue that Rockford's going to face is the Blackhawks. Uh, their roster is going to be a huge problem for Rockford because Chicago is loaded with players who are almost certainly going to be traded at the deadline for draft picks. Corey Perry, Tyler Johnson, Jason Dickinson, Nikita Zaitsev, Peter Mrazek, they are all on expiring deals. And sure, maybe all of them aren't going to get dealt at the deadline, but a good number of them will. Uh, and that means roster spots are going to need to be filled in the NHL. And those players are probably going to have to be coming from the Ice Hogs, and they're probably going to kneecap any playoff push that the Ice Hogs had in mind. Um, I do think that Sorensen has done a good job as the head coach, but he flat out just doesn't have the dependable depth this season that a more veteran team is going to have. And also, the Central Division has just loaded up around the Ice Hogs, which is going to make it rougher for them. If they were in the Pacific Division, uh, they could probably sneak into the playoffs. But here, though, it is going to be a tougher road, and they're just going to get absolutely decimated uh, at the trade deadline. Let's dive into two prospects in particular. I chose one that is newer to Ice Hogs fans. I believe Sarah did as well. I will go first with Ethan Del Mastro. With a group full of so many Utes, uh, one of them by pure chance, like has to be an impact, impact player, but as a rookie. My money is on Ethan Del Mastro. He was a stud last season in the CHL. And while the AHL is a graveyard of stud CHL defensemen <laughs> who never pan out, I think EDM, AKA Dance Dance Revolution, has a lot of projectable skills. <laughs> so, don't be mad. That's a that's a much better one than I could have done. <laughs> yes, he's a is. quality <laughs> defender in the neutral zone. He skates well. He he has playmaking vision, and it's high end playmaking vision. His puck skills only enhance that his ability to make plays. He's useful in transition. All of those things translate well from junior hockey to pro hockey. That's a skill set that should be able to make things happen at the AHL level. Don't get me wrong. I think everyone struggles at first. Like, he may go to December looking kind of rough, but he'll eventually, I think, piece it together with the ability that he has. I still think he needs some work on in-zone defense against the cycle, especially when he's the off-puck defender. But that's something that good coaching should be able to smooth out at least a little bit. Um, but I, I, my money is on uh, DDR here to be the impact player from this crop of youths that's in Rockford this year. Sarah, what say you? So I am looking in net with Drew Camasso. Uh, he has had a standout college career um, at BU. He is another player with useful tools. He tracks the puck well. He moves efficiently, has the lower body strength to make explosive moves post to post. Um, he does show some weaknesses in finding his angles at times, um, as well as getting, getting beat on wrap rounds. But with professional goalie coaches at his disposal, that should be something that gets worked out of his game. Uh, the biggest adjustment for him is going to be the talent level and the chaos that can be AHL hockey at time. Uh, NCAA shooters are just flat out not AHL shooters by a wide margin, and that can take some adjustment to get used to. College hockey is also a lot more robotic and structured than what you're going to see at the pro level. 
it is a coaches league rather than a players league in that aspect, because you see less freelancing, less unstructured play um, in the AHL and NHL broken play chaos just happens. And not only does it happen, but it happens at a much faster speed. That is going to be the struggle for him this season is making the, that adjustment, which, which sounds small, but it isn't like, Imagine you have been driving for a few years, but you only run country lo- ro- roads, single lane streets in town. The AHL is the interstate. Like, sure, the car hasn't changed, but how quickly you have to move and react does. And so that is what's going to be the biggest thing for him to have to deal with. All right. Uh, I won't even try and warm it up here. Let's go right to the machine because I I know what's going to happen here. I made this graphic. I, I know. Um Average points, 68. Playoff percentage, 21. Win division, zero. In 5,000 simulations of the AHL season, the Chicago, or sorry, the Rockford Ice Hogs uh, won the division a number of times that rounds to zero. I'm going to go first here. More than anything, Arvid Soderblom was the backbone of this team in prior seasons. Uh, I think that we could see some useful things from Ju Camesso, but Jackson Stauber, I don't believe in. I don't think they're ready to step in and deliver similar results to what Soderblom has done. Joey Anderson, Brent Sini, and David Gust are back, but guys like Re- Reichel and Grimaldi are gone. Philip is hurt to start the year and maybe comes maybe comes back, maybe doesn't. The depth here, the depth here is razor thin, and I don't think that this Ice Hawks team is able to build off the success they've had in the past two seasons. 68 is a low number, so I will take the over for 70. But this is not a this is not a playoff roster at this moment in time, Sarah. No, this is another team that I think could have the potential to be fun but bad. That doesn't make the greatest of seasons for fans because the youth are going to be overmatched a lot. There's going to be a lot of like miserable games, but there should be some exciting moments. I am curious to see what Camesso does. I, I liked him in college. Um, but man, there are not a lot of adults on this team, are there? Um, I'm going to stick with the motto on this one and say 68, but yikes. <laughs> All right, let's move on to what is most certainly going to be the <laughs> funnest team we talk about that I'm sure we will get everyone to have reasonable reactions to because that's yeah. what's happened all yeah. off season. Oh. Yes. Sarah, tell me about... The unburdened, unyoked, free of chains Chicago Wolves. They are free like a bird. Um, I wish I could make a wolf joke, but I I, I don't got one. It's one in the morning. Um, they are 35 and 37 last season, sixth in the Central Division. Uh, head coach Bob Nardella finally gets the uh, call up to head coach uh, he clean slate. We have no record for him. Let's see what happens. Dave Barr is his assistant. And I'll just go ahead and do the next part. Additions and subtractions. Everyone except for Josh Melnick, Kevin Fitzgerald, Nate Sassis, and Alex Green. Everyone else is gone. Everyone else is new. I'm going to have zero idea who is on this team once I start going to games. None. None at all. Who's that man? I don't know. He's short. <laughs> There's like six short guys on this team. <laughs> it's amazing. I love it. <laughs> uh, all right. Now, the way we normally have been doing this is <laughs> we talk about the big picture things about the team, then we break down two prospects, then we do us versus the machine. But, you know, <laughs> well, let's just go right into it. Uh, yeah. The storyline here is the one that has been a topic of discussion that there have been many, many an article, interview. Like, I think anyone that it does hockey coverage like broadly across the league at some point has talked about this, like TSN, Sportsnet, ESPN, like those people are covering us or us, us, Chicago and the independence story. Like everyone has talked to everyone. Nobody has gotten firm answers exactly. Well, Chicago has said very clearly what happened from their perspective many a time. We even talked about it when we talked, when CC talked on the phone, the day like basically broke. Uh, to friend of the show, uh, Wendell Young, um, about what happened. Like Carolina is not going to say stuff though. No, like no. they're they're not, and that's fine. Their their side of the story is important, but probably going to be like a book in ten years. Um, <laughs> but let's let's talk about this. Um, I, I'm just I'm glad to see that a team went independent and that everyone on the internet just handled it with grace and understanding. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
like as a card carrying member of team chaos though i am here for this people are like up in arms for wide ranges of things like chicago fans are rejoicing to be free from the yoke of an nhl call-ups and meddling carolina fans who are absolutely sure this is chicago's fault and it's a grave injustice to them and their hurricanes to like rando people who are swear the AHL is going to do something silly like grant uh, Carolina a provisional franchise or allow them to buy a 33rd team <laughs> like people also swear that like before anyone was even signed that this was going to be a Calder Cup contender while other people at the exact same time uh, were like this team's going to be crap they don't have NHL prospects no one's going to see them so no matter what we say here someone's going to be mad about it <laughs> But here's the thing, why Chicago's independent and whose fault it is does not matter anymore. That's trivial to the case in point. Chicago is going to play with this roster and that's it. Let the lawyers or first name bunch of numbers on Twitter, uh, you know, sort out the liability. The story of how this came to be has been covered to death. So let's get to the hockey. Uh, I feel pretty confident in saying that this team is going to be good. I don't see an instant contender here, but the floor for this team is damn high. It's a roster loaded with veterans who are predictable in what they do and how they produce. Chris Terry is a sniper who can set up plays through the threat of his shot. His shot is very, very good. Uh, Rocco Grimaldi has wheels with a deceptive shot and good offensive vision. Cole Schneider somehow left the Milwaukee Admirals after being their captain for what felt like since they were named after a fridge. Uh, one of the best garbage men in the AHL and will crash the crease and cause havoc. Corey Conacher is a playmaker who still has some speed left in him despite the fact that he's, you know, growing long in the tooth. Matt Donovan is just mean on the blue line who occasionally will chase hits in the defensive zone, but he also has some offensive tools and a powerful shot. Kevin Fitzgerald is an underrated do-it-all defensive. Max Comtois was an everyday NHL in Anaheim for three seasons and should easily be point per game in the AHL. Like the blue line has some questions in depth. I don't think it was much of guys like Tori Dello or Austin Strand or Alex Green, but this offense has depth and talents. Um, Keith Kincaid and Adam Shield isn't necessarily the tandem I would have sprung for if I were Chicago here because they don't count towards the veteran uh, tally. Kincaid has shown that he still had it, but his durability is a concern because Keith Kincaid in October, November is not the same Keith Kincaid that we've been seeing in April and May. And maybe those are injuries. Maybe that's I'm getting older and my body cannot take the wear of a season for as long as it used to. It's hard to say because we didn't bring Keith Kincaid on the podcast today to ask him that question. Um, but uh, I, I think this roster should be good. Sarah, what do you have to say here? Uh, I'm this, I like, I'm so fascinated to watch this play out. Um, I was just looking at their roster and no surprise. They are literally the oldest team in the league. By, uh, like they're the oldest team in the league by a lot. Yes. Um, <laughs> their oldest player is uh, uh, Kincaid and Chris Terry. They're both 34, um, which is like, you're going to fall apart in hockey terms. They have two players under 24. Um, they have a 21 year old and a 22 year old. That is it. Everyone else is 24 and up. <laughs> um, I, th th this is either going to be like, it's going to reward Chicago and the like ballsiness of like, we're going to do whatever we want. Like we're taking our ball and doing whatever we want, or it's going to be like a complete unmitigated disaster. I, I don't know that there's going to be like, a middle ground but this team is like if you've ever watched an ahl team and been like oh hey that guy that guy is now on this team <laughs> <laughs> like looking at this roster is full of guys so i'm like oh yeah him huh that's where he wound up <laughs> yeah i i struggle to see that this team like if the call-ups are really going to be kind of the way that they've sold this a little mm -hmm. bit like guys are still going to get called up to the NHL to get looks when guys need a body. Like, don't get me wrong. Yeah. But like the frequency and the duration of that is yeah. what makes me curious. Like yeah. if that works, like Chicago has been trying to sell that it work, mm -hmm. it's going to work. This team's floor is incredibly yeah. high. Like there is a lot of dependable talent in the, in the forward yeah. group. Can they outscore their problems? Because mm -hmm. the when I look at the forwards and then I look at the rest of the roster, I'm like, yeah. Like mm. I, I, I am that mean. Like defense yes. and goaltending, forward. <laughs> yeah. So all right, 
let's get to the prospects. All right, and we're on to the machine. Yeah, there are. There's no one even on this roster that you could like squint at and call like a true prospect that uh, an NHL team is trying to develop. That ain't this team. That is the whole point of them being yes. this team. So let's get right to the machine here. The machine says. 84 points average, 87% to make the playoffs, 18% to win the division. I'm going to go first here. This team is going to score goals. The offense is loaded. It has great depth. The rest of it looks sketchy, especially in goal. I trust Keith Kincaid in October. Keith Kincaid in February hasn't been, pa- hasn't been the best in the past few seasons. And at 34 years old, I question whether that pattern changes. If they can outscore their problems, which I think they more or less should be able to, they can be fi- they should be fine in the regular season. The middle of this division is very wishy-washy, and I think Chicago is a clear playoff team right now. But more than that, eh, this looks like it's going to be a fun team on the ice. They are going to score a lot of goals, and I'm confident that will make a lot of people mad one way or the other. Regardless, I'm taking a slight over. I'm going to say 85. Sarah, what say you? Um, first, I wasn't joking when I said they have like a million short guys. They have six guys who are under 5'10", um, and there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There are 10 guys who are listed as under six feet. Um, it, 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 if you are a fan of short kings, um, this, is your, team for you. this is your team. Oh, boy, do I have a team for you. Anyway, that aside, can my take on this team just be like 45 seconds of incredibly nervous re- laughter? Like, that is that is my feeling on this the entire, ever since all this happened. Like like I said, on, on the one hand, this roster is basically like a murderer's row of players who have been just really annoying to play against over the years. Um, especially, like, I feel like they got everyone from, like, Cleveland and... Uh, Milwaukee like I'm glad that they're here so I don't have to like play against like Cole Schneider anymore um Chris Terry is interesting especially because instead of slowing down as you think that he would at this point in his career he put up the most points of his career last year so like he clearly still has something going um in terms of goaltending Kincaid his entire existence is kind of a question mark. So he has an AHL contract. He also signed an NHL contract with the Devils who have basically agreed to assign him to Chicago when he's in the AHL. That's all fine and good, but for a team that was determined to have players who weren't going to be stolen away via call-ups to now have the possibility of losing your veteran goaltender at any time if the Devils decide they want him back, like yikes. Um Without Kincaid, the goalie situation is scary with a side of interesting. Um, I am curious about last year's goaltender of the year in the top French league, Julien Junca. He is on loan with the Wolves from the ECHL. I think that could be fun. Um, but I don't know that like him and Adam Scheel are what you want <laughs> in your goaltending situation. I am going with just under with 82. I will be delighted to be wrong just because I love how mad it will make people. <laughs> I will say, does this not feel like a team that Adam Cracknell was supposed to be on? Yes. Yes. Okay. I don't Wonder- know where he is, but like he should be here. <laughs> uh, Henderson is the correct Oh, answer. yeah. We haven't gotten there yet. That's why. But, like this feels like a team that oh, yeah. Adam Cracknell was supposed to be on as yes. like a group of just journeyman uh, mm-hmm. AHLers. Mm-hmm. Like he is the king of that group. <laughs> anyway, as much fun as it is to talk about Chicago, we must move on. Let's talk about the Grand Rapids Griffins. Sarah, give me the deets on last season and the staff. Uh, Last season, the Griffins were 28 and 44. That was seventh in the Central Division. Uh, Brand new head coach this year. They've got Dan Watson as their new uh, bench boss. He's got a clean slate in his record. Uh, brand new to this level of coaching in the AHL. Stefan Julien and Brian Lashoff are the assistant coaches. The additions are Michael Hutchinson, Josiah Didier, Brogan Rafferty, Antti Tuomista, personally I try and be pro Tuomista, Zach Aston Reich, Tim Gettinger, Marco Casper, and Nolan Stevens. Some guys left Grand Rapids. Who were they? Uh, they have said goodbye to Drew Warred, Trenton Bliss, Daniel Regan, Pontus Anderson, uh, Chase Pearson, Jasper Weatherby, also not a real person, Donovan Sabrango, Brian Lashoff, uh, who left but didn't leave, um, <laughs> Kir- Kir- Kirill Tutiev, and Seth Barton. 
Yeah, does it count as a? I don't even. I don't it's know. a like half subtraction. <laughs> so, uh, for those of you who have not been listening the entire three and a half hours, uh, we're going to cover some like news headlines, uh, storylines, questions we have for this team. And then we're going to dive into two prospects uh, that are a little bit more off the beaten path and maybe new to Grand Rapids. And then we are going to play over under with the machine. So I will start us off here. The big question for me is what plagued the team last year. That is goaltending. The Grand Rapids Griffins could not buy a save last year until Alex Nedeljevic, the Delkovic, uh, came in and gave them life from January till just after Patty's. I'm sure he's still seeing a specialist for the scoliosis he contracted from carrying the Griffins for that stretch. But the defensive environment should be improved this season. I like the additions of Josiah Didier and Brogan Rafferty. Didier is a physical and zone defender who can keep pucks away from high danger areas. Rafferty is a skilled number one AHL defenseman who can move pucks in transition and create offense from the blue line. Both are skill sets that were sorely missed in Grand Rapids this last season. Yes, I, Simon Edmondson showed that ability last season, but wasn't nearly as polished to his credit. He was 19 and looked timid in his first season. I think the speed of play, especially in the offensive zone, was a bit much for Edmondson. But, you know, he's also, uh, you know, kind of stuck to a lot of point shots and simple plays and didn't turn the puck over instead of more attacking uh, with meaningful offense, activating off the blue line. That's more where we were expecting to see Simon Edmondson. It wasn't as present last year. I also wasn't as big a fan of his in-zone play, especially off puck, where he tended to get lost and let passes through Royal Road. Fred Lance, he was responsible for. Again, 19 and a rookie those plays those players however no matter how highly high ha, those players no matter how highly touted though when they come to the ahl as a teenager and a rookie they struggle for a reason this is not an easy league to succeed in but i think having a little bit more veteran cover this season will benefit him a lot um sarah what say you so I think that on this team as well, the offense has also added a fair bit. They've got Zach Aston Reese, um, who's surely going to be the Red Wings' first call up, but you know has been a regular NHLer for I think his whole career, uh, and so he's kind of a bit of an outlier here. Um, Tim Gettinger also showed up big in the playoffs for Hartford last season. He's a good depth scorer. Same thing with Nolan Stevens. And if we can see guys like Cross Hannes or Marco, Marco Casper uh, step in and contribute in depth roles as they ease into the AHL, then like this team should be much improved uh, than it was last season. All right. Let's talk prospects. We have two that we want to talk about here. One that is a little more uh, new. The other one, uh, somewhat more well-known. I will go first here. I want to talk about Marco Casper. Casper's biggest asset is his skating, which powers his game. He's not just fast. He has the motor that pairs with it to make him seem like he can be everywhere all at once. He's Schrodinger's prospect. He's an asset in transition and can lead the rush on zone entries. His playmaking has come along well, and I'm looking for him to be able to be a part of the power play along the half wall. Casper also has a lot of sandpaper to his game and doesn't shy away from board battles or net front scrums. He'll go to the dirty areas in both ends of the ice and go to work. All in all, he plays a very translatable game, and the one and once the speed of the AHL isn't as intimidating, he should be primed to show the Red Wings why they drafted him. Sarah, talk to me about one of the most intriguing prospects that we've seen in a while. We're going to turn to the net and Sebastian Kosa. Uh, his biggest asset is his ability to track play that, and he is 6'6 and can track play at a high level. That's going to afford him a lot of opportunities that other goaltenders don't have in terms of being able to cover the net and make saves. Uh, the problem is his movement. It is just flat out not good enough. Uh, he tracks the puck quickly, but because he moves poorly, he's often late to his angle or he just isn't on it and he gets lost. Uh, that and or, you know, he'll know he's late. He tries and he scrambles to make up for it, which just snowballs into more mistakes more goals against, and this is especially true on high to low or rural road plays. He does have good physical tools, and again, his puck tracking is elite, but the movement problems are why he struggled in the ECHL. If he can iron those out, then he's got a lot of potential, and if not, well, then April is not going to get here fast enough for Griffins fans. All right, it's machine fight time. But we don't have any CGI, but we're going to make do. All right. The machine says Grand Rapids Griffins, 81 points on average. They make the playoffs 80% of the time. They win the division 10%. Another one of those teams that's kind of just in the middle, like not a, a, a team that's probably going to be a playoff, but like they're going to they're gonna have to fight for home ice advantage. Sarah, what say you? 
So this team is in the same kind of interesting spot that the Wild are for me. Um, does a new head coach help them forge a new identity? Do they suddenly become more fun to watch? Like, I don't necessarily think they're going to be great, um, but I do think that this could be a start of a new era for this team as they start to take a different direction. Uh, I'm going with the under, uh, just under at 80 points. This all comes down to goaltending for me. Last season, the Griffins couldn't get competent goaltending until Alex and Delkovic came in last year and had to practically carry this team to be respectable. Don't get me wrong, the defense was bad as well, but not nearly as bad as the goaltending. Hutchinson has been injured a, you know, a, a ton the last few years. He's 33. He hasn't been a worthwhile AHL goalie over a meaningful number of games played since 2018. Sebastian Costa is still a project, and that concerns me. I think the Griffins make the playoffs, but on like the last day of the season by a thin margin. I'm taking a slight under and saying 79. I think they are one of the many kind of wishy-washy teams in the middle of this division. Like they're good, but they are very, very not great, if that makes sense. And that is it for the Central Division. After the break, we will get to the Pacific Division. If you're just here for the Central and this is your jumping off point, thank you for stopping by. Don't forget to subscribe if you're ever listening to us from so you get episodes in a timely fashion. Also, check us out on social media. Links to our social media and more can be found at our Linktree page at l-i-n-k-t-r dot e-e slash the Calder Farmstead. We're going to run some ads, pay some bills one last time, and then get right through the Pacific Division and then probably die. Yes. See you guys on the other side. And we are back. We are in the Pacific Division. We're going to go in order that they finished last year, which means we start with the Calgary Wranglers. Sarah, what did they do last year? Who is manning the bench? Last year, the Calgary Wranglers were 51 and 21, were first in the Pacific Division. Trent calls the head coach. He has a 161 and 148 record as an AHL head coach with two playoff appearances. He is 0-2 in AHL playoff series. Don Nakbar and Joe Sorella are his assistants. The additions they made are Lucas Siona, Brady Lyle, Jared Gorley, Connor Murphy, Matt Radamous Rand Radamowski, Sam Jardine, and Jonathan Aspero. Who is gone, Sarah? They have said goodbye to Matthew Phillips, and I feel like the list could just stop there. Uh, Calder Brooks, Josh Brook, Christian Rubens, and Nicholas Meloche. All right. So if you've not been doing this for the first 22 teams that we previewed here, we're going to do some news, some notes, some storylines, some questions kind of around the team. Then we are going to dive into two prospects a little more in depth. Guys who are not the A-plus prospect that you all know and love, but more off the beaten path that might be new to you. And then we're going to play us versus the machine over under. I will start us off for storylines. I think the big one for me here is, are Connor Zary, Emilio Peterson, and Ben Jones ready to carry this offense? And I do not think that is a small question. While Zary and Jones had good seasons last year, and Patterson has taken a step forward, none were asked to carry the load offensively. 50-plus points in the AHL season is nothing to sneeze at. But Matthew Phillips is gone, and Jakob Peltier is injured, and while he's going to get healthy at some point, we assume, he might make the flames when he gets healthy. Uh the grumpy old man is not in charge there who doesn't remember his number. <laughs> but can Zary, Jones, and Peterson, like those guys are going to need to step up and carry the load because stuff did not come in to replace Matthew Phillips or Yucca Peltier in the offseason. Um, that's going to need to be done, you know, by the established committee that's there. Are they ready to step up and take it? Are they going to take the reins? I, I'm not sure. I, I, I think maybe sort of yes. Sarah, what are you looking at with this team? So this is another team that did have a coaching change. Mitch Love has left for the NHL. Former Abbotsford Canuck head coach Trent, Trent Call is in. What does that mean? Well, first off, Mitch Love leaves as one of the best coaches in the AHL in terms of preparation, getting his team to buy in, play a detailed just lunch pail game. Trent Cole's AHL teams have always had kind of sandpaper feel to them. They can score, they can defend, win games, but they always seem to have a level of snarl to them. Um, I think of his teams as ones where you're just a lot more likely to play a more grinding style than a fast-paced north-south one. That's not to say he can't adapt or change, but I also think that that identity fits this current roster. Mitch Love teams also knew how to grind and wear you down, but they had more talent than the roster that Trent Cole has inherited. Call also inherits one Dustin Wolf, the AHL's kingpin goaltender. 
Um, I do think this team takes on more of a defense first physical grind kind of mentality. I think they have talent. They can score, but I don't think they have the horses to match with the Wranglers and the heat before that have accomplished in the past two seasons. Let us talk about some prospects to watch. I will go first and talk about William Stromgren. Where the Rang while the Wranglers have plenty of other interesting prospects, we've been trying to kind of focus ones who are maybe newer to the fans. And Stromgren really didn't get much of an introduction last season. He's a bit of a project as he has high-end skills, but they lack consistency. His hands are dangerous, though, and his ability to embarrass defenders one-on-one -on -one remains a threat, especially in tight. He can also use those hands to open up passing lanes under sticks and between legs. But despite having the stature to play a more power forward role, Strumgen doesn't really have a strong net drive and is only moderately physical in his game. Adding that plus some better defensive zone play would help move this project along and be a more impactful piece for sure. But again, development is never guaranteed. I, I would like to see him try and become a little more well-rounded and see if Trent Cole can't get him to play a little bit more of a complete game. Not every player needs to be a guy who plays every, you know, plays 200 feet, but I think that would help him become more projectable to the NHL based on where his skill set is right now. So I'm looking at Lucas Siona, who is a player who fits more of the power forward mold that we've talked about uh, the, with uh, Strongen. Uh, he is big, he's powerful, he can finish his chances in tight, as well as drive the puck to the net all by himself. Uh, he is physical and can play that role of the garbage man at the net front. Um, he also shows a deft touch. He can make surprising plays to teammates around the crease. Uh, defensively, he is engaged in the play. He finishes checks. Uh, the one drawback, though, of being big and powerful is that it usually comes at the cost of speed, uh, and Siona is no different here. Uh, he's someone who lacks an explosive stride and the ability to put defenders on their heels with his pace of play. If he can potentially work on picking up a step here and there, there is a projectable NHL skill set here with this player. Let's get right to it. It's machine time. What, oh, magic machine do you say for the Calgary Wranglers this season? 79 points on average. They make the playoffs 70% of the time. 4% of the time, they win the division. I will go first. I'm going to say this is tough. I think we see what Dustin Wolf is actually made of this year. He says about the reigning two-time best goaltender in the AHL, plus the MVP and, and all that. Mm -hmm. But the Heat and Wranglers teams that he's played on were very good in front of him. Yes, he still had to make big saves. And yes, I still think he's an NHL goalie. But this roster isn't the same group of killers that Mitch Love coached. Matthew Phillips is gone. Jakob Peltier is hurt and may make the Flames and not come back. Defensive stalwarts like Nick Maloche are gone. And while I think Trent Cole is a decent AHL coach, he is not Mitch Love. I'm going to take the over here and say 82 solely because Dustin Wolf, who's going to spend the majority of the season as a Wrangler, because as I've saying for, been saying for months, literal months, time stamped and everything, <laughs> no one is doing Calgary a favor and taking Dan Vladar off their hands without extra assets attached. If somehow Dustin Wolf gets serious time in a Flames jersey this year, the Wranglers might not make the playoffs. I'm just going to whisper that part at the end. Sarah? So, yeah, this is not the same team that has been dominant for the past two years. I, I agree with you. A lot of the season rests on Dustin Wolf being otherworldly. Um, we saw what happened in the playoffs last year when he was just, like, human and not some sort of weird goalie alien. Um, if he is not otherworldly or if he is not on this roster for any period of time, yeah, this team is going to struggle. Like, I would love to see someone step up and help drag this team back to what we're used to seeing from them, but none of their offseason moves really ring that bell for me. Um, I say under at 78 points, Dustin Wolf can only do so much. Last time I checked, he doesn't score goals. It's not his job. Yet. Yet. He might get bored. <laughs> I have a feeling this season he will have his hands full. <laughs> All right. Let us move on to the Coachella Valley Firebirds. Uh, Sarah, tell me about their season last season. Who is behind the bench? Uh, last season, they were 48 and 24 for second in the Pacific Division. If you somehow missed the, uh, the, the Calder Cup last year, they were the, 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 the bridesmaid, not the bride um, in, that, in that competition. Their head coach, Disco Dan Balsma, 83 and 43 is his AHL head coaching record. He's got one playoff appearance. Uh, he is four and one in AHL playoff series. Uh, Jessica Campbell and Stu Bickle are his assistants. 
The additions for your Coachella Valley Firebirds are Logan Morrison, Marion Studenich, Tucker Robertson, Devin Shore, Connor Carrick, Mitch Reinke, and Elez Stezka. Devin Shore technically just called back up to Seattle, um, but he was on the roster. It counts. Sarah, some guys left. Uh, what? Where did they? No, not where did they go. Who were they? <laughs> where did they go? Wasn't part of the test here. Don't um, stalk them. Just tell me who they were. <laughs> Nick Pastajov, Jesper Froden, Alexander True, Tristan Mullen, Austin Poganski, Brogan Rafferty, Shane Stair, Christopher Gibson, Carson Torensky, Matt Tennyson, and Eddie Wichow all have gone away to somewhere. So uh, we are going to talk about some big picture questions that we have, uh, as well as dive into two prospects that are maybe a little off the beaten path here that you might be new to as fans. And then we are going to play us versus the machine over under style. I will start us off. I think the big question for me here on this team is what happens in net? The Firebirds, fa uh, the Firebird Faithful's favorite son, Joey Decord, has graduated to the Kraken. You know, I, I think we're all happy for him for that. In comes 29-year-old Chris Drieger and 26-year-old Aless Stezka. Both are larger goalies that can take up a lot of net. Drieger is well-traveled in the AHL with a solid resume and has had successful stints in the NHL. Assuming he is healthy now, and I don't mean like I can play healthy, I mean like healthy, healthy. He should be a solid starting goalie for the Firebirds. Stezka is more unknown in North America. I say this as someone who could not find much film on him. So my opinion at this point is strictly based on resume and his resume is impressive from Chechia, but that doesn't always translate to North American pro hockey. The game is faster. The ice is a different size. In most cases, the game is more physical. There's more battling in front. There's higher talent levels here. I'm not expecting stellar level goaltending, but above average is certainly attainable. And I think that's, Import, obviously, above average goaltending will always help you do good things. But I think that there is going to be a drop off from Joey Decord, but I don't think it should be huge. And I think that's important. Sarah, what do you say? So I, I think that the big question is how do these additions and subtractions stack up for this team? I think that it's favorable for the most part. Um, Ty Cartier seems like he's graduated to a full-time role with the Kraken, which sucks for AHL purposes, but is a great thing to see for him as a player. Uh, the big moves here are Froden, True, and Rafferty all going out. Student each, Shore, and Carrick all coming in. Um, I think Ranky can be semi-useful as well. And it's not an even one-for-one -one swap, but I think that overall this should work out. Uh, I think Carrick has shown he can be a number one defenseman in the AHL, especially with an improved cast around him. He doesn't play the exact same game as Brogan Rafferty, but they're not dissimilar. Uh, Shore is also an, in an interesting one because he has been an NHL depth player for pretty much his whole career. Uh, his career high in AHL games played in the season is 23, and that was back in 2015-16. He's basically already been the Kraken's first call-up, uh, but if he stays there, um, or, or if he doesn't stay there, uh, then he should be a, a point-per-game uh, contributor uh, for the Firebirds. But he's also never really been someone who has stuck at the AHL, AHL level. Uh, so you may not see much of him here. Uh, Student each also made a push to get more NHL playing time in 21-22, and he's bounced back and forth a bit since then. Um, he did play most of last season in Texas, was a quality middle six score. Uh, and while he's defensively not operating with the speed that Froden had, he can score. I have one last point that I want to make here before we get into prospects. And I think it's an important one that is going to be asked about and we're never going to get a direct answer for. It's what are the vibes following the playoffs? Like, I have to imagine being one goal away from a Disney movie-like scenario in your first season as a franchise leaves some marks on you. And don't get me wrong, that first Firebird season was one for the ages, and my God, did those games look like the place to be. And I'm sure players have a lot of positive memories from the season and the community and the celebrations, but when it ends in Game 7 overtime for a championship and you watch the opposing team skate the cup in your building, those are the kind of things that wake you up at night. I have to imagine that memory lingers for everyone who was there. But what they do with that pain matters. Some will dwell on it on how close they came and worry about if they'll ever get another shot. Others will use it as motivation to finish the job this season. These memories could haunt them, they could distract them, they could empower them, or they could do a fourth thing we don't even know about. I'm not going to pretend to have a psychological assessment of the Firebirds locker room from several time zones 
Actually, technically, I'm in Edmonton right now. That is the same time zone, but you get my point. I don't know how this team thinks about the end of last season, and I doubt I ever will at any point this season or in the future. But I can tell you it matters, and it's going to play a factor in how this team performs, even if we can't see it. Those memories leave fingerprints on people, good, bad, and ugly. What they do with them is going to be a very personal choice for them, but it's going to matter. How it matters, no idea, but it will but we won't know how. All right. Let's talk about some prospects here. I'm taking the fun one, Sarah. I'm sorry. I want to talk about Shane Wright. Shane Wright's last season had to be a nightmare for him. Not quite in the right place to carve out a role on the Kraken. Can't really be sent to the AHL. Too good for juniors. The result was this hodgepodge season that I'd be surprised if anyone is truly happy with but at least this feels like a chance for a fresh start in the same place. He managed to get an exception to the CHL NHL agreement, a thing that shouldn't exist in the first place. And he's going to be in Coachella Valley for at least the early season. I think now that he can get settled, find a rhythm, uh, a bit with a, a, like he can get into a rhythm with a team here. We're going to see that Shane Wright is in fact, very, very good. I think we saw flashes of that last season with the Firebirds. He's an exceptional skater who can find passing lanes to open teammates in dangerous areas in ways that just other players can't. I think of the assist on Austin Pagansky's goal in game number four of last year's finals that stands out. Like he found Pagansky in a space that other people in the AHL just don't. Maybe that's because I saw it live and I remember seeing it and playing and like seeing that play and thinking, that's the Shane Wright that I know. But that's the crux of his game, finding ways to advance the play while also opening up the play for attack. I think he also has an underrated off-puck game and can find soft space in the slot to unleash a very underrated and impressive shot. Defensively too, Shane Wright is no slouch. He isn't Patrick Kane coasting into the, the, the offensive zone. He attacks plays in the neutral zone and can win battles around the board and around the net front. All in all, I think we see a better picture of Shane Wright this year, and I think he reminds us of why he was so highly highly touted as a pick. This is a dude who was thought as a quasi-generational talent. He's someone who was talked about for years before his draft day. And he, I don't care what anyone says, stared down Montreal when they <laughs> did take, when Seattle got to take him. This is someone who takes pride in the level of player that he is. And I think after he, you know... Uh, gets past last season and shakes off all of the demons, not just the the way it ended, but the journey to that place. I think we're going to see Shane Wright be Shane Wright again. And I think that's very good for all of us. Uh, so I'm going to look at Tucker Roberts, Robertson. Uh, and the big question for him is translation, like not language. He's from Toronto. I assume that he speaks, understands English just fine. Um, Translation more in terms of how the game he played in juniors looks in the AHL. When he was in juniors, he did everything. He could score with an NHL caliber, caliber shot. He could make plays. He drove the net. He skated hard. He forechecked well. He was physical. He could change momentum with his hits. He played on both sides of special teams effectively. He did a lot of things that you like and you want to see in your prospects. But juniors isn't the AHL. And I worry about how well his skating is going to translate uh, to bring that game of his to pro hockey. He's not slow necessarily, but he does lack a top gear. And in pro hockey, that can mean a lot as the speed of the game is already very high. I think he's going to be an interesting player for the Firebirds this season. Um, and we will see pretty quickly if he struggles or if he flourishes or if he's just kind of stuck somewhere in between. And now we go to the machine. Machine. Tell me good things. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, machine. Jesus Christ, machine. <laughs> Average points 92. Oof. That is the highest uh, that we will talk about today by like, what, four points, three points? Yeah. I think Iowa was 89. They're three points higher than the next closest team. <laughs> Playoff percentage, 98%. They are 51% to win this stupid division. <laughs> I I have no words. Yeah. I had words. They are gone now. Yeah. Sarah, have words. <laughs> so, like, normally I would look at the 
list of players who have left a team like this, either through, you know, free agency, whatever, or guys like Ty Karche, who are most likely going to be NHL regulars. I'd look at this and I'd say, that's it. Last year was fun while it lasted, but like, enjoy it. Let's just, let's just pretend and move on from there. Um, But the Firebirds and the Kraken organization brought in a lot of experience to help keep this team at the top of the standings. I like, I don't even know that I care what goaltending does. Um, I am actually pretty familiar with Alex Steska um, from when he was in the USHL. Like, obviously that was a long time ago, so I haven't seen what he's done as an adult, but he was crucial to the Chicago Steel's 2017 cup run um, to the point where there was like a game where he had to sit out because there was a rumor that he had signed a pro contract somewhere, which is against the rules of the USHL. And so he had to sit out a game in the playoffs um, while they investigated the situation and the like I was at the game like the, it was night and day of the steal with Steshka and without him um it was a very bad game um so as a teenager uh, a, you know a young man he was very good at that level um it looks like he's put up good numbers since then in the Czech league but like none of that matters though like my weirdo Chicago steel knowledge is like useless here because Chris Streeter is going to get the bulk of the starts and that's fine um this is a very good team I I'm so mad about it. <laughs> Over 94 points. <laughs> I have no idea what to do. That's so many, like 92. Yeah. That's so many points. So many points. Like, yeah, they put up like a hundred and something last year, but like, how do you call that now? Yeah. So many things happen between now and then. <laughs> Spoiler, like this team is, yeah, loaded once again. The only question I really have is what the goaltending does. If Joey Decord was still here and it was him and Drieger, this is the easiest regular season title we'll ever see. <laughs> but like, I think Chris Drieger can hold down the fort. And I don't think that like Calgary is not Calgary anymore. Mm-hmm. There are some other teams in the Pacific that have made some interesting plays that are a little stronger than they were last year. But there is, because this team is so insulated to the Pacific division and seeing the rest of the division, I'm like, yeah, mm-hmm. I think I'm going to say over 95 points is what I have written down. I <laughs> I feel like I'm taking crazy pills. <laughs> May the hockey god smile on me. Over 95 points. Good luck. <laughs> like when this, uh, I, I'm so scared. <laughs> I'm so dumb in like April, aren't I? Please, Cookshella Valley, make me look smart. All right, let's move on. We have so many other teams to cover, and it is late. I hate the Pacific Division. I hate this division so much. <laughs> Who invented this? <laughs> Not me. All right, let's talk about the Colorado Eagles. Sarah, tell me about their season last year and what's going on behind the bench. Uh, They were 40 and 32 last season, third in the Pacific Division. Another team with a brand new head coach, Aaron Schneekloth, is their new head coach. He has got a blank slate of a record uh, as a coach at this level. Uh, Steve Konowalczyk and Tim Branham are his assistants. The additions for the Colorado Eagles are Riley Tufte, Peter Holland, Chris Wagner, Tanner Caro, DJ Buzdecker, Brett Stapley, Ivan Ivan. Yo, Kivi Ranta, Henry Bowlby, Johnny Fairbrother, Jack Ashan, Corey Shuneman, and Arvid Holm. Sarah, what uh, are they, they, they have said goodbye. I'm just so excited about Yvonne Yvonne. Um, they have said goodbye to Gustav Rydal, Sampo Ranta, Alex Galchenyuk, Mikhail Maltsev, Cameron Wright, Charles Sudan, Kale Kessie, Justin Scott, Zach Sekos, Tyron Fazer, Josh Jacobs, Mitch Van de Sample, Ryan Merkley, David Ference, Jonas Johansson, Keith Kincaid, and Ryan Wagner. I am looking up right now if Yvonne of Oh, that's so sad. They do not play Rockford this year. I very badly no. want Yvonne of to hit Marcel Marcel. I feel like the space-time continuum would just collapse. <laughs> anyway, uh, so how we're going to do this is we're going to talk about some big kind of overlap, overlying topics about the team this year. Uh, and how we kind of feel about them in general, loose terms. We're then going to dive into two prospects that are a little off the beaten path that may be a little newer to some of the Eagles fans. And then we are going to play us versus the machine over under style. So um, for me, the storyline here is, man, are the IR slots busy early on. 
John Luke Foody starts the season on IR, which doesn't help, but the assumption that he is that he'll get healthy and contribute here. He has slowly looked like the rest of his skill set is catching up to his skating speed. I am dying for him to go to an all-star skills competition because I want to see that time lap. Show me the speed. <laughs> but he also looked the part last year of I don't belong in the AHL. But Galchenyuk and Hudon are gone, though, and the Eagles are going to need offense. When he gets healthy, can Foody continue to build on what he started last year once he's cleared to play? Alex Bocage is in a similar boat, 22 and starting on the IR. He's underwhelmed in two seasons with the Eagles. But again, guys need to step up, but they need to get healthy first. Chris Wagner is hardly a prospect, but he's on the IR for up to five months with an Achilles injury. Solid depth score and a veteran leader at the AHL level. Those IR slots being filled means the surrounding cast is going to need to stand up and be counted in the words of ACDC. Guys like Henry Bowlby, Callahan Burke, Ben Myers, Oscar Olison. Sarah, what do you think about the big questions for this team? So like our other teams that have changed coaches, the biggest question for me is how does Aaron Schneekloth running the show look different from Greg Cronin? Uh, Cronin was a pretty no-nonsense kind of coach. He could develop as well as coach his team to win games. His offenses five on five were always dynamic and challenging, but the special teams were frequently yeah, underwhelming uh, despite a level of talent that really should have made them thrive. Now, I know assistant coaches typically run the special teams and that makes that not all on Cronin, but still when you're the head coach, the buck stops with you no matter what. And while Schneekloth has been part of the Eagles organization in some form since 2006, I imagine his approach isn't actually a perfect overlap with Cronin's. So where those differences are is going to be an interesting part of the season, especially as his roster isn't loaded for bear like some of the Eagles teams have been in the past. I've watched the Nature Channel a bunch. Eagles definitely eat bear. That's a fact. <laughs> That's a nature fact. All right. <laughs> Let's talk about two prospects here. Uh, in particular, I will start with Sam Malinsky. It's not often that a 25-year-old undrafted free agent makes the list as a prospect, but I believe that Malinsky belongs here. He deserves to be here. He's an Ivy League defenseman, and it makes sense when you watch him play because my boy is wicked smart. That, that, that's his game. He's using that big Cornell brain to problem solve. He has great timing for plays uh, and passing lanes, seeing them come open and close and finding the small fraction of that time that a lane he wants exists and just sliding the puck through it. He baits opponents into leaving their assignment and then attacks the space behind them. It's like watching a QB throw passes into the blitz. Defensively, it's no different. His brain follows him wherever he goes. He's not overly physical or much of a battler, but instead he understands timing and when to attack a puck carrier with his stick, finding those right moments. He's got a real shot to be found money for the Eagles this season, as most college free agents do not turn into impact players. But Malinsky might just be one of the few. Sarah, who do you want to talk about? I've got Jason Pullen. Uh, he, it's surprising to sh see one college free agent show up as a serious prospect. It is borderline unheard of to have two. Um, but the Eagles don't really have any other newcomers that are prospects, and Pullen deserves a spot here. So, like, let's, let's go. Let's do it. Uh, he is very much a jack of all trades, doesn't really have standout skills that pop off the page, but rather he has enough skill as a puck handler, shooter, and playmaker to make ends meet. Um, his big driving attribute is really his work ethic and his tenacity. He likes to go to dirty area, areas and do battle. Uh, it's hard to say if his offensive capabilities and production are really going to translate well to professional hockey. A lot of times that doesn't. Uh, but the work ethic and the willingness to go to battle every shift is likely going to endear him to the coaching staff. And honestly, sometimes that is more than enough to carve out a role that you can build on. Let's get right to it. It's machine fight time. The machine says 79 points on average for the Colorado Eagles this season. They make the playoffs, the majority of them, 72%. 4% of the time they win this Pacific bloated division. <laughs> this is probably for me the best defensive group in the division, but the other parts of it are not pretty. Um, when Tanner Caro looks like he's your number one forward, you are in trouble. Likewise, Arvid Holm was good, but not great last season. Eustace is back in town, and there will be Eustace for all, but he's also not shown to be the steadiest goalie. The Abs have a bunch of injuries to start the season, so this team should eventually have reinforcements come in to help, as well as getting their own players healthy off the IR. 
but I'm taking the under here. I feel like this is a team in transition from one kind of core AHL group to another, and they don't have the pieces in which I think they would be normally attributed to them. I also think new head coach, and while he's been a coach for a long time, the roster isn't great, and I think he struggles a little bit. I'm going to take the under and say 75 here. Sarah, what say you? So this is the second oldest team in the AHL behind only the Wolves. Uh, they average out at 25.6 years. Um, and for all that age and experience, there's honestly like not a lot here in terms of things to be excited about. Like, I think the team's going to be fine. I think they make the playoffs, but like, I don't know how fun or interesting it's going to be for most of the year. Uh, I'm taking the slight over at 80 points, but like, I don't expect to like it. <laughs> All right, we're moving on. This team, this division's too too big. We've already spent way too much time. So let's go on and talk about the Abbotsford Canucks. Sarah, tell me what they did last year and who mans the bench. Abbotsford was 40 and 32 last year. They were fourth in the Pacific Division. Jeremy Colleton's the head coach. He has an 86 and 74 record as an AHL head coach. Two playoff appearances. He's three and two in AHL playoff series. Gary Agnew and Jeff Ulmer are his assistants. The additions are Josh Bloom, Jermaine Lowen, Cole McWard, Matt Irwin, Akita Horosi, Nikita Topi Topila, Zach Sawchenko, and Ty Glover. Sarah, who is gone from Abbotsford? They have lost Vincent Arsenault, Yushiro Hirano, Justin Dowling, Matt Alfaro, Dylan McPherson, Brady Keeper, Zach Guitari, Colin Delia, and Jack Rathbone. So if you've not been following along for the last four hours, um, <laughs> I don't blame you. Uh, how we're going to do this is we're going to talk about some storylines we think are going to be a part of the team this year. We're going to dive into two prospects, and then we're going to play us versus the machine over under for their season. For me, this team lacks a lot of quality uh, veteran AHLers, and that's different this year. It's Sheldon Dries, John Stevens, and Christian Willannon on D? I mean, Matt Irwin, sure. And don't get me wrong, Dries and Willannon are quality players. Stevens is a useful kind of middle to bottom six PK guy. Matt Irwin shut down middle pair guy. But in seasons past, the Abbey Nucks seemed to make it more of a priority that they surround the Utes with good veteran talent that could get on the score sheet and move the puck. Sheldon Rempel, Justin Dowling, Phil DiGiuseppe, Lane Peterson, Kyle Rao, Justin Bailey, Madison Bowie, Cameron Schilling. Or maybe Abbotsford goes out and signs one or two that are floating around out there, or PDG gets sent down to fill that role. But this team feels a lot younger and more inexperienced than it has in previous seasons throughout the depth chart. And maybe that's good. The AHL is a developmental league and freeing up some more ice time for Danila Ice Ice Baby or Atu Ratu or Pod Colson or James Bond villain Archie Baines <laughs> or Linus Carlson, etc. Like those guys need playing time and not having to, you know, elbow themselves over quality veterans who do help the team win is probably useful, but I do worry a bit as other teams in the Pacific have bulked up a bit. And if key prospects don't make that leap forward, the Abbey Nucks may not be as competitive on the ice as they were last season. Sarah, what say you? So all of that makes me wonder if their style of play changes at all. Like, do we see Jeremy Colleton coach the team that he has? Maybe go with a bit more of a grinding, trapping style of play um, if he feels he doesn't really have the horses to play more of a north-south game. Uh, we've seen some adjustments like that before, which were also from necessity. Uh, when Christian Willannon and Jack Rathbone weren't around last season, they couldn't play as north-south as I think that they would have liked. Willannon is back now, but still likely near the top of the Vancouver call-up sheet. Rathbone just got traded to the Penguins. And, like, are we trusting Matt Irwin to lead breakouts? Is Jet Wu going to make an unexpected leap? Like, all of these things feel sketchy to me. Uh, and I think that seeing this team play more dump and chase could be the answer. Uh, they do have four-checking talent, but I just don't know if they have the team size to really play a true grinded-out style like we saw teams like Harshie or Harshie, wow, Hartford or Hershey uh, play last season. All right, two prospects to watch. Sarah, I will let you go first. Uh, a familiar face, but one that is in a kind of key se season for his career. Talk about Arthur's Seelovs. Uh, so Seelovs is a guy who he has been around a little bit, but last year was the first season that he spent primarily in the AHL. 
Uh, he was kind of an unknown quantity at that point. He'd spent parts of previous two seasons in the AHL, but also spent a lot of time in the ECHL as well as back in his native Latvia during the COVID season. Uh, he did a quickly establish himself with Abbotsford this season and even got the nod for his NHL debut as well. But what is more interesting to me is what he did, what he did over the summer um, at the Men's Worlds Tournament. Uh, Selaw has played all 10 of Latvia's games, and he backstopped that team to a historic bronze medal, the best finish in the country's history. The bronze medal game was a 4-3 overtime victory over the United States. So you can, this guy is like national hero. Like he never has to buy a beer again in Latvia if he doesn't want to. Um, he didn't have the best stats of all of the goalies, but he did face by far the most shots of any goalie in the tournament, 280 over 10 games. Um, the goaltender with the best save percentage in the tournament faced only an average of 15 shots per game. Uh, so Silovs also saw a lot more traffic uh, than anyone else did. Uh, at the end of the tournament, he was named MVP as well as best goaltender. Um, and so he has shown through this that he can withstand the pressure on a huge international stage. Latvia was the home host team playing against the United States. He also earlier like was the goaltender for the game that eliminated Sweden from the tournament. Like this is huge. Uh, and he didn't even blink. Um, and now we need to see, can he help elevate the Canucks? Uh, the NHL Canucks are set with Ta Thatcher Demko and Casey DeSmith. Um, and even though Abbotsford brought in Zach Sachenko, I would expect Silovs to get as much work as he can handle this season as he kind of works to establish himself as someone who's ready to take the next step. Realistically, he could probably be in the NHL. Like, aside from experience, is Casey DeSmith really that much of a step up? Um, but also realistically, probably better for him to get major minutes in the AHL than just sit around and watch Thatcher Demko do stuff in the NHL. Two quick comments before I talk about the pro prospect I picked out here. Um, number one, no, Casey DeSmith is not. As a Penguins fan, I can absolutely confirm that. Yeah. And they brought in Zach Sochenko, but no, you want Archer C. Loves to play all 72. Yes. yes. <laughs> so for the prospect I want to talk about, I want to talk about another player who's familiar to Abby Nux fans a little bit at least. He got in games last season, uh, but it is a very kind of important part of, uh, A, the Brock Besser trade, as well as just an important time in his development, and that is Atu Ratu. Ratu is a guy who likes to drive to the nets. If you look at the location where his goals and assists come from, they're all inside home plate, which isn't particularly unusual as that's where most scoring chances come from, but you rarely see him shoot or set up a threatening teammate from the out from outside the house. He's a skilled shooter, with uh, though with an NHL release. His puck skills and playmaking also rate as NHL caliber, but one of the reasons he scores almost exclusively from the inside, though, is because he doesn't have the wheels to beat defenders wide on rush chances and then isn't as mobile as his peers. That lack of a top gear speed definitely has held his game back in the past as he's not a dangerous player on the rush in, in those senses. But it's also probably the key to unlocking his true potential. I'm not saying he needs to become, you know, Andreas Athanasiu in terms of foot speed but he needs to find a step to the point where it's no longer dragging him down. He he needs to, to work on his skating, which is challenging over the course of a season. That's usually something you spend time focusing on in the off season. And we'll see pretty soon here if that's paid off. Uh, I haven't gotten my eyes on them yet this year, but I will. Uh, as we do every year, I watch probably at least eight games of every team at some point in the season, and I will get to see him uh, a little bit here and there. So let's do it. Let's dive right in. It's machine time. The machine says Abbotsford finishes with 78 points. They make the playoffs 70% of the time, which when seven of 10 teams make it, that 70% <laughs> of the teams make it in the division. So really it's like 50-50. That's how math works, right? They win the division a mere 5% of the time though. Sarah, I'm going to jump over you here. Way over. I take the massive over here on the over under for 78 points. While I'm sure Dries and Pod Colson get extended looks, I think Arshdeep Baines, Danila Ice Ice Baby, and Atu Ratu take big leaps forward. That gives this team good depth. The defense is very meh behind Willannon, um, and Zach Zalchenko can't be trusted. But I also know what the rest of this division looks like. And I still think that they have the horses to compete with seven tenths of it. <laughs> And that's enough. 82 points. Sarah? So 
I underestimated Abbotsford last year, and like Providence, I don't feel super inclined to make that same mistake again. Uh, there were a lot of surprises for me in terms of how this team performed last year, and I think maybe teams will be less likely to underestimate them, so their path might not be quite as straightforward. Uh, there's not necessarily a sexy future superstar on this roster, but I think they'll be good again. Um, I'm going with the over at 80 points. All right. Let's keep rolling here. This division is four teams so too many. Wrong. Let's go to Bakersfield. Sarah, what did they do last year? Who mans the bench? Bakersfield was 37 and 35 last season. They were fifth in the Pacific. Colin Chalk is their head coach. He has a 56 and 50 record in the, as an AHL head coach. He had two playoff appearances. He is one and two in AHL playoff series. Keith McCambridge and Nate DeCasmiro are his assistants. The additions are Ethan DeYoung, Matev Petrov, Jaden Grub, uh, Drake Kajula, Lane Peterson, Max Wanner, Noel Hofenmeyer, and Ben Gleason. They're missing some pieces from last year, Sarah. Who are they? They are missing Noah Philp, Drake Rumsha, Tyler Benson, Luke Esposito, Samuel Dove McFalls, Mark Russell, Justin Bailey, Darren Kilb, Yanni Caldis, Matt Gilden, and Jason Demers. All right. So we're going to talk about some big kind of overarching topics that for the team this year, some questions we have for them. We're going to talk about two prospects we want to watch, and then we're going to play over under with the machine. I will start us off. I think the big storyline for the Bakersfield Condors this year is going to be steps forward for the Utes. There's a lot of room for guys to step up and take a leap in production here with top nine, top four slots and power play time to be filled. Justin Bailey is gone. Tyler Benson is gone. Yanni Caldas is gone. Guys like James Hamblin, Tyler Tulio, Carter, Savo Carter Savoy, uh, Xavier Borgo all have a chance to make noise in a kind of crowded depth chart in the Edmonton organization here. Ken Holland went out and signed Derek Ryan, Matthias Yanmark, Connor Brown, and Adam Ernie to one-year deals to fill out the bottom of the Oilers roster because it's pretty apparent he didn't think the guys like Raphael Lavoie or the others we just mentioned were up to that task. This is an opportunity for those prospects to show Ken Holland he was wrong. A very fun thing to do and something that happens from time to time. Um, right, Duncan Keith? But I think that this is a very big season for them because this Edmonton pipeline is not necessarily the highest end or the sexiest, but it's the most crowded at the places these guys are. And I think they're going to need to, as we've said a couple other places, in the words of ACDC, stand up and be counted. So there is playing time available. There's power play time available. This is a moment for those guys to stand up and be counted. Sarah, what say you? So I like the additions that they've made to the blue line uh, on this team. No Hofemeyer and Ben Gleason are both good ads. The problem, though, is that they're both left-handed. Uh, the only right-handed defensemen on the Condors roster right now are Phil Kemp and rookie Max Wanner. Uh, that's worrisome because, as we talk about often, handedness for defensemen matters more than you would think because playing your offhand side affects your ability to field pucks cleanly off the wall. It makes D-to-D -D passes harder. Uh, it puts your stick on the outside, defending rushes instead of on the inside, especially as you pivot. And those little inconveniences end up piling up. So it's going to be interesting to see who the Condors have play on their offside this season and how exactly they handle it. But uh, they've made some interesting changes to that blue line that should help them out. All right, let's talk prospects. Sarah, I will let you go first. Tell me who you want to talk about. Uh, so I'm looking at Matvey Petrov. Uh, he is kind of looked at as a top prospect for the Oilers. Uh, he put up 93 points in 65 games in the OHL last year, uh, plus 22 in 20 playoff games. He's a 6'2 Russian winger. Uh, spent two years in Russia's MHL system before coming over to the OHL for a couple years. Uh, he was a sixth round pick in 2021 uh, and was selected before he even went over to North America. So the Oilers actually took a pretty big chance on a player who at that time could have had, you probably could have had all the questions that you usually would have about a player coming out of the Russian leagues. Like, are they going to leave? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, Petrov has come over um, after a strong OHL career. Again, he has emerged as a, as a top prospect for the Oilers. Uh, he is a player who's known as having an excellent release, but has also worked to really focus on improving his playmaking skills, which I think will make him more well-rounded 
and more versatile as a pro. So he, he's someone who I'm watching to see how he adapts to this level, uh, how his game translates, and uh, if he does kind of continue working on that well-rounded game instead of getting pigeonholed into being, you know, one thing or another. Who are you looking at? Uh, I am looking at Jaden Groob, otherwise known as Groob Hub. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of a painful thing to be traded from the organization that drafted you before you ever hit the ice with them. Uh, it's an entirely another level to be traded for a draft pick that's lower for where you were drafted. But that's how the Rangers did Jaden Groob. But that's besides the points. Uh, Groob has NHL offensive tools, but they lack the pop off the page kind of effect on film. What really stands out is his defensive ability. Group is a physical presence who knows how to support def his defenseman and close off plays. It also helps that he has a relentless motor and gets every drop he can from that skill set from work ethic. He is going to squeeze what is a very average-ish like surrounding skill set in terms of shooting, puck skill, skating, that whatever, and just the I am going to outwork you and out hustle you. But that's a skill. That is something that will get you places in life. I don't know if we're going to see the offense follow along to the pro ranks. I suspect that it will not based on the caliber of uh, shooting, puck handling kind of things that he has. But he has a solid floor as a shutdown center who can kill penalties, and that role has value. We're going to get right to it. We're going to go to the machine. Tell me your secrets, machine. It has the Bakersfield Condors at 82 points, 83% chance to make the playoffs. 8% to win the division. I'm going to go first. I'm taking the over. I think the roster is a lot better than the model gives it credit for. I cannot imagine Greg McKegg is now a 20-point scorer in the AHL. I think Ty Tulio can take a step forward. Lavoie and Griffith are proven commodities. Lane Peterson is a nice add to the top of the lineup. While the blue line looks a lot different, uh, I think it looks good. 86 points. Over. Sarah. So, yeah, I think this team is going to be fine. Uh, they've got depth. They have some young players who should add some offense. Uh, they do have two experienced goaltenders in uh, Pickard and Rodrigue. I do like the pickups in Hofenmeyer, Kajula, Peterson. Uh, I don't think this is going to be a fun team to play against. I'm not looking forward to seeing them like 85 times. Uh, I am going with the over and 84 points. All right. Let's go on to Ontario, a place that you are very familiar with. Tell me about last season. Who's behind the bench? Last season, the Reign were 34 and 38. They were sixth in the Pacific Division. Uh, Marco Sturm returns for his second year as head coach. Uh, he now has a 34 38 uh, record as an AHL head coach. He has one playoff appearance under his belt. He is 0 and 1 in playoff series wins. Chris Height and Brad Schuler are his assistants. They added in the offseason Hayden Hodgson, Mikhail Maltsev, Charles Houdon, Kevin Connaughton, Steve Santini, Andreas Englund, Joe Hicketts, Wyatt Wiley, Max Martin, David Riddich, and Ryan Bedard. It's almost like the the Phantoms and Eagles were just having a sale, and they just said, bye, 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 bye. Yep. <laughs> uh, the Rain have said goodbye to Alex Iarulo, Leas Anderson, Alan Quine, uh, Nate Thompson, who left but didn't leave because now he has like a – coaching-ish kind of like consultant job with the team. Um, Aiden Dudas, Nate Schnarr, Justin Nachbauer, Brett Kemp, Helga Granz, uh, Toby Besson, Cal Peterson, Matt Falalta, and Samuel Figimo all gone. So we're going to talk about some storylines, some questions, some vibes we have for the team, and then we are going to talk about two prospects in depth that are maybe a little off the beaten path, and then we are going to play over under with the machine. Uh Storyline wise, Sarah, I'm really, this is your team. Tell me about what you're thinking here. Um, all right. So first, not to get too far ahead of ourselves, but the rain have now for two seasons in a row, just done like an epic choke job in the playoffs. Um, I feel okay saying that because that's what happened. Uh, some of that is aided by the Kings. Like I can't blame it all on the rain. Uh, the Kings have basically been in, in a position for the past two years to just yoink some of the team's top players, either by choice or by necessity, because everyone ended up being hurt. Um, but is this the year that the rain find a way past whatever is ailing them when it gets to the playoffs? Um, in the 2023 playoffs, they scored zero power play goals in two games, despite having a pretty good power play in the regular season. Uh, they also allowed goals on all three penalty kills that they had to uh, endure. So like, that's bad. 
what is it that ails this team? What is it that causes them to melt down at the playoffs? I feel like also for two years in a row now, like TJ Tynan, who is usually a very kind of chill guy, has just like gone off the deep end in the playoffs in terms of like stupid penalties. Like it just hasn't been great. So like this is something that Marco Sturm, his coaching staff, like they need to start building now to help this team like have the fortitude to overcome whatever makes them freak out in the playoffs. Um, I also just have deeper concerns about this team's offense. Uh, in 21-22, they were number two in overall goals in the league, 259 in 68 games. Last season, they were 27th, uh, 206 in 72 games. In 21-22, they had the best power play in the league, and not only the best, but like historically best in for, like league history, uh, 27.5%. They scored 72 power play goals. Last season, they had the seventh best power play in the league, 22.2% with uh, 63 goals. Uh, those differences actually correspond almost exactly to the goals missing from Martin Furk. Uh, Furk had 40 total goals, including 15 power play goals in the 21-22 season. This team does not have another Martin Furk just sitting around. Uh, but the drop in scoring from one season to the next is drastic. Uh, and sure, you lost one of the league's best scorers, but you also have to find a way to make up for it. And the rain just never did. Um, and then the last point that I had on the rain, uh, they need full healthy player, healthy seasons from some of their key players. Um, Alex Turcotte, Akil Thomas are always the topic of discussion of Kings and Reign fans. Um, and it's because neither of them have actually been able to stay healthy enough to show the organization what they can do. Um, obviously, it's no fault of their own. Like Alex Turcotte didn't wake up and say, know what I want? Another concussion. Like that's not, you know, how it happened. But it's still been very frustrating to watch. Um, Akil Thomas in particular had a really great preseason this year, including a game with a hat trick. I think it was against Vegas, where it was basically the Ontario Reign versus the team that won the Stanley Cup. Uh, and he got a hat trick. He looked great. Turcotte has also looked strong as well. And if the NHL roster wasn't already basically filled out from day one, I think he could have had a shot at making the team. But both of these guys, for their sakes, for the team's sake, they need to find ways to stay in the lineup, show the organization what they've got, or risk finding themselves passed up uh, in the depth chart. I will say, I do have thoughts on Akil Thomas here. Like, <laughs> he is a big game hunter. Mm -hmm. When it's when the team absolutely needs him to come up, he shows up. Yeah. Like, I remember one, uh, I think it was last season or two seasons ago, mm -hmm. where I said, no, it was two seasons ago, where I said, the X factor for this series for Ontario is Akil Thomas. Yeah. And then he scored, what, four goals in that, mm -hmm. like, four-game series? Yeah. yeah. Akil Thomas can show up in the big moments. Mm -hmm. But then he'll go two weeks and do nothing. Yeah. And it's like, look, the AHL is a very hard league. I, I'm not, you know, I'm not doubting that. But I think that, like, I don't know if it's a motivation thing or if it's a clicking thing or if someone's job on staff just needs to be the person who comes in and pisses off Akil Thomas <laughs> in the morning. Like, <laughs> the consistency is mad yeah. from him because you'll watch one game and you'll see him just light a team up. Like that was his, like mm -hmm. that was the only thing he was ever born to do. And then the next, the very next game, he'll look like a, a shell of that player. Yeah. And if we can just string together, I mean, yes, some of that is health. Some of that is recovery, but like, man, when he's on, he's good. He's yeah. an NHL player for un unquestionably when he's on, but when he's off, he, yeah looks like he's not even on the ice yeah and that's a huge thing for me like i love him when he's on he's a great player when he's on but again do we need to does the ontario rain need to hire a guy whose sole job is to like come in and like slap his coffee out of his hand in the morning i i don't know what the <laughs> answer amazing is. job <laughs> yeah like i don't know if it's motivational or mm -hmm. if it's just randomness because to be honest too he hasn't played that many games yeah so we could be seeing just randomness and me Texas sharpshootering th this mm -hmm. problem, but like game to game, it's not the same. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about prospects here. I will let you go first because I want to talk about Brent Clark. All right. Um, so the first player I want to look at is uh, Francesco Pinelli. Uh, he had kind of an interesting path to getting drafted and to getting to this level. Um, he's an OHL player who spent the COVID season playing in Slovenia, a league that probably not a whole lot of other teams in the, in the NHL have their eyes on. Uh, the Kings 
who have a Slovenian captain whose Slovenian father is a European scout for the Kings, um, maybe had a better chance at figuring out what Pinelli was up to uh, and then drafting him. Uh, he put up 13 points in 11 All games. Right. <laughs> as... uh, I get to talk about oh, Something weird just happened. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yep, I think I uh, cut you off there. Sorry, Sarah. That's fine. I'm just going to start <laughs> over and <laughs> let CC edit things. <laughs> um, 35, Jesus Christ. <laughs> So Francesco Pinelli uh, is a player who came from the OHL uh, and spent his COVID season, the year that the OHL didn't play, uh, playing in Slovenia, a, t a league that like not a lot of teams in the NHL probably have their eyes on. Uh, the Kings, however, they have a Slovenian captain whose Slovenian father is a European scout for the Kings. Uh, so no surprise, the Kings drafted him. Uh, when I think a lot of other teams didn't really know necessarily what he had been up to in that year the OHL didn't play. Uh, he put up 13 points in 11 games as a teenager playing against men on a team where he was one of the youngest players and the only North American. Uh, the Kings picked him up in the second round of that draft and were generally regarded as kind of having gotten away with something there. Uh, he has raised the bar for himself each year of his career, 41 points his first year in juniors, 60 the next, 90 the year after that. Uh, he has an excellent release in his shot. Uh, he has strong hockey IQ. Uh, and there's no shortage of talent to surround him with on this team. That said, the Reign currently have been playing him on the fourth line for secret reasons. Um, that can't and shouldn't last, but it does actually speak to the forward depth uh, that this team has this season. But uh, I've been excited to see him make this jump uh, and is maybe a little bit under the radar uh, just in terms of the path that he took to get here. Now, go ahead. Tell me all your feelings on Brand Clark. I think how long Clark spends in Ontario remains to be seen. You cannot possibly tell me it's more beneficial for the Kings to play Andreas England for 11 to 13 minutes a night than it is to let Brant Clark have those minutes in the NHL. Although I am a believer of the you play guys in bottom minute, bottom minute roles, you develop bottom minute players. But he's going to have every opportunity to play in Ontario. First pairing with Jakob Muvirara. Clark had a ridiculous 16 shots on goal over two games. Scored a uh, first goal on his the scored first goal on uh, of the season in his second game. His 16 shots on goal actually lead the whole AHL currently. Fun fact, number two in shots on goal is his brother, G Graham Clark. Brent Clark is smart, creative, and just the kind of player the Kings need. Um, he is someone who has gotten all of the parts of the Scott Perunovich pain tour written on him. Like, he is a dude who has amazing hockey IQ, loves to just ball out to. Uh, he has great playmaking vision, high-end puck skills, can shoot the puck at a, a pretty high level. AHL fans should enjoy watching him now because he's a player who once he makes the leap to the NHL, it's unlikely he's, he's going to come back. One area that does need working on him is his skating posture. For that, that's something that needs to be corrected, and it definitely hampers him, especially in the defensive zone, as he's not able to kind of maintain the distance he needs to, as well as be able to pivot and attack players off of the rush and defending against the cycle. That's something that should be a work in progress, especially given how high a caliber priority he is for this uh, Kings organization to get right. But make no mistake, Brant Clark is going to ball this year. <laughs> All right. It's machine time. What say you machine about the Ontario rain this year? 85 points, 92% playoff percentage, 18% to win the division. This model likes Ontario quite a bit. Sarah, what say you? So, like, it's not really me being a homer to want this team to do well. Um, I think it's more fun if they do well. Um, I do have more confidence in this team than last year, but I'm slightly more conservative maybe just because I have my own frustrations with the coaching staff, the way they deploy their players, the way that, like, Offense just seems to dry up under this coaching staff, particularly on, on special teams. Um, but I do like the team's goaltending better than in the past years. I say, even though the Reign have given up 10 goals in their first two games. Thank you, David Riddich. Um, I do like the additions that the team made, though, overall, um, particularly bringing in Charles Sudan for two years. Um, that's a nice guaranteed veteran presence who's skilled on offense. We know what he brings. Um, also potentially setting up to fill a TJ Tynan-sized gap in the roster 
uh, presuming Tynan leaves with the expiration of his contract. So I think this is going to be a, a, a good team, maybe slightly less frustrating than, than last season, um, but I'm going with the over at 86 points. I don't want to take the over here. I don't. <laughs> but there's too much known. This roster looks loaded up front and on the blue line. The biggest question for me is how well Eric Portillo handles the AHL. I think he handles it well, especially with a very deep team in front of him. I do not want to take the over here, <laughs> but I am taking the over here. Over where Sarah went. I say mm -hmm. eight, eight points. Let's move on. Let's talk about the Tucson Roadrunners. Sarah, what did they do last year? Who was behind the bench? Tucson was 30 and 42 last season. They were seventh in the Pacific Division. Uh, Steve Potvin is the head coach. He has a 43 and 65 record as a head coach. One playoff appearance, 0 for 1 in AHL playoff series, series wins. Uh, John Slaney and Zach Stortini are the assistants. The additions they made are Aku Ratu, Z uh, John Leonard, Zach Sanford, Justin Kirkland, Hunter Drew, Max Zuber, Patrick Koch, Montagna Onya Banushi, Anson Thornton, and Matt Villalta. Who is gone from the desert, Sarah? They have lost Laurent Dufon, uh, Boko Imama, Adam Cracknell, Hudson, Hudson Elenick, Tyson Empey, JSD, uh, Liam Kirk, Ronald Knott, Noah Lowen, Devontae Stevens, Will, Will Riley, Tyler Parks, and David Tendek. So we are going to do some headlines, questions, kind of thoughts on the team as a whole, that, uh, and then we are going to get into two specific prospects to talk about, and then we are going to play over under with the machine. I'm going to start. Um, the Coyotes are going to screw Tucson at the deadline. <laughs> Point blank. The Coyotes have assembled a roster that should be more competitive this season, but it's will it's one that's still primed for trade deadline moves. Jason Zucker, Matt Dumba, Josh Brown, Troy Stetcher, Travis Dermott, all expiring contracts. They're all trade bait at the deadline, and when most of them get moved, someone from Tucson is getting called up to finish the season in Arizona. And while that pay bump and NHL addition of the resume is nice, it's going to kneecap any playoff push that Tucson might want to make. This means Tucson needs to come out strong and bank points if it hopes to go on a serious playoff run, which is questionable to begin with. Um, Sarah, what are your thoughts on what the story for Tucson will be this year? So another theme here is that the runway is getting awful short for some prospects on this team. Uh, I think of guys like the 11th overall pick in 2019, Victor Soderstrom. He's 22, and while he's got some runway left, he needs to make a statement this season. He is on the last year of his entry-level contract, and as an offensive defenseman, the production's always been just good. Uh, he's never really wowed. It hasn't been great. Uh, and some of that sure is the supporting cast he's had to work with, but at some point you have to make a stand. You can copy and paste basically the same thing for Ben McCartney, Jan Yannick, Michael Kesselring, Vlad Kolechonik, and so on. Akiratu is making his North American pro debut now, but he's 22 and he also needs to make some noise this year. Uh, the Coyotes pipeline does have ex more exciting young players in it that are coming. And if you don't demand spots now with your playing time, uh, you might not have one in the future. As we said in a couple spaces here, uh, ACDC demands that you stand up and be counted. So let's get into two prospects that we want to talk about. Uh, I'm going to steal the fun one. I want to talk about Dylan Gunther. Fine. <laughs> In true Coyotes fashion, they played Gunther 33 NHL games last year, burning a year off his contract before releasing the play for Canada in the World Juniors and then to his WHL team. Because if you're not mismanaging something like that, are you even part of the Arizona Coyotes? <laughs> Gunther's 15 NHL points actually placed him 15th on the team. That seems not great for the Coyotes, but we digress. Gunther is immediately going to have as big a role as he wants on this Roadrunners team, especially that goal-scoring machine Michael Carconi is still in the NHL. Maybe he sticks there, fingers crossed, Carconi Island travels to Arizona. It's like Lost, the island moves. The Coyotes are being patient with Gunther and want to make sure he has the tools to succeed. And if that means taking his time in the AHL to get comfortable with the league, and that includes getting comfortable with scoring, then that's all the better for him. Gunther is good with and without the puck. He already kills penalties and displays a good defensive awareness, which isn't all that common for a player his age. You just need to figure out how to score when the game is bigger, faster, and more physical than juniors. We say all the time, the hardest transition players face is not AHL to NHL. It's college and juniors to the AHL. I think it's easy to punch down at the Coyotes here for all the problems the franchise has which are many, and self-inflicted. 
and stupid. But I like the approach they're taking here with Gunther. This is an organization that has long rushed prospects to the NHL before they were ready, Barrett Hayton, and that didn't have a great track record of developing young players. So hearing from their front office and coaching staff talk about Gunther, what they want to see from him and the opportunities that they want to give him is reassuring that this is starting to see course correct here. Sarah, talk to me about Max Zuber. Uh, Max Zuber is a big defenseman who skates well. He can jump up into the rush. He's a physical defender who can move pucks as well. Like the offensive tools don't necessarily really leap off the page with him, but his ability as a defender does. He can shut down plays on the rush or in the cycle with impressive precision. And yeah, like that's not always the sexiest work, but defensive zone prowess is something that the Roadrunners need. Uh, and so what he brings to this team is going to be a welcomed uh, addition this season. It is machine time. Sarah, are you ready? I am. The machine says 75 points on average for the Tucson Roadrunners. They're a weighted coin flip in their favor, 55% to make the playoffs. Single percentage to win the division. I will go first here. Uh, Dylan Gunther will be fun to watch. There's enough surrounding talent in Justin Kirkland and John Leonard to make this team better than a cellar dweller. Maybe Matthew Villalta can help carry this team to 75 points, but I don't see it. With Arizona mid-rebuild, they're not going to be doing Tucson any favors here. I also very much do not trust this coaching staff to make good choices. Um, I am taking the under here by a fair bit. I'm going to say 70. I think we see a similar outcome to last season where they aren't great, but teams around them are better. Sarah? So... Uh... If former Ontario Reign goaltender Matt Villalta wanted to join a team where he had some chance of success and some chance of not facing like a ridiculous number of shots far too often, he should not have gone to Tucson. Uh, he might have a better road to the NHL, uh, given that Arizona always ends up needing a goaltender, but like this is not the choice he should have made. Um, Gunther's going to be good. The Roadrunners have added some interesting veteran pieces. Um, Hunter Drew, John Leonard stood out to me. But no, it is not enough to make this team very good. Uh, I'm also taking the under 71 points. I think that's all that needs to be said. Let us move on. Let's talk about the San Jose Ooh, Barracuda. Sa uh, Sarah, what happened last season? Talk to me about the coaching staff. Last season, the Barracuda were 31 and 41. They were eighth in the Pacific Division. God, there's so many teams in this division. Uh, John McCarthy was the head coach. He has a 31-41 record. Uh, no playoff appearances under his belt yet. Cal Hagel and Louis Mass are his assistants. The additions are Justin Bailey, Ethan Cardwell, Ryan Carpenter, Scott Sabern, Nathan Todd, Cole Castles, Artem Guryev, Valtteri Pouli, Nikita Ototchuk, Henry Thrun, Leon Gavanka, Magnus Krona, and Georgi Romanov. They have said goodbye to Max Verono, Alex Agazzino, Cal Chris Ruolo, uh, Jeffrey Veal, Martin Kaut, CJ Cease, Luke Johnson, Nathan Burke, Artemi Nyazov, uh, Derek Pouliot, Montana Onyabuchi, Darren Brady, Billy Constantino, Patrick Holloway, Strauss Mann, and Aaron Dell. So we're going to talk about some storylines we have that we think will carry over throughout the season with the Barracuda. We're going to talk about two prospects in depth, and then we are going to play over under with the machine. So for me, the storyline here is that expectations are going up. Uh, this roster looks a lot more complete this season. The lot, the blue line added a lot of talent in Kavanka, Muka Madulin, and Ahochuk. Um, I, I the young prospect, Henry Thrun, who was just assigned from the Sharks, also looks promising in all three zones very early on. But granted, this blue line is very young. Gavanka is the most, has the most professional experience, and he's 24. So there are questions of how fast guys like Gannon the Rock or Artem Goryev can get acclimated to the AHL. I think Justin Bailey and Nathan Todd are good additions. Even Scott Sabern can contribute in the moments he isn't taking unnecessary penalties. That plus some steps forward for guys like Co, Weisblatt, Rasko, Robbins, and Gushkin should give the Cuda more scoring punch this season. This is still a young guys team, though, as the Cuda are the seventh youngest roster in the AHL. They have a very young coach who I don't think did a very good job last year, but I think with a more talented team in front of him, he should be able to not trip over himself. Um, but that doesn't mean he'll do it. Sarah, what say you? 
another thing that has made me nervous on this roster is the goaltending. Uh, typically, teams pair an established veteran goalie with a young guy to make an AHL tandem. Uh, the Barracuda, however, have chosen to get on the three goalie ta- uh, uh, train here. Um, but only they have three goalies on their roster who have combined for 40 games of professional hockey experience in North America total, and 38 of those 40 games are all belonging to Itu Makanyemi. So there are big questions about what this goaltending group can do and if they can hold down the fort. Uh, if you have listened to any of the other segments on the show, you have heard this before, but as a wise person has once said, you can have all the talent in the world skating around out there, but if you don't have a goaltender, It does not matter. So this is another team that the three goalie carousel of like madness. This one's extra weird. Like you have three guys who don't. What what do you even do here? All right, let's jump into some prospects that we want to talk about. Sarah, I'll let you go first. I thought you were going to take the next guy because you wouldn't want to say his name. <laughs> uh, Daniel, Daniel Gushin is uh, our first prospect to take a look at. Uh, he is in his second full year in the AHL. Uh, he had 22 goals, 23 assists for 47 points in 67 games last year. Um, there's no reason he can't put up 30 goals this year, uh, particularly considering who the Barracuda play repeatedly, Tucson. Um, he is a 5'10 winger, so like other small players that we've talked about today, the question always is whether or not he can actually stand up to the physicality of this league and whether he has the skills to negate that size difference. Uh, now, he is someone who plays a very tenacious physical game. He's not afraid to drive the net hard. Um, he does have a lot of good energy, goes to the dangerous areas on the ice. Um, he's not a player who really, at this level, I find myself worrying much about whether or not he can withstand the physicality of the league. Uh, he does need to develop his defensive skills like most young players do. Or if he doesn't, he does need to make sure that his scoring is going to make up for any defensive lapses in his game uh, that are going to cost the team. If he starts putting in you know, 30, 35, 40 goals a year, I don't know how much I care if he's bad defensively. Uh, but if that's not what he's going to do, he has to figure out how to play uh, away from the puck. So I want to talk about Shakir Mukamadoulin. Mukamadoulin's calling card is his defense. He's a big physical presence that knows how to knows how and when to pressure puck carriers, either attacking on the rush or in the cycle. His offense is also a bit underrated. He's got excellent puck skills and can make a lot more plays than you'd think for a guy his size. He's active in transition, on the rush, and in the cycle as well, which are habits that will always endear you to coaches, scouts, and us. All in all, I think he has top four NHL potential, but needs to refine some of his offensive tools a bit more because while NHL teams are totally fine to grab shutdown defensemen, they also want guys who have proven themselves that they can score a little bit at the AHL because if they can maybe bring a little bit of that to the NHL, that's good. Let us get right into it and go to the machine because we've been doing this for way too long. Jesus Christ, I see the timer. Oh my God. All right. Machine, what say you for the Barracuda this season? 79 points, 73% to make the playoffs, 4% to win the division. I'm going to go first. I think there's enough talent here to make me believe that John McCarthy won't drag them down too much. If the Utes like Gushkin or Co. or Robbins can make leaps, then I think there's potential for them to be a competitive team for the first time in what feels like forever. However, the goaltending makes me nervous. I think this is a better team than last season, but not... 10 points better 75 points i'm taking the under sarah uh yeah i think the barracuda should be better than last year but that's not saying much uh they finished with a lowly 69 points last season that does feel far too low for what they've got right now but i'm still taking the under uh compared to this model uh 76 points all right let's move on so we can maybe close this out before we hit five and a half hours Almost there. (laughs) Tell me about the Henderson Silver Knights, Sarah. Uh, What did they do last year? Who is their coach? Henderson was 29 and 43 last season. They were ninth in the Pacific Division. Uh, They have a new head coach this season in Ryan Craig, uh, who who this is his first time coaching uh, as a head coach at this level. Uh, Jamie Heward and Brett uh, Kizio are their assistants. The additions were Jacob Barabanitz, uh, Jacob Demick, Mason Geertz, Mason Gertsen, uh, Mason Morelli, 
Adam Cracknell, Tyler Benson, Christopher Setoff, Peter Tischke, and Carl Lindbaum. Who is gone from Vegas? Or Henderson, sorry. Henderson, Henderson has said goodbye to Sakari Maninen, uh, Maxim Marshev, Jermaine Lowen, Cal Marino, Gamal Smith, Spencer Fu, Connor Ford, Connor Corcoran, and Brandon Estes. All right, so we're going to talk about some storylines we see for, uh, unfolding over the entire season, as well as dive into two prospects and then play us versus the machine for the 30th, 31st time this season or this preview that has gone on for like an entire Netflix run. <laughs> Sarah, what, uh, what stands out to you about storylines we're going to be talking about for this team the whole season? So coaching has felt like a big story for a lot of these teams. There's been a lot of turnover this year, um, and it's true this uh, for this team as well. Um, Manny Vivieris' exit was surprising given the circumstances around his tenure with the team. Um, you know, If you aren't aware, he had a leave of absence for health reasons that took him away from the team for a while, but also like not surprising given the on-ice results this past season. Uh, Ryan Craig joins that NHL to AHL coaching pipeline. Uh, he made the jump from a playing career directly to behind the bench. Uh, uh, the, the last season he had as a player was 2016-17, and then he joined the Golden Knights as an assistant the next year. Uh, the organization basically always seemed to have him in mind once they decided to move along from Vivieros. Um, Ryan Craig is the veteran of just under 200 NHL games, 711 AHL games. Uh, he won the Calder Cup in 2016 as the captain of the Lake Erie Monsters. Uh, so he is someone who definitely knows what it takes to win both as a player and a coach. Uh, he has the credentials, I think, to get his players to buy into whatever it is that he's preaching. Uh, he spent a long time as a captain in the AHL. Uh, so he's familiar with kind of having to bridge that gap between coach and player, uh, knows how to communicate with both sides of the aisle. He also spent his entire coaching career, essentially, with Vegas. So he's already sure to have a strong handle on the expectations in terms of style, systems, uh, and he's already familiar with a lot of the key players on Henderson. Uh, this is a guy who seems to understand the natural tension in the AHL of having to develop prospects, which means letting them make mistakes, learn on the job, while also trying to win hockey games. Uh, there isn't really going to be an issue of uh, com of communication uh, between the NHL and the AHL club here. Uh, waiting to see really how he implements his vision in the AHL, what he really gets out of this team. But on paper, he's at least saying all of the right things. Uh, he has the credentials, the rapport with players to make this an easy transition. Last year was a significant step back for Henderson, especially given the, uh, the, the expectations that this organization places uh, on all of its teams. But they've opened the season already with two straight wins on the road against Iowa, outscoring them 11 to 5. So things are moving already in the right direction for the Henderson Silver Knights. And let's get right to prospects. Uh, Sarah, I will I will let you once again take the floor as you are our official USHL watcher. <laughs> Tell me about Pat Brisson's son, Brennan Brisson. Uh, so yeah, Brendan Brisson, uh, as the podcast's official st uh, Chicago Steel watcher, um, I have been a fan of him since I saw his lone USHL season 2019-20 uh, before he went off to college. Uh, last year in the AHL, he put up 37 points in 58 games on what we know was not a very good Silver Knights team. Uh, the outlook should be a lot better for him uh, and for the team this year, uh, and he's going to have a better supporting cast around him. Uh, right now, he has two points in two games. He's playing on the top line uh, with Tyler Benson and Gage, Gage Quinney. Uh, he had an excellent training camp, excellent preseason with Vegas, uh, looked like one of the best players on the ice. But unfortunately for him, there's just no room uh, because Vegas brought back essentially almost the entire Stanley Cup winning lineup. Like, where are you going to put this kid? Um, you're going to put him here. Uh, like most young players, this should sound familiar to you. He needs to work to grow the 200-foot game, including his play away from the puck. Um, again, it's that challenge of going from the NCAA to professional hockey. It is a completely different animal, um, and any player you talk to will tell you that exact same thing. But when you watch him, you can tell that he's a player who gets it. Um, it is more than about just putting – for him, it's just more about putting all the pieces together in action – uh, to really make him a more well-rounded player, but a uh, fun, exciting player um, and like, good luck. <laughs> I want to talk about Jakob Barabanitz. Uh, Barabanitz has made impressive strides in his game in the last year. He's become more well-rounded, has added 
uh, and added development to his playmaking vision as well as his value in transition. He's an asset during the cycle and understands how and when to make continuation plays as well as when to make attacking plays. He also forechecks well, defends well. He has physical tools, good shooting, good, good skating, good puck handling. Um, they're around NHL average, but at the AHL level, that's better than average. But Burbanitz is a smart player who knows how to find soft ice in high danger areas and can be a scoring threat off puck. That paired with his other skills and having seen his progress from last season to now makes him a prospect to keep an eye on this season in Henderson. Let's get right to it. Let's do the machine. Oh, machine, what do you say about Henderson this season? 77 points, 63% to make the playoffs, 3% to win the division. I'm going first. Uh, over. This offense is loaded with useful veterans, and if Vegas can get White Cloud or Martinez or Miramanov healthy at any point, that means reinforcements for Henderson on the blue line. If Isaiah Seville can get <laughs> healthy, that's a starting goalie for the Silver Knights. Save us, Seville. <laughs> All of that to say, I'm taking the over. 81 points. Sarah, what say you? Um, also over, but just slightly. Uh, the new coaching situation is a factor. Uh, and for all we know about Ryan Craig and his journey he took to get to here, we don't really have the book on him in terms of what he's looking for as a coach. We don't really know how he's going to fit in in his first AHL head coaching job. But on paper alone, this Henderson team looks much better than last year. I'm going with 80 points. We made it, Sarah. We made it. We One made more. it to the end. One more. Tell me about the San Diego goals last season, if you dare. They it was happened. bad. It was bad. Uh, 20 and 52 was their record. They were 10th in the Pacific Division. Uh, new head coach, Matt McElvain, is their new uh, head coach. Jason Clark and Chris Spari are the assistants. The additions are Nikita Nestorenko, Ben King, Sasha Pastyov, Nathan Gaucher, uh, Jackson Wiebe, uh, Andrew Agazino, Tyson Hines, Olin Zellweger, Trevor Carrick, Nick Wolf, and Alex Stalock. Sarah on the other side, who is leaving? Uh, they have lost Brent Gates Jr., Dmitry Osipov, Josiah Slavin, Justin Kirkland, Bryce Kindop, Dylan Securo, David Cotton, Axel Anderson, Evan Weinger, Nicholas Bruyard, Josh Healy, Chase Prisky, Andre Suster, Michael Delzato, Oli Jewel Levy, Oli Erickson Eck, and Lucas Dostal, who has graduated. All right, so we are going to talk about some storylines that we think will uh, be a part of the team the entire season, and then we're going to talk about two prospects. And then for the 32nd time, we are going to play Over <laughs> Under with the machine, and then I am going to sleep for 38 hours. <laughs> All right. Uh, storylines. Does new coaching revitalize the goals here? Uh, I don't think we made it in any secret on the show last year about our skepticism over exactly what Roy Sommer would bring to this team. The longest tenured AHL coach spent seven seasons with the Barracuda, not to mention all of the ones part of the Sharks organization. I want to say 25 in total. So many. Something, something absurd. Uh, and lost in the first round of the playoff three times. Long, long career. Maybe a great guy. But I, I think the coaching aspect of it, uh, he was out of his prime quite a few seasons ago. Matt McElvain is a little more unknown in terms of what he can bring to the AHL level. Um, the goals also have a lot of turnover uh, in not just the head coaching role, but like in this season, but in previous seasons. McElvain would be the fourth coach in fourth season in four seasons, following Somer, Somer, Joel Bouchard, and Kevin Deneen. Over the sun, summer, McElvain was called hockey's Ted Lasso, which is true more for his personality and coaching style, but not true in regards to his experience with the sport he's being asked to coach. 37, Jesus, he is one year older than me. So yeah, <laughs> he's barely older than goaltender Alex Stalock. Uh, played in the AHL, IHL, ECHL in Germany before retiring due to injuries. Coaching stops in the FHL, ECHL, and US. He left the FHL, and Jesus, before heading to Europe for several years in Germany, including the international level in Austria. Consecutive championships with Red, uh, Red Bull Salzburg in 22 and 23. Five championships overall in uh, Europe, an assistant for Germany's silver medal team that I believe Marco Sturm was the head coach mm -hmm. for uh, yep. in the 2018 Olympics. So that'll be fun coaching against his boss, his old boss. <laughs> uh, 
very first ex uh, coaching experience in uh, the Fed, which is not even a professional league, was a team that started the season 0-26, and he literally had to rebuild in a beer league from the ground up mid-season. Known as a hard worker, familiar with all aspects of the hockey business from various hats he's worn in other minor leagues, very highly thought of. Uh, Pat Verbeek has been has known him for about 10 years before this opportunity arose. He's been known to work across uh, the spectrum with players uh, to, to age, experience, rookies, veterans. Um, he's someone who believes that a team can be better than the sum of its parts. The Gulls were the worst team in the league uh, by far last year, and McIlvain has, had, has a big road ahead of him to turn this team around, create excitement, and get players to buy in. But players already seem excited about him. Chase DeLeo mentioned that they spoke for an hour and a half, which after running this podcast for five hours seems like a joy. Oh, yeah. Uh, but th this is a coach that invests in what his players have to say. Uh, he wants to get to know them. Um, I think you're going to see a team that looks worlds better this season. Um, they already have two wins under their belts. They're playing with confidence. They're playing with structure. Mm -hmm. um, Sarah, do you have any uh, extraneous thoughts here before we get to prospects? Um, I mean, I, I, as an Ontario rain watcher, I don't want the gulls to be better, but also like the gulls fans are so great that they deserve a team that like literally does anything better than they did last year. Um, I think, I think they're in for a fun season. I, I really like what I've, I've read and, and seen from uh, the new coach. And I think that it's a good step for the organization. We do have a Matt Mac goal fame uh, shirt in our, our new and found store. If that interests you, um, but also, too, I, I will agree on two points. Number one, I, I've said this several times before. The Gulls uh, have the best fan base in the AHL. I don't think it's particularly close. Like, that team was bad last year. And they still showed up, cheered their boys, even though they knew they weren't good. Like, that's a, a level of love that that city and that community has for that team that you just don't see in other places when they're, like, they're getting the crap beat out of them and the mm -hmm. fans are still showing up, cheering and being loud. Like... I have a lot of respect yeah. for the Gulls fans. There are very few fan bases that I think even hold a candle to them. Um, but they, I feel like it's been so long since they've had a team worth filling the building and going nuts for. I'm hoping that that can be this year. I'm not positive on that, but I digress. S uh, Sarah, I'm going to let you have the fun prospect. Tell me about Olin Zellweger. So Zellweger is the kind of player that I wish that stupid AHL, CHL, NHL rule just didn't exist. Um, I really wish he could have been spent, sent to the AHL last season instead of going back to the OHL. Um, when I saw him in preseason games last year, I wondered what he had left to achieve by going back to juniors. But I, I knew that the NHL, particularly the NHL of losing all the time with the Ducks, like wasn't going to be a good spot. I mean, in retrospect, the Gauls also lost all the time. So juniors was probably the best choice, like from a psychological safety standpoint. Um, but in juniors, he had 80 points in 55 regular season games, 29 in 14 playoff games. In two games with the Gauls already, he already has three assists. Um, in the WHL last year, he was second in scoring by all defensemen. He was the 22-23 defenseman of the year in the WHL, as well as uh, being named to the Memorial Cup All-Star you know, team, whatever they put together. Uh, the Ducks have one of the strongest prospect pools in the league, and Zellweger is really one to watch who hasn't already hit the NHL. He is a player who leans more offensive minded. Um, yes, like all young players, it's going to be a journey to get his game more well-rounded, um, but he has excellent stick handing, handling, explosive skating. The only thing that's really working against him is his size. He is 5'10", which is definitely on the smaller side for his role, uh, but I think that he is a player who has all of the tools, uh, just has to put them together. Um, like I said, the games that I have seen him in I would not have known he was as young as he was if I didn't know who he was. So very exciting prospect uh, for the Ducks and Gulls. You took the smaller, flashier prospect. I'm going to take the bigger, maybe a little more off the beaten path one in Nathan Gaucher. Not too many guys that are 6'3", 209 pounds can skate like this man, though. He uses his skating ability not to just be involved in the play early and often. He's gained a lot of touch as a playmaker, too, but it still has some edges to smooth out there. Gaucher is also cap a capable defender in his own zone and uses that big body to staple opponents to the boards, effectively enforce turnovers. 
in the end, Gosher plays a Gosher plays a big man power forward game, but has the wheels to do a bit more than his comparables in that role. The skill set could use some polish to create more dynamic offense, which but he should be useful at minimum for the goals this season in a middle six role with some PK time. One last time, Sarah, us versus the machine. What say you, machine? 69 points on average, 25% to make the playoffs, 0% to win the division. Sarah, I will let you go first. So my actual biggest concern about the Gulls is what they're going to do without Lucas Dostal, who kept this team competitive in far more games than they even deserved to be in last year. Uh, but Stalock, even at this point in his career, is no slouch. And whatever the Gulls throw at him can't actually possibly be as bad as what he faced nightly with the Blackhawks uh, when he was there. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm worried but not super worried about their, their net. Um, offense doesn't appear to be a problem for the Gulls so far. Uh, they've played two opening season games against the Rain, uh, outscored the Rain 10 to 5 in those games. This from a team that last year was dead last by a mile in terms of goals scored. I'm really curious to see what Matt McElvain will do with this team. I like that the organization took a little bit of a different approach in bringing in a totally new face. Um, this team's not going to be great, but they're not going to be 69 points bad. Um, I'm going with the over at 73 points. I build this model the best I can. And at times this feels like a marriage and I know what that feels like. Married couples occasionally fight and this is absolutely <laughs> one of them. Are there parts of this lineup that concern me? Yes. Yes, there are. But Trevor Carrick, Andrew Agazzino, Glenn Gauden, Robert Hag ought to keep the influx of Utes moving in the right direction. Also, Olin Zellweger is a stud. Period. End of sentence. If Alex Stalock can be even half decent, which is an open question, this team should be competitive at minimum. I believe in that gull vein to get to the bottom of the, to get this team out of the bottom of the division and back to respectability. But I see a Ducks roster and know that guys like Henrique, Silverberg, and Labushkin are on expiring contracts, and that means those roster spots are going to be open for goals after the deadline. While I think the goals have a chance to start strong, it is a young team, and that Ducks de uh, deadline kneecap uh, keeps me from being a lot more optimistic. And I mean that, a lot more optimistic. I am still taking the over here. 69 points is offensive to what this team is. I've seen what this team with talent can do with a coach that it doesn't agree with. I've seen this team without talent with a coach it doesn't agree with. <laughs> this is a team that has talent with a coach I think is going to get along with them. I am being incredibly pessimistic and I'm taking the over by a lot saying 75. And I think if you can, t if you told me that Alex Stalock put up a 915 over the course of the season and Callie Klang was at least within rounding distance of that, I would say 82 points. But I can't prob I, I can't believe that from Alex Daylock sitting here at this point. I, I'm taking 75 points over, but I have a lot more faith in this team than I feel like is even warranted. I really do. I want this team to be better. This fan base deserves good things, but this is no. <laughs> Go to bed machine. You're drunk. <laughs> Speaking of things that should be drunk, that is it for this marathon of a show. If you have watched this entire thing, please send us like an email or something. Um, I, I don't even know how to verify that, but dear God, um, thank you for watching and or listening and supporting the show. The Calder Farmstead is a part of the Full Press Radio Network. You can listen to this and several other great uh, hockey, sports, and sports entertainment programs at fullpresscoverage.com. Sarah, d d go ahead. Do do your outro. I don't. It's too late. I don't care. <laughs> My name is Sarah Avampato. You can find me representing Full Press Hockey on Twitter uh, at Right Said Sarah. You can check out my writing at Full Press Hockey, where I talk about the Chicago Wolves, uh, or at Jules and the Crown, where I talk about the Ontario Reign. Uh, Sean, where can folks find you? 
I'm Sean O'Brien. You can find me asleep on Twitter <laughs> at Sean O'Brien 81. That's S E A N O B R I E N 81. You can find my stats work at Tableau at bit.ly slash data dump and chase. That's the model, the graphs, all of it. Once again, bit.ly slash data dump and chase, all lowercase, all one word. Before I sign us off, I want to say two very quick things because we've been on here forever. Number one, I know that we have been MIA for like two months, but as you can see, we are still doing the Lord's work out here behind the scenes because no one else does this. And now I know why. Yes. If you don't believe me that we are still dedicated. <laughs> that is in the morning, by the way. Number two, um, we appreciate everything that like people say to us. The the number of things that keep Sarah and I going after doing five and a half hours of <laughs> podcasting are the comments from people saying how much they like our show, how much it's helped them learn and understand things. Uh, that means so much to Sarah and I. It helps us push through times like this where it's like, Jesus, what are we even doing with our lives? <laughs> that all being said, we're going to get back to the way things usually are. Once a week, we'll break down some teams. Um, we're going to shift things very slightly, but in a way you probably won't even notice. All of that being said, thank you guys so much for uh, tuning into the show and supporting us. Rate, review, subscribe to all of those things. For Sarah Evan Pato, I am Sean O'Brien. Please, please dump and chase responsibly.